Hey guys, welcome to the first video on OpenCV tutorial for beginners using Python. In this video, I'm going to give you a brief introduction about OpenCV. But first of all, let's see what is computer vision because OpenCV is an open source computer vision library. So computer vision is the way of teaching intelligence to machines and making them see things just like humans. So what happens when a human see an image? He will be able to recognize the faces which are there inside the images. So in its simplest form, computer vision is what allows computers to see and process visual data just like humans. Computer vision involves analyzing images to produce useful information. So to give you some examples, a self-driving car it can detect the lanes using computer vision. Or you might have wondered how Facebook detects images when you upload the images of you with your friends. It becomes possible by Facebook's face and image recognition technology. So now let's see what is OpenCV. So OpenCV, which stands for Open Source Computer Vision, is a library of programming functions mainly aimed at real-time computer vision. It is originally developed by Intel and then it was later supported by a developer called Velo Garage and now it is supported and maintained by ITCs. Now OpenCV is available on Mac, Windows and various Linux operating systems. So we can say that OpenCV is a cross-platform library. Now you can work on OpenCV using C, C++ or Python and we will be using Python to learn OpenCV. Now OpenCV is an open source and free library which is licensed under BSD license. And it's said that it is very easy to use and install that we will see when we will install OpenCV on various operating systems. Now because OpenCV primarily deals with computer vision, that means dealing with mainly images or videos, so I wanted to show you how a digital image is seen by a computer. So digital images are typically stored in the form of matrix. Now if you have heard about PPI or pixel per inch, which refers display resolution that means how many individual pixels are displayed in one inch of digital image so when a computer sees a picture it sees it in the form of pixel matrix now there are two type of digital images one are called grayscale images and other are called colored images so in grayscale images each pixel represents the intensity of only one shade. That means how bright or dark the pixel is. In other words, it is said that it has only one channel. So on the right hand side, you can see a grayscale image. And on the left hand side, you can see a colored image. So in colored images, we have three channels that is R, G, B, which stands for red, green, blue. So grayscale images have one channel and colored images have three channels. Your standard digital camera have three channels. That means red, green, blue channels. So we will learn more about images and how we can process images using OpenCV in the later videos. Now there is one more thing which I want to show you is NumPy. So we are going to learn OpenCV using Python. So when you will install OpenCV library for Python on your operating system, NumPy will be automatically installed with this library. So first of all, what is NumPy? So NumPy is a highly optimized library for numerical operations. Now, as I told you, digital images are 2D arrays of pixels and NumPy library is a general purpose array processing package library. So it provides a high performance multi-dimensional array object and tools for working with these arrays, which makes the processing of images easier. Now all the OpenCV array structures are converted to and converted from NumPy arrays. 
and in addition you can use more convenient indexing system rather than using for loops so when you want to learn OpenCV using python you need to have some knowledge about numpy also so if you have some knowledge of numpy library it's good but don't worry i will teach you step by step so you will not miss anything so that was a brief introduction about computer vision and OpenCV. In this video, I'm going to show you how you can install OpenCV for Python on your Windows operating system. So obviously you need to install Python on your Windows operating system in order to install OpenCV for Python. So first of all, I'm going to show you how you can install Python on your Windows operating system. And then we will see how to install OpenCV using Python. Now, if you have already installed Python on your Windows operating system, you can skip about five minutes of this video and go directly to the point where I am going to show you how you can install OpenCV for Python. So let's get started. So first of all, open your favorite browser on your Windows 10 operating system and then search for Python. And the first link which will appear here will be from python.org. So we are going to click on that link. And once this python.org website is open, you just need to scroll down a little until you see this downloads section. And you can see at the time of making this video, Python 3.7.0 is the latest version of Python available. So we are going to click on this link which says Python 3.7.0 and you will be redirected to this page which says Python 3.7.0 and now I'm going to scroll down until I see the files here and you will see there are various kinds of installer available here. We are going to install the Python using the executable installer. So we are going to choose this option which says Windows x86 hyphen 64 executable installer and now i will wait for this executable to be downloaded and once this executable is downloaded you just need to click on this exe file and i'm going to minimize the browser here so you can see python's 3.7.0 setup window has been started and on the first window you will see two options here one is install now and other is customize installation so what we are going to choose is this option which says customize installation because when you choose this install now option python will be installed at this path which i don't want to use you can see it's a long path which i don't want to remember so i will use uh, this option which says customize installation and i will also check this option which says add python 3.7 to path so now let's click on customize installation and next you will see this optional feature window and you can see there are some optional feature which this python installer will install for example documentation pip it will install which is a python package manager idle ide python test suite and other feature it's going to install so i'm going to leave everything as default and then i'm going to click next and now this next window will open which says advanced option here i'm going to check this option which says install for all users and i'm going to leave other check boxes as checked and then you will see this section here which says customize install location so i want to install python on my c directory so what i'm going to do is i'm going to open the windows explorer and I'm going to go to the C directory here. And once the C directory is open, I'm going to right click here and I'm going to create a new directory and I'm going to name this directory as Python. And then I'm going to press enter. And this path I'm going to give here in the customize install location. So I'm going to just give this path which says C colon slash Python and then backslash Python 3.7. 3.7 here means that we are going to install 3.7 version of Python. So now Python will be installed at this location on my computer. And then I'm going to click on the install button here. And then you will see the installation will start and it will be finished in a few seconds. So just wait for the installation to complete. And after some time, I can see this message which says setup was successful. So I'm going to click on this close button which is going to close this installer. So now in order to check whether Python is installed on our Windows operating system or not, we are going to search for Python here and you will see a few options here. One is this Python 3.7 terminal. Other is idle IDE. So first of all, we are going to click on this option which says Python 3.7 64 bit, which is going to open this kind of terminal. 
So this is a Python terminal and here we can uh, for example print something so I'm going to just write print and in the parentheses and in between the double quotes I can just write hello world and then press enter which is going to in return print hello world. That means Python 3.7 terminal is working. So I'm going to close this terminal now and once again I'm going to search for Python here and this time I'm going to select this option which says idle okay so just select this option which says idle and in the parenthesis python 3.7 64-bit so this idle is an IDE which comes with python installation at the time of installation we have chosen this option to install idle that's why we can see this option here and also this is an interactive shell so you can once again write a print and inside the parenthesis you can uh, just write for example once again hello world and then press enter and it's going to give you this kind of output here so now python interactive shell is working and idle ide is also working so i'm going to close this idle ide and now i want to check whether python is working using my command prompt or not so i'm going to right click on this windows button and then i'm going to click on command prompt and here i'm going to first of all write uh, python and then press enter and you can see this python option is working now even on your command prompt right so here also you can uh, just write print and inside the parenthesis you can just print uh, hello world and then press enter and it prints hello world in return now once python is installed on your windows 10 operating system we are going to install opencv using pip now pip is automatically installed on your windows operating system with the python installation so you don't need to separately install pip on your windows operating system it comes automatically with your python installation so to verify this first of all i'm going to check the python version so you can uh, just give uh, this command python hyphen hyphen version and then you can check the pip version so you can uh, just give this command pip hyphen hyphen version so just give this command and it's going to give you the version of pip which is installed on your windows operating system so to install opencv using pip you just need to give this command pip install opencv hyphen python and i'm going to press enter so you can see opencv related packages are downloading now so now opencv python package is installed using pip on my windows operating system now you will observe one more thing here and that is numpy package will be automatically installed with your opencv python package so now once opencv python package is installed we can verify it by just opening our python shell so i'm going to just give a python command to open the python shell and then here i'm going to just write import cv2 okay so once you give this command it should not give you any error and if this import gives you error that means opencv is not correctly installed on your operating system now after importing you can just check the version of opencv which you have installed using cv2 dot underscore underscore version underscore underscore and then press enter and it's going to give you the version of opencv which is installed on your operating system and in our case this is 4.0.0 at the time of making this video now you can check the same by writing your code inside a python file also so here i have opened my visual studio code editor and i have already created sample.py file and here also i'm going to import the cv2 package first of all and then i'm going to print the version of cv2 using this print statement so i'm going to just write cv2 dot underscore underscore version underscore underscore and then save this script and to open the terminal inside visual studio code you can just press ctrl shift p and then type toggle integrated terminal so just type toggle integrated terminal and then click on this first option which says toggle integrated terminal 
this is going to open the terminal inside your Visual Studio Code Editor. So here you can run your Python script using the Python command. So Python and then name of the script, which is sample.py in my case, and then press enter. And it's also going to give you the version of OpenCV, which is installed on your operating system. So this is how you can install OpenCV for Python on your Windows operating system. In the last video, we have seen how we can install OpenCV for Python. Now from this video, we will actually start writing some code. Now moving forward, I will be using PyCharm IDE to demonstrate how OpenCV works, but you are free to use any IDE or any other editor in order to use OpenCV. Now on PyCharm IDE, you need to install OpenCV little bit differently. So if you are using OpenCV, you just need to create a project inside OpenCV and then you just need to click on file and then go to the settings. Now once the settings window opens, you just need to go to the project and then it will uh, say after colon your project name. So my project name is OpenCV examples. That's why it's written here, OpenCV examples. So project colon your project name. So just click on this section and then click on project interpreter. And on the right hand side, you will see all the packages which comes pre-installed when you create a project inside PyCharm IDE. Now we want OpenCV Python package. So to install OpenCV Python package, on PyCharm, you just need to click on this plus button here. And then you just need to type OpenCV hyphen Python. Now the first result you can see here is OpenCV hyphen Python. And the version which is available right now is 4.0.0.21, which is the latest version. So to install this package for your PyCharm IDE, you just need to click on install package button and then after some time you will see this message which says package opencv hyphen python installed successfully in the green bar that means opencv package is installed successfully so you can close this window and now you will be able to see opencv hyphen python is added to your packages and also numpy is added to your packages which comes with your opencv python package so i'm going to just click ok and now you will be able to import this CV2 package in your Python script. Now in this video, I'm going to show you how you can read images and write images using CV2 package. Now let me show you where you can find some sample images for your project. So you can open the browser and then go to this URL github.com forward slash OpenCV. So just go to this URL and then under this OpenCV project in GitHub, you will be able to see uh, these repositories. You just need to choose this repository which says OpenCV and then you can scroll down and all the images you will find inside the samples folder. So I'm going to go inside the sample folder and then inside the sample folder, you just need to go inside the data folder. So here you will find many sample images and videos and other files, which you can use in your project for the learning purpose. So you can uh, use these images in order to develop your example. So what I generally do is I just go to this repository, which is under the URL github.com forward slash OpenCV forward slash OpenCV. And then I either download the zip file of this project or clone this GitHub repository on my operating system. And once you clone or download this repository, it will look like this. So it will be downloaded as this folder which is opencv hyphen master and once again you can go to the samples folder here and inside the samples folder you can go to the data folder and you will find all those images which i have shown you on the github repository 
Now to start with, we will be using this image, which is lena.jpg. So I'm going to just copy this image for now. And then I'm going to go to my PyCharm IDE. And then I'm going to just paste this image inside my project. So this JPG image will be directly available inside my project folder. Now let's see how we can read images using the CV2 module. So you just need to use CV2 and there is a method called I am read which enables you to read the images. So the first argument which you need to give here is the image name. So I'm going to give the image name which is lena.jpg and the second argument here is a flag. So there are three flags you can give here. You can either give zero or one or minus one flag here. So this second argument is a flag which specifies the way images should be read. So let me show you all the flags here. So the first flag is cv2 dot am read underscore color or you can give the integer value of it which is one and whenever you give this flag as the second argument of am read function it's going to load the colored image if you give this flag which is cv2 dot am read underscore grayscale or if you give this integer value which is zero it's going to load your image in grayscale mode and the third flag is i am read underscore unchanged or the value minus one which is going to load your image as it is including the alpha channel so for now we are going to just give here zero flag which means we want to load our image in grayscale so now let's run the code and let's see what happens until this point so you can see our code runs fine without giving any error now let me give any random name here as the file name and once again run this code and once again you will see that there is no exception which is thrown here so even if you give the wrong file path or file name here this function is not going to give you any error now in case of wrong path or wrong file name let's say i'm going to just assign this value to a new variable which is img and let's print the value of this img using the print method and then let me run the code once again and you can see whenever you will give the wrong file name here or wrong path here as a result of this method you will get none so you can check the value of image and if it is equal to none then you know that you have done something wrong or you have given some wrong file name or wrong path here let's give the correct file name so i'm going to give the correct file name and then run the code once again and now this time you will see it's going to give you a matrix which means that it has read all the pixels from this image and then assigned it to our img variable and the result you can see in the form of this matrix so until now we have just read the image now we want to display our image so in order to display our image what we can do is we can use a cv2 dot i am show method so just write i am show here which is going to show your image so the first argument here will be the name of your window in which your image will open so you can give any name here for example i'm going to give image name here to my window and then the second argument is the image variable which you have read using the I am read method so I'm going to just pass I am G variable which is this variable here so now will it show the image let's check so I'm going to run the code once again and you can see the image is shown for a millisecond 
and then it disappears so now we need to add something which will wait for the image to disappear so i'm going to add one more method here which is cv2 dot wait key so this cv2 dot wait key is the keyboard binding function and the argument which it takes is the number of millisecond for which you want to show your image window so let's give 5000 value here which means we want to show the image for 5 seconds and at last what we are going to do is after we have done seeing our image we will destroy the window which we have created so you can uh, just give uh, this method cv2 destroy all windows so destroy all windows simply destroys all the windows which we have created there is one more method which is destroy window and this method you can use to destroy a particular window which we will see little bit later but for now we will just use this method which says destroy all windows so now let's run our code and let's see what happens so now this time you can see our image is loaded for 5 seconds and our image is loaded in grayscale mode now if you give here 0 as the argument of wait key method then let's see what happens so I'm going to run my code and now you will observe that your window will not disappear after 5 seconds or any number of seconds it's going to wait for the closing of this window which we can close from this close button and you can see it's uh, loaded in the grayscale mode I'm going to close this uh, window and here as an argument of I am read image the second argument I want to give here right now is one which means the colored image and let's run the code and you can see this image is loaded in the colored mode now let's also check the minus one argument which is unchanged so it's going to just load the image as it is with alpha channels so let me just close this image once again so now we have understood how we can read an image using I am read function so let's see how we can write an image to a file using a function called I am write so we are going to just use cv2 uh, once again and then there is a method called I am write which you can use to write an image in the form of a file so the first argument here will be the image name whatever you want to give here so here let's say we want to give the name to our image as lena underscore copy dot png so the image will be saved as the file name lena underscore copy dot png file and the second argument which it takes is the image you want to save so let's save the same image which we have read using the I am read function inside this I am G variable and pass it as the second variable here and let's run the code and let's see what happens so our image is loaded using this I am show function and now when I close this uh, window here you will observe one more file will be created here so let me just close this window and now you can see as soon as I close this window this method is called and after this this I am right method will be called and when this method is called this image is created with the name lena underscore copy dot png we can also open this image and you can see it has the same image which we have seen in the case of lena dot jpg so let me close these two images so now we have understood how we can read the images and write the images using i am read function and i am write function so let's make our code little bit better and what we want to do here now is let's say if somebody presses an escape key then only we want to destroy all the windows without saving it into a new file otherwise if somebody presses the s key then we are going to save this file 
with the new name let's say lena copy dot png file so i'm going to just capture the output of my wait key so just create a new variable let's say k so now when we press any key this key will be captured in this variable now as you know every key has its own value so we are going to just use a uh, if condition and we are going to just check whether the value of k is equal to 27 which means that we have pressed the escape key and if somebody have pressed the escape key we are going to simply destroy all the windows otherwise let's give the second condition which is l if k is equal to ORD and this is a built-in function and it takes one argument which is the key name which we want to press so let's say somebody presses the s key and if somebody presses the s key we just want to save the image which we have read using the i am read function to a second image which we call lena underscore copy dot png and then we will uh, simply destroy all the windows which we have created using I am show method. So let's run the code and let's see what happens. So I'm going to run the code. So this image is loaded and as soon as I press escape button, you can see this image disappears. That means this condition is met and this method is called and all the windows will be destroyed without saving the image. Let's delete this image and let's see what will happen when we press the save key. So let me just uh, delete this image and now let's run the code once again and this time I'm going to press the S key and once again you can see the windows are destroyed but this image is created once again using this function. That means this time this condition is fulfilled and this image is created and after that all the windows are destroyed so this code is working fine for me but in the documentation it's also written that if you are using a 64-bit machine it's better to use this notation with your wait key method which is wait key and this mask here and then once again when we run our code it works uh, as it is but in case if it doesn't work, you can try uh, using this mask here. So this is how you can read and write images using OpenCV. In this video, we will see how to read, display and save videos using cameras. So often we have to capture live stream from camera. So first of all, we will see how we can capture the live stream from the camera. The same method you can use to display the video from a video file. So let's get started and let's see how we can capture the live stream from your default camera. So I'm going to just create a variable called cap and then inside your CV2 package, there is a class called video capture. We are going to take this class and create an object of it. And as an argument here, you can provide either the input file name. So for example, if you want to just read the video from a particular file, you can give the file name. For example, my file dot avi or mp4 or you need to provide the device index of your camera from which you want to read. So by default, this index will be either zero or in many devices, it's also minus one. So first of all, we are going to try with zero device index, which in most cases works. So if this device index zero doesn't work, try with minus one. Now, if you have multiple cameras and if you want to uh, use the other camera, then you can also try one for the second camera or two for the third camera and so on. So we are going to use the default camera, which is at device index zero. So this is the argument we need to provide here. And then we are going to create a while loop in order to capture the frame continuously. So let's create a while loop here. And this loop we are going to run indefinitely. So we are going to just say that while this 
loop is true we want to capture the frames so we are going to just define these variable ret and frame and then using this cap instance we are going to call a method called read now this read method is going to return true if the frame is available and this frame will be saved into this frame variable so here the true or false will be saved if the frame is available this ret will be true otherwise it will be false and this frame variable will actually capture or save the frame now in order to show this captured frame we can use i am show so i'm going to just use a cv2 dot i am show which is going to show this frame inside the window first of all you can uh, give the name to your window for example frame and then second argument will be the frame which you are reading which is this variable here now in the next step we have seen in the last video also we are going to use the cv2 dot wait key in order to wait for the user input and if this input will be q we will quit the window and destroy all windows so we are going to just say cv2 dot wait key and the argument here will be one and i have told you you need to provide this mask for 64 bit machines so you can provide this mask and then we are going to just see if this key which is pressed is q or not so we are going to use the ord method for this and we will just check if the q key is pressed and if this q key is pressed we are going to break from the loop and we will come out of the loop and after we come out of the loop the first thing we need to do is to actually release the capture variable so this is important after reading your video you need to release the resources so you need to just call this method cap dot release and then we will just destroy all windows so let's run this script and let's see what is the output so i'm going to run this script and you can see in this window the input from my default webcam of my laptop right now i'm just showing some book in front of this camera that's why you will see this uh, book and as soon as i press q key our window will be destroyed and we come out of this script now let's say you want to change the frames to gray so we want to convert our video input from the colored image to the grayscale image for that what you can do is you can define a variable called gray or anything else and then there is a method called cv2 dot cvt color which is to convert color and the first argument which it takes is the source so in our case the source is the frame which we are capturing from the cap dot read method the second argument is actually the conversion what we want to do so we will uh, just call cv2 dot color underscore and by default the default colored image is captured as bgr image that means blue green red channel images and we want to convert it to a grayscale image so we will just write bgr to gray this means we want to capture the bgr image to the grayscale image and now this is going to give us the grayscale image and this input we can uh, just transfer to the i am show method as the second argument of this i am show method so let's run this script once again and let's see what is the output of the script and now you can see the video captured is in grayscale image and as soon as i press q it's going to release all the captured resources and then destroy all windows now as i said if you want to display the image from a video file you just need to give the name of the video file for example name 
and then the extension which is let's say avi or mp4 or any other format now using this cap instance you can read few properties about the video which is captured and the first property is if the video is open or not so in case whenever you provide the file name and the file path is wrong then this is going to give you false so there is a method called is opened and this means if the file name of the video which you want to provide here is correct this is going to give us true otherwise this is opened is going to give us false in case the file path is wrong or the index which you give here for the device is wrong so let's give any random index here and then let's see what happens so i'm going to run this script and you will see nothing will happen because this is opened is going to give you false let's print that also and let's verify with the print statement the same thing so i'm going to just uh, use this and then uh, run the program once again and you can see it prints false that means you cannot capture the video using this index so my device is at index 0 by default so i need to give this index name otherwise for example i provide the wrong file name here also it's going to give us the false value there is a method called cap.open also so if this cap is open gives you false you can try opening your capture video using cap.open also now there are other properties which you can read using uh, this uh, cap instance and the property you can read using a method called get so you can uh, just write cap dot get and as an argument of this get method you can provide the prop id so there are different prop ids which you can read so let's say we want to read the property which is called frame width and frame height which is going to give you the height and width of your frame so for this you just need to write cv2 dot cap underscore prop underscore frame underscore width this is going to give you the width of your frame and if you want to get the height of your frame you can use cap underscore prop underscore frame underscore height and this whole list you can find on the official documentation of OpenCV so I will provide you this uh, link where you can uh, see different values of the prop ID so right now I have used this ID and this ID but there are several number of IDs available here which you can use to read the property of your frame so let's use print method to just print out what property we are reading and let's once again run this script and here you can see in the output you can see the value 640 and 480 which is the width and height of your frame by default now let's see how we can save the image which we have captured from our webcam or the default camera so as we already know that we read frame by frame when we capture the videos from your default camera so for creating the capture you have used video capture class and for saving the video we are going to create the video writer class so i'm going to first of all uh, create a variable called out for output and then i'm going to call a class called video writer so let's call uh, this class which is video writer and now this class takes few argument the first argument is the name of your output file so for example i can uh, just give the name output dot avi the extension of the file the second argument here is the 4cc code now 4cc is a 4 byte code which is used to specify the video codec and if you want to know more about 4cc code you can visit this website which is 4cc.org forward slash codec.php and here you can find uh, several 4cc codes so for now what we are going to do is we are going to just get the 4cc code using 
a class called video writer underscore 4cc so i'm going to declare a variable 4cc and then i'm going to use cv2 to call a class called uh, video writer 4cc so as an argument of this class you just need to provide the 4cc code so for example i can uh, give uh, this kind of code so you can provide this argument which is x tricks and then your 4cc code which is x vid in this case or otherwise what you can do here is you can also give this uh, code in this format so for example x comma then second argument is v and then uh, third argument is i and the fourth argument is uh, d so you can either give uh, this type of notation or you can just use asterisk and then in single quotes you can just write uh, xvid or any other code here and then this 4cc code we are going to pass as the second argument the third argument is the number of frames per second so let's say we just want to use uh, 20 frames per second and the fourth argument is the size so we already know that the size in which we are capturing is 640 by 480 so we are going to provide this in the form of tuple so 640 comma 480 so this will be the size of the video which will be saved in this file now inside our loop as we have seen we are uh, just reading the frame here in the frame variable and this is the boolean variable if the frame is available it's true otherwise it's false right so first of all we are going to check if its value is true or false so we can uh, just write if ret is equal to true then only we are going to just save this file into the output file so i'm going to just put everything inside this uh, if condition otherwise we are going to break out of this loop so i'm going i'm going to just say else break now inside this if condition we can uh, just uh, write this frame into a file using a method called out dot write so out is the instance of video writer so i'm going to just use out dot write and then we are going to just pass the frame which we have captured which is inside the frame variable and now at last we are going to release all the resources using the out uh, instance which is the instance of video writer so i'm going to just write out dot uh, release and then let's run the script and let's see what happens so one thing to note here is our video will be saved as it is that is in the bgr mode that is in the colored uh, mode so let's run the code and let's see what happens so i'm going to just start my script once again and now i'm going to just press q so you can see here our video is shown in the grayscale and our video will be saved in the original from format because we are saving every frame before the conversion so it will be saved in the original format so i'm going to just uh, close this uh, script and as soon as i close the script you can see the output.avi file and in order to verify this file i'm going to go to the project and here i'm going to start this file using let's say vlc media player and you can see it shows the output of the output.avi file so this is how you can read videos display and save videos using the default camera or the video file in this video we will learn how to draw different geometric shapes using opencv so to start with i have this code and i have already explained what this code does so this i am read is used to read an image and then we are just showing this image into a window using this i am show method and then using the wait key we will wait for the closing event and the destroy all window will destroy all the windows which we have created so this we have already seen now let's say we want to draw some geometric shapes on this image so to start with let's learn how to draw 
a line on our image which we have read from this read function. So what we are going to do is we will overwrite this image. So we have already uh, created this image variable. So what we are going to do is we will draw a line on the same image. So I'm going to just write img is equal to cv2 dot lines and you can see in the suggestion this line method takes few arguments. So the first argument is the image itself. The second argument is the starting coordinates of point one. The third argument is the ending coordinates of point two. And then the fourth argument is the color and fifth argument is the thickness. So let's use this line method and then give these arguments one by one. So we want to write to the image which we have read using this file. So the first argument is the image variable and the second argument is the coordinates. So the coordinates should be given in the form of tuple. So let's say we start with 0 comma 0 coordinate and the ending coordinates will be let's say 255 comma 255. Okay. The fourth argument will be the color and the color you need to give in the BGR format. So if you want to uh, give the blue color then you can uh, just write 255 comma 0 comma 0 because first is the blue color, second is the green color and third is the red channel color. So if you specify here 255 in the first channel that means the blue channel then it's going to draw the blue line. If you give here 255 and then you make other channels uh, 0 then it's going to draw the green line and if this 255 comes at last and the other channels are 0 then it's going to draw the red line. So let's say we want to draw the red line that's why I have given 255 here and the next argument is the thickness. So the thickness you provide in the numbers. So starting from 1, 1 is the lowest thickness you can increase the thickness 2 or 3 or uh, let's say 5 or 10. So it's going to increase the thickness based upon this number. So let's say we want to give the thickness to our line 5. So this is going to draw a red line on our image. So let's run the code and let's see what happens. So you can see our image is loaded in the grayscale. That's why you don't see any color on the line. But our line is created here. So let's load this image in the colored format by changing this argument to 1 and let's run the code once again and you will see the image is loaded in the colored format and the line color is red. Now if you want to change the thickness of this line you can just increase this number and if you want to change the color of this line you can change it using these color channels. So let's uh, change the line color to uh, green let's say and I'm going to run the code and you can see the thickness of the line is increased and now the color of the line is green. Now if you want to draw the line with any other color you can just uh, go to your favorite browser and search for RBG color picker but always remember our image will be loaded in the BGR format so in the reverse order so blue green and then the red channel so let's say we want this uh, color here and it's RBG uh, channels are this so I'm going to just copy all these channels and then I'm going to give these channels in the reverse order so first of all 147 then 96 and then third channel is the 44 and then I'm going to run my code and you can see you get the same color which you have chosen here. So this is how you can change the color of your lines. Now there is a function called arrowed line. Let's say we want to use this function which is called arrowed 
line and this is going to draw the arrowed line as it says. So let's say we want to just uh, draw this arrowed line in uh, blue color. So I'm going to just give uh, the color channels here and then run the code. And this arrowed line is overlapping on the previous line. That's why you don't see the previous line. So let's change the coordinate of this line. So let's uh, draw this line in this coordinate, which is going to draw the straight line in my opinion. Let's see what happens when I run the code. And you can see it draws the straight line from uh, left to right, which is the arrowed line. And this was our original line. Now let's see how to draw the rectangle. So to draw the rectangle, we will do the same. We will uh, just overwrite on the same image. So we will uh, just say image is equal to CV2 dot rectangle, which is a method. And you can see what are the argument it takes. So the first argument is the image itself. The second argument is the point one and point two. This point one and point two coordinate I'm going to explain in a bit. The third argument is the color, which is same as line. And the fourth argument is the thickness. So let's use this uh, rectangle function to draw the rectangle. So first of all, I'm going to just uh, pass the image variable here. The second argument is the top left vertex coordinates. So let me uh, just uh, draw something here so you will be able to understand in a better way. So when you want to draw a rectangle using OpenCV, this here is a top left vertex coordinates, which is x1 and y1. And this is here the lower right vertex coordinates. So the top left vertex coordinates you give in the second argument. So let's give uh, some uh, coordinates here. So 384, 0. And the lower right coordinates I want to give here is let's say 510, 128. So let's say we want to give the red color. So I'm going to just write uh, 0, 0, 255. And the thickness I want to give here is 5. And I'm going to just remove this because it will uh, just create problems. And now let's run the code. And you can see the rectangle is drawn with the red color of thickness 5. You can change the thickness of this uh, rectangle by changing uh, the value of the thickness. And then you can run the code. And now the thickness of uh, this rectangle line is increased. Now one more thing you can provide here is instead of giving the thickness value, if you write here minus 1, then it's going to fill the rectangle with the color which you provide here. So when we give minus one here, let's see what happens. So now we get the filled rectangle because we have provided minus one option here. So if you provide minus one, then your rectangle or whatever shape you are creating will be filled with the color which you specify here. So let me just change the thickness to 10 once again. And now let's see how we can uh, draw the circle. So to draw the circle, we once again use cv2 dot uh, circle function. And once again, you can see what are the argument which it takes. So the first argument is the image. The second argument is the center of the circle. The third argument is the radius of the circle and the fourth and fifth argument is the color and the thickness once again. So once again, we will provide the image. The second argument is the center of the circle. So let's give the center of the circle, which is the coordinate on which you want to uh, give the center. So I'm going to provide, let's say 447 comma 63 here. And the third argument is the radius. So radius we want to provide here is let's say 63. And the fourth argument is the color. So let's uh, use 0, 255, 0, which is going to draw the green color. And then let's give minus 1 here. So our circle will be filled 
with green color. And let's run the code and let's see what happens. So you can see this circle is drawn here and this circle is filled with the green color. Now let's see how we can uh, put some text into the image. So to put the text on our image, we will once again use the image variable and overwrite on it. And then we will uh, use a method called put text. So this is the method which we are going to use. The first argument is the image. The second argument here is the text which we want to put. So let's say we want to just print OpenCV on our image. So we can uh, just write OpenCV as the second argument. The third argument is the starting point of your text. So you need to give the coordinates where you want to start your text from. So the coordinates I want to give here is let's say 10 comma 500 and then the next argument is the font face. So the font face you need to give here using a variable. So I'm going to create a variable let's say font and then there are many font faces available using cv2 so you can uh, just write cv2 dot font in capital and you can see what are the options available here i'm going to choose uh, the first one itself which is font hershey simplex font and then we are going to pass this font uh, as the fourth argument the fifth argument here will be uh, the font size so let's say i want to give the font size uh, 4 here the sixth argument here is the color of your font so let's say i want to just draw 255 255 255 which is going to give us uh, a whitish kind of uh, color the next argument we will give here is the thickness so let's say i want to provide the thickness uh, 10 here and the next argument you can give here is the line type. So let's say I want to give the line type CV2 dot uh, capital line underscore AA. And now let's run our script and let's see what happens. So you can see here open CV is printed in the white color of thickness 10. And if you want to change this color, you can change it from uh, here. So I'm going to just put the first channel as zero and now this color is changed to yellow color now one more thing i want to show here is how you can create an image using numpy zeros method so either you can use a image which you read from im read method or what you can do here is i'm going to just comment this code and we can create an image using the numpy zeros method so i'm going to create this img variable and then i'm going to use the numpy module so just import this numpy as import numpy as np and then we are going to use this mp to call the zeros method now in order to create a black image using this zeros method you need to give the first argument in the form of list and inside this list the first uh, element will be the height second will be the width and third will be three so let's say we want to provide the height uh, 512 we want to provide the width also 512 and the third argument will be uh, three and the next argument you give here is the d type or uh, data type so you can just write np dot uh, u int Eight here so this method is going to give you a black image of the size 512 by 512 so let's run our code and let's see what happens so you can see now you can see the black image and on our black image the line is drawn the arrowed line is drawn and the text and the circle and the rectangle are drawn here so this is how you can draw different geometric shapes on your image there are several other methods you can use for example cv2 dot uh, polyline method or cv2 dot eclipse method to draw eclipse and polygon on your image so just try those uh, method to draw different shapes on your image so in this video we will see how to set some properties 
to our captured images so in the video capture lesson we have seen that when we create a cap variable using the video capture class we can get many properties using the cap dot get method so we were able to get the width of the frame and the height of the frame similarly we can use the cap dot set function to set some values so you can just write cap dot set and then you can set the values of the property generally all the properties which you can read like this you can also able to set those property using the set method now this notation you can also give in the form of number so every uh, property here has a defined number so for example instead of using cv2 dot cap prop underscore frame width you can uh, just write uh, three here and that will work also so every property has a number associated with it so using that number either you can uh, just let's say we want to set the width and height either you can write uh, this as the first argument and the second argument is the actual width you want in the video right or you can uh, just give the number of that property and then give its value so let's say we want to change the width of this video to let's say one two zero eight and then let's uh, just set the height so cap dot set and the associated number for uh, the height parameter will be four so three for width and four for the height and let's say we want to just uh, move it to 720 and then we will once again print the value of uh, the width and height and this time we are going to just give their associated numbers which is three and four so let's run this program you might already know this program what this program is doing so it's just capturing the video from your default device at uh, index uh, zero and then it's just uh, showing all the frames using this i am show method in a window so now i'm going to run this script and let's see what happens so when I run this script, you can see the size of this frame is changed. So let's see in the terminal also, you can see before the original size of the video we are capturing is 640 and 480. So width was 640 and the height is 480. Now once we have changed the width and height, you can see the width is changed to 1280 and the height is changed to 720 so even if i have given here 1208 the default camera will automatically set its value according to its resolution so let's just close uh, this video and let's say we want to just change this value to some random number so let's say 700 by 700 will it work or not so let's uh, run the script once again and let's see what happens so the script is running and you can see that even though we have provided the 700 and 700 the camera will automatically take the resolution which is available for your default uh, camera so the resolution remains the same even though we have set the different value to it so you need to keep in mind even though you can uh, give any value here but the camera will only set the resolution which is available for it so let's give a very big value here so i'm going to provide let's say uh, 3000 here and height also 3000 and let's run the script once again and let's see what happens so when we run the script you will see the resolution is changed but the resolution will change to the maximum resolution of my default camera which is 1280 and 720 this is the maximum resolution which is available for my webcam so let me just close this uh, uh, window 
so this is how you can set some values so there are many values you can set using this set method you just need to go to the documentation and then search for the value you want to set so in the last two videos we have seen how to capture videos from our default camera device or how to add geometric shapes on the images now in this video we are going to combine the knowledge we have gained in the last two videos so if you haven't seen the last two videos i will recommend you to watch those videos and then come to this video so in this video we will see how we can uh, just draw something on a video and more specifically the aim of this video is how to show the current date and time on a live video so now in the last video we have seen how to draw shapes on images and we have also seen how to uh, put text on our images right so let's say we just want to print the value of width and height on the default camera and let me just remove this line which we have used to convert the bgr image to the grayscale image so we will uh, just uh, see the colored bgr image so now what we want to do is we want to print the width and height which we get from these properties on our video which we are capturing so in the last video we have already seen that we can use a method which is cv2 dot put text yeah so this method we have seen in the last video and first of all we will define the font which we will pass to our put text method so the font i'm using here is cv2.font hershey underscore simplex and now the first argument here will be the frame which we are capturing because every frame is just like an image and a video is the combination of multiple images so the first argument here will be the frame the second argument here will be your text so the text which we want to show here is let's say width and height so let's define a variable which we want to show on our video so let's say the variable name is text and first of all i'm going to define the width so just say width and then we are going to provide the value of the width using the concatenation operator now because this value will be in integer and we want to convert it to the string so we will use the str method to convert the integer to the string and then we can pass the width here inside our string variable once again we will use the concatenation operator and then let's provide some uh, space here and then we will uh, just write the height colon and then once again the concatenation operator and once again we will use this uh, string method and inside this string method we will now take the height okay and now we will pass this text to our put text argument now the third argument is the coordinate so let's say i want to just put this text at the coordinate 10 comma 50 the fourth argument is the font which we have already declared the fifth argument is the thickness so let's say the thickness we want is 1 and then the color so let's say the color we want is 0 comma 255 comma 255 and then the thickness so i think the thickness comes after the color and the value 1 we have set for the font scale so you can change the font scale uh, 1 2 3 4 any font you can uh, change it from here so this value 1 is for the font scale and the value we are providing right now is for the thickness so let's say the thickness is 2 and the last argument here will be the line type so i'm going to just provide the line type as cv2 dot line underscore aa so what do you think will this uh, text will be printed on our image or not 
so it will not print yet because we need to write on the frame this text so we need to just write frame is equal to and then put the text on the same frame which we are seeing right now so now this will work and let me just break this line so you will see all the code and now let's run the code and let's see what happens when we run the code so let me run this uh, script and you will see here that now we are seeing the width and height on top of this video which is 1280 and the height is 720.0 so this is how you can show text on your video which you are capturing from the web camera or from the video file now let me just comment these lines of code because they are changing the resolution of our video and it's not uh, fitting this video uh, screencast so i have uh, commented this code and now let's do something more interesting so now let's say we want to show the current date and time on the video and you might have guessed how to print it but let me show you if you don't uh, know how to print the date and time on your live video so first of all we are going to import the package which is available inside uh, python which is date time and then we are going to create uh, this date time variable let's say the date time variable uh, name will be uh, date uh, t and then first of all we are going to use the str method to convert the date and time to string and then there is a method inside this date time uh, library so we just need to write date time dot date time once again and then the method called now which is going to show you the current date and time so once we have converted our current date and time to the string variable then we can pass this variable as the second argument and now let's run the script and let's see what happens once again so i am running the script and now you will see that it shows the current time and current date on the video itself so this is how you can uh, put the text on your video you can even put some uh, shapes which we have seen in the last video on this video itself so you can put the line or the rectangle or the circle on your video which you are capturing from the camera or some file so this was some kind of a mini project which we have created from the knowledge which we have gained from the last two videos in this video we will learn how to handle mouse event in opencv now mouse event can be anything for example a right click event or left mouse button click event or left button double click event so there are many mouse event available in cv2 package now to list out all the events in the cv2 package you can write this kind of code so first of all i'm going to create a variable called uh, events and then i'm going to just iterate over all the events inside cv2 library so i'm going to just write uh, i for i in dir inside our cv2 uh, package so this dir method is the inbuilt method which is going to show all the classes and member functions inside your cv2 uh, package okay so we are iterating over all the function names or uh, member variable names and then we want to see what are the events available inside this package so we can uh, just filter those events using a condition so we are going to just say that we want to just see the variables or the member properties which have this keyword event in them so event in i and then we are going to just print out all the events so i'm going to just print out all the events 
and then I'm going to run this code and here you can see the list of all the events which are available inside your CV2 library. So you can see there is an event called event flag R button for the right button for the mouse or there is event for left button double click event or the event for L button down event. So there are uh, many such events available here and we are going to use those events to listen for the mouse events. So this is how you can uh, print all the events which are available inside your CV2 library and now we will create a script or a program to listen for the mouse event. So first of all, we will create a mouse callback function which is executed when mouse event takes place. So in order to create this callback function, we are going to uh, just uh, define a function and then we will uh, give the name to our function. For example, uh, click event function and this callback function generally takes few arguments. So the first argument will be the event which is taking place when we click our mouse and then it's going to give us the X and Y coordinate on the image where we are clicking with our mouse. So we are going to get the X axis value and the Y axis value whenever we click the mouse at certain position in our image. Also, we will uh, get the flags and we will get the param. So for creating the mouse click callback function, it has this kind of specific format, which is uh, same everywhere. So these are the parameter it takes. And then inside your uh, callback function, you can define the logic. So let's say whenever I click the left button down, then I want to show the X and Y coordinates on the same image. So I can uh, just say if the event variable is equal to CV2 dot event and then I will uh, just look for the left button down click event. So if this event occurs, then I will uh, first of all print the X and Y axis values. So let's print X comma Y and you can also provide some space between X and uh, Y coordinates using uh, this kind of string. And then what we are going to do is we are going to just uh, put this uh, X and Y coordinate values on the same image which we are opening. So we have already seen in the last videos how to put text on the videos. We just need to create this uh, font variable for the font. And then there is a method called cv2.puttext. So we are going to just write uh, cv2.puttext, which takes few argument. First is the image. Now you can see this image shows error and this error says unresolved reference but don't worry when we write our code uh, fully this error will go so first will be the image the second is the string which we want to put so let's say we want to put the string str for the x and y value so i'm going to just write x y and then we are going to just print the x value then concatenation operator and then comma and then once again concatenation operator y and don't forget to convert these uh, coordinate values into the string using the str function so str function here and for the y axis also you need to uh, use this str to convert it to the string value and then the string we pass as the second argument. The third argument will be the location where we want to put the text and this location we already know from this X and Y value. 
so it's easy for us we are going to just say x comma y because we already know the x and y coordinate using this callback event the fourth argument will be the font the fifth argument will be the font scale let's say it's uh, one and then the next argument is the color so let's say color we want to give here is uh, 255 comma 255 comma zero and the last argument i want to give here is the thickness let's say thickness we want to give here is two and then we will uh, show this text on the image using cv2 dot uh, i am show method so i'm going to just write i am uh, show and then the name of the image window for example image and the image itself which is img so right now this uh, is showing error to us but when we will uh, call this callback function using a standard function called set mouse callback then this error will go so i'm going to define the img variable first of all and let's say we want to create a black uh, image using uh, numpy so we will uh, call np.zeros uh, method here so np.zeros and the size of uh, this image will be 512 comma 512 comma 3 and the data type will be np.uint8 and once we have this image we are going to show this image using once again the i am show method and this image name will be the same image and the variable we want to pass here is the image variable which is the black image which we have created using this uh, numpy zeros uh, function now the next and the important step here is calling a method called set mouse callback uh, method so this method we are going to use to call our callback function which we have created which is click event function whenever somebody clicks on the image which we are showing using this i am show window so the first parameter it takes is the name of your uh, image make sure that this name here which you uh, take in the i am show method you can see i'm taking the same name here in the i am show method also here so the window name should be the same everywhere then only uh, it will work so here also you need to uh, just give the parameter first parameter here is the window name so the window name is image and the second parameter is the callback function which we want to uh, call whenever this event take place so this is the callback function which we have created now the next step are uh, the obvious steps which we have already uh, seen so first of all we will uh, call the wait key method to wait for uh, the escape event and uh, the second is the destroy all windows so we will destroy all the windows once we are finished so let's run this code and let's see what happens so now you can see the black image which is created by numpy zeros method and when i click on uh, this image anywhere you can see the coordinates of uh, the position where i have clicked is uh, printed here so let's uh, click here you can see when i uh, give this left down button uh, click event then the position of the x and y coordinate is printed on this black image so i'm uh, clicking again and again this left uh, down button and the position is uh, printed okay so let me just close this window now what i want to do is let's uh, just uh, reduce the size of uh, this uh, font to 0.5 then uh, the font size will be a little bit smaller now what i want to do is i want to listen for some other events so i will go to my callback function once again and i will add one more condition here so once again if event 
is equal to CV2 and this time I want to listen for the right click event. So I'm going to just write event right button down event. Okay. So whenever somebody uh, presses this uh, right button down for the mouse, then this uh, event is going to be captured inside this condition. Now, if you remember, uh, I have told you that image is shown in OpenCV in the form of BGR format. And we already have this image. You can see we have declared the image variable. That's why this error is also gone. So using this image, we want to uh, find out the red, blue and green channel. So now inside this condition, what I want to do is I want to print out uh, the BGR channels of the image wherever I click. Okay. So you can uh, first of all declare a blue variable name and then we have IMG uh, variable which is this one and using this image variable we can get the blue channel using the coordinates. So first of all you can provide y comma x. We already have the y and x coordinates. And then the channel for the blue color is channel zero because it starts from uh, uh, blue BGR. So blue and then uh, green and then red. Okay. So I'm going to just copy it two more times. The second is uh, green and the channel for it will be the one or index will be one here. And for the red channel, this index will be two here. So I'm going to just write red here and once again I'm going to just copy uh, this code and uh, this time what I want to do is instead of uh, printing the coordinates I want to print the BGR channel so here I'm going to just write uh, blue and then second will be the green channel and then the third will be the red channel so I'm going to just write comma and then concatenation operator str and then red channel okay so this will be uh, the string we are going to name it as bgr and this string we will uh, put here the color also we can change so the color for the coordinate will be different and the color for uh, this event will be different 255 okay so it's going to print the BGR channels on your image. Now, because we are creating uh, the black image, whenever I uh, just click the right uh, click mouse event, you can see the BGR uh, channels for this black image will be always 0, 0, 0, right? When I click the left click, then these are the coordinates. When I click the right click, these are the BGR uh, channels. So let's uh, change this image from uh, the black image to something uh, visible. So I already have uh, the Lena image. So we can uh, use this Lena image using the cv2.imread method. So I'm going to just write cv2.imread and the first will be the name of the file which is uh, lena.jpg so now let's uh, run this code once again and now i have this colored image so we will be able to uh, see these functionality in a better way so first of all the left button click event you see the coordinate and when i click the right click button event then you can see the bgr uh, channels are printed once again here you can see the BGR uh, is different. Here also these uh, BGR colors are uh, different. So you can see everywhere they are a little bit different because this is the colored image and the color differs at every pixel level. So this is how uh, the mouse click event works. In the last video we have seen how to use mouse click event in OpenCV using Python. So we have seen how we can create a callback function which listens to a mouse click event and then how to use this callback function using 
the set mouse callback method now in this video i will show you some more examples about mouse click event so the first example i want to show about drawing a point and then connecting points using the line so to start with i'm going to just remove this if condition for the right uh, down button click event and every time somebody clicks the left button down click event of mouse then what i want to do is every time the mouse is clicked down i want to draw a circle very small circle and when he clicks on the next point then i want to join those two points using a line so for that i will need a cv2 circle so i'm going to remove uh, this code which we don't uh, need right now we just need this condition which listens for the left button down click event of mouse and then what we will do is we will just use cv2 to draw a circle so we will uh, just write uh, dot circle and first of all this uh, circle method takes the image so we are going to pass the image and then the second argument is the coordinates x and y coordinate so we already have x and y coordinate using this uh, callback function with the second and third parameters and then the third parameter will be the radius so i will uh, take the radius 3 which is uh, like very small which will uh, give you a uh, effect like a point on an image and then we can give the color so let's give uh, 0 comma 0 comma 255 and then we will uh, give the thickness now the thickness i'm going to give here is minus 1 and you might already know what this minus 1 do so this minus 1 whenever you give as a thickness it fills your circle or any closed uh, shape okay so your uh, closed circle will be filled with this color which you provide here now next what i want to do is i want to create an array of points so i'm going to uh, just declare a variable called uh, points and initialize it with an empty array now this uh, empty array uh, variable we can use inside our callback function and what we are going to do is we are going to just uh, add or append every time this mouse is clicked so i'm going to just call an append method here and then we are going to append the x and y coordinate to this points array so we know that where this mouse is clicked and we are saving the coordinates wherever the mouse is clicked in the form of array now in the next step what we will do is if the mouse is clicked more than two times so we can uh, just test the length of this array which is a uh, point and if the length of this array is greater than or equal to two because the first uh, click will be only a point so we cannot connect this point with a line but when we have uh, two or more points then we can connect uh, those points with a line right so if uh, this points array length is greater than two then we are going to just create a line between those points or the circles in our case so I'm going to just call cv2 dot line method and first uh, uh, argument here will be uh, image the second argument here will be the point one so the coordinate of point one now we want to join the last two points right so we are going to just use uh, this points array and then to get the last value of an array we use minus uh, one here so here as an index we will give minus one which means the last element of an array 
and then we will join the second last element of an array so i'm going to just uh, give uh, this will be points variable not print so let's give uh, the points variable and then we are going to pass the minus 2 here which will be the second last element so last and second last element we want to join and then the next uh, argument will be the color so let's say the color we want here is uh, 255 comma 0 comma 0 and the next uh, point will be the thickness so we will give the thickness of 5 here and then we will show this image using I am show method. This code I have already uh, shown you in the last video, so I will not explain what this code is doing. If you want to know more about this code, you can see the last video. And this time I will use the NumPy zeros array, which will be a black image. So let's run this script and let's see what happens. So I'm running this script and now I click on some position on this image and you can see this red circle is created this circle is created using cv2 dot circle method and because the radius is 3 the circle is very small and because the thickness is minus 1 the circle is filled with the color which you provide here now we have said that if the point is only one then we don't want to create any line if there are points which are two or more then we want to connect those points with the line so let's click here and you can see point one and point two are connected with a line i click here and you can see the last and the second last points are connected with the line that's why we have taken this minus one and minus two argument which means the last element of the array and the second last element of the array so when i click at any point it will be now connected with this blue line so this kind of uh, line drawing you can use in satellite images where you want to connect two points together with the line now let's see the next example which uh, i want to show you so in the next example what i want to do is i want to uh, first of all read an image and then i want to click on any uh, point on the image and then i want to uh, show the color of uh, the point which uh, on which i have clicked using a second window so for this instead of using uh, the numpy array which is the black image i will use uh, the normal image which is the lana.jpg image and now i will uh, just uh, remove this uh, code from here so first of all i want to read the bgr channels so first of all i will uh, just declare these variables first is blue and we have the image and in the last video we have already seen how we can get the bgr channels because we have uh, the x coordinate and the y coordinate and we also know that blue is the first channel so we uh, use the index zero here to get the blue channel from this image at this coordinate which is x and y same we will do for the green channel so green i am uh, g and then x comma y and then the channel index will be one here and then we will uh, just uh, get the red channel from this image and now what we are going to do is we are going to just uh, draw a circle on this point where uh, you will click this mouse uh, down button click event so i'm going to just write cv2 dot uh, circle and now i will uh, not explain uh, the parameters because you might already know what these parameters are in the next line what we are going to do is we are going to create a numpy zeros image and then we will pass our bgr channels which we got from the particular point on an image 
So let's create an image. So I will just say my color image and then we are going to just use np for numpy and then we will uh, just call a zeros method here and it takes uh, three argument in the form of uh, this uh, list which is the size of uh, your image let's say this size will be 512 comma 512 and the channel will be three channels and then the next argument will be the data type so np dot u int 8 so we have a black image using this numpy zeros and now we want to fill this image with the bgr colors which we got from the particular point of the image so in the next line what we are going to do is we are going to just use this uh, variable and then we are going to just write this kind of notation this means we want to fill every channel or every uh, point of uh, this uh, list and then we will uh, just pass our bgr uh, channel values which we got from uh, the image so blue green and then the red channel values we are going to pass so this will uh, give us the bgr channel which will be the color of the point where we have clicked and now we have uh, the new image with the color so we can uh, show this image using a new window with uh, let's say this is uh, the color window okay so this is how you will uh, get the new window with the color on which you have clicked so let's run this code and let's see what happens so i'm going to run this uh, code and you can see uh, this is the image which is the colored image let's see i click on this point and you can see the same color on which i have clicked is opened in the next window let's click here on the hat you can see it's going to give you the same color on which i have clicked let's click on the eyes and you will get the same color on which i have clicked let's see what happens when we just load a black image instead of this colored image so i'm going to just use this uh, numpy zeros uh, image which is the black image and let's run this uh, code and now whenever i click on this every time i click on any point it will be the black color window which will open so this is how uh, you can use some examples to understand how mouse click events can work and you can uh, use them to develop your applications in this video we will see some of the basic and arithmetic operations on images using OpenCV. so let's get started so here i have this code some of uh, this code you already know so you already know how to read the images using i am read method and then show it inside a window using i am show method and destroy all windows using this destroy all windows method but this code in between is little bit new so let me explain line by line what this code does so when you have this image using i am read method or any other method you can use these attributes like shape size and d type to get different uh, uh, values from this image so image dot shape is going to return a tuple which contains the number of rows columns and the number of channels in this image the image dot size will return the total number of pixel which are there inside the image and image dot d type is going to return the data type of the image which you have obtained now here if you want to split your image in three channels then you can use cv2.split method and pass your image as an argument and it's going to give you the bgr channel of your image 
Now, if you have BGR channels and you want to merge those BGR channel into an image, then you can use cv2.merge method and pass these BGR channels in the form of tuple. And it's going to give you the image which you can uh, load using I am show method. So let's run this uh, code and let's see what we are getting using uh, these attributes. So you can see this messy 5.jpg image is loaded. And here you can see first of all the shape of the image. So the shape returns the number of rows, number of columns and the number of channels. So number of rows here is 342, columns are 548 and number of channels are 3 here. The number of uh, pixel which we have calculated using the size is this number which is 562248 and the data type of an image is uint8. So sometimes uh, you need to debug the data type of uh, your image and this uh, attribute will be very useful in those cases when you need to debug if uh, something is correct or wrong. And because we have splitted this method using the split and re-merged these BGR channels using this merge uh, method, so we will at the end get the same image which we have at the beginning here in this code. So there is no change in the code. So once again, let me just load this image. And now let's talk about the ROI of an image. So ROI stands for region of interest. So sometimes you need to work with certain region of the image. So let's say you only want to work with the face here, or you only want to work with this ball, okay? So this is called the region of interest or in short form, it's called ROI. So let's say we want to just work with this ball here. So this will be our region of interest or ROI. And I want to just uh, copy this ball to other place in this picture. So I want to just copy this ball and place it on the other place, let's say somewhere here. Okay, so how we can do this? So I al already have the coordinates of the ball, but uh, you already know how to get the coordinates of uh, some place in the image. We have already discussed this in our previous video. So I'm not going to show you how to op obtain those coordinates, but let's say I have those coordinates of the ball. So I'm going to create a ball variable and we have our image. So we will take our image and there are certain NumPy indexing uh, features which we can use here. So I'm going to just write uh, 280 colon 340, which is going to uh, give you one point on the ball, which uh, is the upper left hand side of this ball and then we will give uh, 330 here colon uh, 390 which is going to give us the bottom right hand uh, corner of this ball okay so now we have uh, this ball so this this indexing is going to copy this ball all the pixels uh, of this ball and then now we have the ball so we can place this ball on any place on this messy image which we are reading. So what we can do is we can once again use IMG and using those uh, NumPy indexing uh, features, we can place this ball at some other place. So let me uh, just give uh, those uh, indexes here. So let me give uh, 273 colon 333. I have already uh, tested this code, so that's why I know exactly where I want to place this ball. But uh, if you uh, are not sure where to place this uh, ball, then uh, you might have to uh, first calculate or know the coordinates where you want to uh, place this ball. And you already know how to find out the coordinates on an image. And uh, you will be able to place uh, uh, that 
ROI or interest of region at some other place. So what I'm uh, doing here is I have just uh, copied the ball and then I am placing the ball on this coordinate. Okay. So I just need to just assign our ball on this coordinate and then this ball will be copied to this index on the image. So let's see what happens when we run the code. So now you can see we have copied this ball and we have placed this ball here on the image. So this is how you work with the ROI or region of interest. Okay. So let me close uh, this uh, window. Now the next thing which I want to show here is how you can add two images. So for that I need uh, one more image. So you can uh, see in my project I have this messy 5.jpg and I have this other image which is opencv-logo.png file which is of the same size as the messy.jpg image. So I'm going to just write I am G2 and then once again CV2 dot I am read method and then I'm going to give the name of this file which is opencv hyphen logo dot png file. Okay, so this is this file. So this file we are reading and then there is a method called add. Okay. So we are going to use this method here. Let's uh, use this method cv2 uh, dot add and this method I'm going to show you what it does in a moment. But this method takes two argument. First is the first numpy array. So let me show you what this method do first of all. So this is the add method inside your cv2 package. You can also see the documentation on the, the opencv.org uh, and what it does is it calculates the pre-element sum of two arrays or an array and a scalar. Okay. So here we can uh, just pass our uh, two arrays which we got from the I am read method and pass here as the first and the second argument. So I am g and I am g two are the one and two parameter and there are some other parameters also like uh, output array, input array mask and int which is the data type which we uh, which are set by default so we are not going to set them. So we are just using cv2.add method on these two images and then I just want to uh, assign the new image which we have added to a new variable let's say this is dst for destination image and then we are going to just show this image using this uh, i am show method okay so we have two images let me show you uh, those images one by one first of all so this is the first image i have and the second image is opencv hyphen logo which is like this one okay so those two images we have and when I run this code after adding those two images using add method, you will see, first of all, you will see this error. And why this error is coming? Because you will see here that the size of those two input is not matching. Okay. So in order to add two images, you need to have the images or the arrays of same size and then only you will be able to add those two images. So let's resize those two images into a size which uh, is uh, common to both of them. So you, what we are going to do next is we are going to resize those images. So once again, I'm going to just use img variable. So what uh, I get after the resizing, I will once again assign to this img variable. And there is a method called cv2 dot resize and this helps us to resize the image. So first of all, we need to give the source which we want to resize and then we are going to give the size which we want to get. 
So the number of columns and number of rows we can give here. Let's say we want to just resize this image to 512.512, which is the number of rows and number of columns, right? Same we will do with the next image. So I am G2 uh, and then once again CV2 dot uh, resize and then the source here will be image 2 and uh, the size which we want here is again uh, 512 comma 512 in the form of tuple. So we have resized this image and this image which are of different sizes to the same size and now let's run the code once again and now you will see that these two images are merged now okay so you will be able to see the hand here and little bit foot and here the ball of uh, uh, this uh, image one which is messy five and then we have uh, the second image which is open cv which is added to the first image so this is how you can add two image using open cv now there is one more method which is called add weighted okay so this add method is going to just add these two images but if you want to add the weight for example you want to give the weight 90 percent to the first image and 10 percent to the second image there is one more method so let's go to the documentation once again and there is this method called add weighted method okay so this add weighted method takes uh, several arguments here you can see first is the source of uh, the first array and second argument is the alpha value alpha is the weight which you want to give to the first image okay the third argument is the source 2 so in our case this will be the image 2 the fourth argument is the beta beta is the weight which you want to give to the second image right so this uh, weight you can can give from uh, 0 to 1 anything and this gamma is the scalar value which you want to provide and this uh, second last uh, parameter is the destination and the last is the d type or the data type here okay so this is the formula which uh, this uh, uh, method is going to use so source multiplied by alpha and source 2 multiplied by beta plus gamma so this is the uh, method which will be used using these arguments or simply you will use this kind of method so source multiplied by alpha plus source 2 multiplied by beta plus gamma which is the scalar you can add to the image okay so let's use this method so i'm going to uh, just copy this method and then comment this and go to the next line and instead of using add i'm going to use the add weighted method okay so the first argument is the source uh, which is the first source which is img in our case second argument is the weight so first this is the, uh, the messy image right so we want to just give uh, the weight here 90 or you can just give 0.9 here and for the second image we want to give the weight uh, 0.1 okay so the, so the sum of uh, this weight and this weight will be 1 and also we are going to give the gamma value here as 0 so we don't want to add any scalar value to uh, this add weighted method so the next uh, value here will be 0 which is the value of gamma and let's run this code and you can see now now we have uh, our messy image which is dominant here because it has the weight 0 0.9 which is 90 percent of uh, the two and the open cv image have the weight 0 0.1 which is 10 percent of the two okay so the open cv image is light and the messy image is a uh, little bit uh, uh, you know dominant here you can uh, just give uh, 0 0.5 and 0 0.5 so the weight of the two images will be the same and now you will see those two images in the same domination okay so 50 50 percent now let's say we want to increase this value of open cv to 0.8 and the messy image uh, weight will be 0.2 then the dominant image here will be open cv and in the background kind of thing you will see this messy image 
So this is how you can add two images with their weight and the scalar. And uh, that's it for this video. So in this video, you have seen some of the basic operations on the images and some of the arithmetic operations on the images which you can do using OpenCV. In this video, we will talk about bitwise operations on images using Python and OpenCV. So bitwise operations can be very useful when working with masks. Masks are binary images that indicates the pixel in which an operation is to be performed. So let's see how we can perform bitwise operations on images. So to start with, I have here one image, which is image underscore one dot PNG file. And let me show you the image also. So this image is half black and half white. Now the second image I'm creating using NumPy. So first of all, I've used np.0s and I'm just creating this image with the same dimension as this image underscore one is having. So 250 comma 500 is the dimension of this image and the number of channels are three. And this code is going to create a black image as you might already know from our previous videos. Now this code is just creating a white rectangle inside the black image which we got from NumPy's zeros array. Okay, so this is the dimension of the rectangle inside your black image and the color of the uh, rectangle will be white because this is 255 comma 255 comma 255 and we are taking thickness as minus one that means your rectangle will be filled with white color now here i'm just uh, showing both the images using i am show method and this code you might already know what this is doing from our previous videos so let me run this code and let's see what happens first of all so when we run this code, you will see first image is this one, which we have created using the NumPy is zero. So this is IMG1 and this is the black image and we are just creating a white rectangle inside this uh, NumPy is zero's image. And this is the second image, which is half black and half white. Now we want to perform some bitwise operations on these two images. So let's see how we can perform these bitwise operations on these two images. So to perform these uh, bitwise operations, we have some methods inside the OpenCV library. So the first method will be bit and. So I'm going to just create a variable called bit and with uh, let's say like this and the method inside open cv is cv2 dot bit wise underscore and so this bitwise underscore and takes several arguments as you might see here the source of the first image the source of the second image and the destination which is none by default and the mask which is also optional. So we are going to just provide our images here. So I'm going to provide the IMG2 here, first of all, as the first argument. And the second image will be IMG1. And once we perform this bitwise and operation on these two images, we are going to show the result in the form of window. So I'm going to create one more window, which is uh, cv2 dot i am show and i'm going to name this window as uh, let's say bit and and the second argument will be our variable bit and which we got from the operation bitwise and on these two images so let's run this code once again and let's see what happens so now as a result we have the third image so let me just open all the images so this is our first image this is the second image 
and the last one is the result which is the bit and operation on these two images so now you might already know how the logical end works but those of you who might not know how the logical end works let me show you the truth table of logical end so this is the truth table of logical end and if the input a and input b b is zero then we get the result zero okay if input a and input b either of them is zero then also we get zeros right the result one we will only get when both the sources are one so a and b are one then only we will get a one in case of and logic so same and logic will uh, work here so this is the zeros array right so we have created this black region from the zeros so here in these images black is performing as zeros and white part is performing as one so when zero and zero the result will be zero right so from this truth table we have seen when the input is zero and zero the result is zero same here we are seeing so when the image is black and black we get the result black when the input is white and black this means zero and one the result will be once again zero using the logical end but when the input will be white and white that means one and one the result will be white that means the one okay so the only reason region white here is the result of this white and this white and the resulting image you can see here and all the other part is uh, black because the end operation on zero and zero is zero and zero and one is also zero so this is how a uh, bitwise end works let's see how bitwise or and other operation works so i'm going to just comment this code and now we are going to just create the bitwise or operation so for that i'm going to just uh, instead of writing bit and i'm going to just write bit or and instead of bitwise and we are going to just write bitwise or here and then we will simply call this uh, image using i am show method so we are just calling here bit or now let's run the code once again and let's see the result so you can see the result here so let's see the truth table so in the logical or if only one input is one then the result will be one so either a or b is one or both are one then the result will be one and if both inputs are zero then the result will be zero so same you will be able to see here so when the first source and the second source is zero the result is zero but when the first source and second source is one or white the result is white when the first source and the second source is uh, zero and one or black or white the result is once again one or white here okay so this is how the logical or works on the image now let's uh, see how uh, the xor operation work on those images so i'm going to once again uh, comment this code and this time i'm going to just perform the xor operation on these two images and now we are going to run this code once again and you will see this kind of uh, result so once again let's see how the xor logic works so when both the inputs are zero or both the inputs are one 
then we will get the zero and if either a or b is one then only we will get the result one so same you will be able to see here so when uh, both uh, first and second source is zero the result is zero when uh, both the first and second source is one you can see here and here the result is once again zero here right but when the input is zero and one result will be one and in this case also the black and white will result in the white image which is the logical xor operation so once again let's uh, close this and now let me show you how the not operation work so i'm going to just comment this code and then i'm going to just use the bitwise not so here bit not let's say we will perform the bit not on the first image and the second image so i'm going to just write uh, bit not on the first image because it only takes one argument bit not is just the opposite of the source so if you get the input zero then the result will be one if you have the input one the result will be zero so the opposite of the input so let's perform this operation on image one and image two and let's comment this code and we are going to just show these two result windows using the i am show method and also i need to change uh, this name otherwise we will face problems and here also i haven't changed the name of uh, these i am show windows so let's uh, change the name of these windows and let's run the code once again and now you will get these results so we will get the first result so the first bit not one is the not of uh, the first image and bit not two is the not operation on the second image so you can see wherever we have white we got black and wherever we have black we got white so just the opposite of the input here also wherever we have the black region we got the white uh, image here and wherever we have the white pixel we got the black pixel so, so this is how bitwise not operation works on the images so these are some of the bitwise operations which you can perform on your images and as i said bitwise operations can be very useful when working with mask which we will see in the later videos in this video we will talk about track bars in opencv now track bars are really useful whenever you want to change some value in your image dynamically at runtime so let's see how we can use track bars in opencv now to start with i have this simple code which you might know what it does so first of all i have imported cv2 as a cv and then i'm creating an image using uh, the numpy zeros array with these dimensions and then i'm creating a named window with the name image so this might seem new to you because i haven't created a named window in the previous video so the named window you can use to create a window with a name and this time we have given the named window name as image now in this while loop we are just using this uh, i am show method to call this window and then loading this image inside this named window now you might already know what this code does it just wait for the key and if the key is escape key then we will break out of this loop and in the last we are just destroying all the windows which we have created now in order to create a tracked bar you just need to use cv and then call a method called create track bar now the first argument here you need to give is the track bar name because you can create multiple track bars in your image window 
that's why you need to provide a name which is unique to this track bar so i'm going to uh, just give the name to my track bar as b because what i want to do is i want to change the bgr values of the image using the track bar so the first track bar will change the b channel values that's why this uh, first argument is uh, the track bar name which is b and the second argument here we will give is the name of the window so that why that is why we have created this named window so that we can provide the name of the window which is image in this case and that is how we know that in which window we need to add the track bar so in the image window which is this one we want to add the b track bar now the third argument here will be the value which is the initial value at which your track bar is set and the next value here will be the count which is the final value you want to set for your track bar now there is this last thing which we want to set here and this is the callback function which will be called whenever your track bar value changes so here for example i'm going to create a callback function called uh, nothing and this callback function definition or signature i'm going to create here so we can uh, just create a callback function with a name nothing and this function can take uh, this value x and this is the value of the current position of your track bar so we will see uh, what it does little bit later and what we are going to do is we are going to just print the value of x so we will know the current position if this track bar is changed so this is the callback function which will be called whenever your track bar value changes same we will do with the other track bar so we will create the three track bars in the same window with the name b and the next track bar name will be uh, the g and the last track bar name will be r okay so this will be capital r so now let's run this code and let's see what happens when we run this code so i'm going to right click and run this uh, script and you can see here inside this named window with the name image we have this black image which we have created using numpy zeros array and now we have three track bars here with bgr names so these track bar values you can change using this uh, scroller and as you can see here let me show you in this terminal whenever you change the value of uh, any uh, bar the corresponding value will be shown here using this callback function and inside this callback function we have the print statement okay so as i said whenever you change this value this callback function is called and it will print the value of the current uh, track bar okay so for this functionality what we want to do is we want to get the current position of the track bar and because we can change the value of bgr channels from 0 to 255 that's why i have uh, given the range between 0 to 255 to the track bars also so that you can change these bgr channel values so now in order to get the current value of uh, your track bar first of all we will uh, just check the value of uh, the b track bar so we will uh, just use cv dot get track bar position which is this method get track bar pos and then we just need to give the name of our track bar so let's say we want to check the position of uh, track bar b then we will just say we want to have uh, this track bar position uh, with the name b and the second argument here will be the name of your window so in which window this uh, 
track bar is present so the our track bar is present inside the image window right so same we will do for the g and r values also now we have the values of b g r channels from the track bar so now we want to set these values to our image so what we can do here is we can just write uh, for example i am g inside these square brackets you can just uh, give this kind of notation and then give the bgr channel values so i'm going to just write b comma g comma r that means we want to set the current b g r values to this image so let's run this code and let's see what happens now so i'm going to run this code and now when i change the blue channel values you can see this image becomes blue uh, colored right let's bring it to zero once again and now let's change the value of uh, g so you can see this image color is changing to uh, green and then we can try changing the red color and you can see when it goes to 255 the color of the image is red you can uh, change the values uh, of different track bars and the corresponding color will be displayed in this uh, window here right so you can see the color is changing you can change any track bar here one more example i want to give here is how to add a switch using a track bar so for that i'm going to use one variable called uh, switch and then here i can uh, add first of all the name of the switch and in the next line we will once again call cv2 dot create track bar with the name switch okay so now the name of our track bar will be switch So now we have added one more track bar to our named window and now here we will get the current position of this uh, switch track bar so i'm going to name it as s and the name of the window is switch so we will just give the first argument of this get track bar position as switch okay and uh, the window name is image itself so now we can add some condition here so let's say if this position of the switch which we have if this position is equal to zero because we only have zero and one in this last track bar so if this position is equal to zero what we want to do is we want to set i am g and then uh, in the square bracket this colon and we don't want to change any value so we will say that i am g uh, this square bracket colon is equal to zero which means that we don't want to do anything or in the other condition which is when your uh, track bar is at position bar one then only we want to change the bgr channel of the image okay so let's uh, run this code and let's see what happens so i'm going to run this code and now you can see uh, the position of uh, this track bar switch is zero and when i change it to one so let's change this position to one you can see the value to one and when this position is at zero you can change anything here any track bar nothing happens because this condition is met which means that we don't want to do anything as soon as we change the switch to one that means we want to change the bgr values you can see this color is changed inside the image so the zero is just like off switch so we don't want to change any color and one is like on switch so when it's one 
the value of RBG channels can be changed. Now I want to give one more example of trackbar to you. So that's why I have created one more uh, file which is py Python OpenCV trackbar example 2. And this time I'm going to use uh, just two trackbars here. So that's why I'm going to delete some of the code here. So using the first trackbar, let's say I want to just change some values inside our image and I want to print that value on that image. So let's say now our uh, range is between 10 to 400. Okay, so the lower range is 10 and the upper range is 400. And using this trackbar, I want to print the current value on our image. And also I want to have a switch which I can toggle and I want to change the color of the image from uh, the colored value or colored image to the grayscale image. So now our switch is between color to the grayscale image. Now in here what we want to do is we want to just assign this I am show value to the image variable itself. And then we want to get the current position of the trackbar. So we will use this method to get the current position of the trackbar. And I'm going to name this current position as POS variable. And the name of this trackbar, let's change this name to something else. Let's say CP for current position. And also here CP for the current position. And the name of the named window is image itself so we are not changing uh, it so now we have the current position so first of all we will uh, just create the font and then we will just use the cv dot put text method you already know what this uh, method does it just print the text on your image and then we will provide the parameters first argument is the image the second argument is the value which we get from the trackbar so this is the position and because it's a number we need to convert it to the string using str method and then the position at which you want to show this uh, text so let's say it's 50 comma 150 and then next is the font so I'm going to just give the font and then the next value is the font scale which is 4 and the next value is for the color of the text so let's say the color here will be 0 comma 0 comma 255 and this should be CV dot font Hershey complex let's change this font also let's say this is just the simplex font okay so this code is going to just print the color current position of the trackbar on your image and then inside this condition what we want to do is we want to get the switch value so let's uh, use this s variable and then get the current position of the switch using uh, this switch name from the image window and then if the switch is at zero position then we want to do nothing so we will just pass this situation and in case the value of uh, this switch is one then what we want to do is we want to change the image value from color to the grayscale value right so we can just write uh, cv dot uh, cvt color and the first argument is the image which we are loading and the second argument is cv dot color bgr to gray which is to convert this colored image to grayscale image but you can see here we are just creating a black colored image and in our project we also have this image so let's uh, read this image so i'm going to just write uh, cv dot i am read and then give uh, the name of the image which is lena.jpg so this is our uh, colored image and this way we will be able to see uh, the change of uh, color to gray scale image in a better way so let's run this code and let's see what happens and uh, you can see image appears and disappears and there is an error so let's see what is the error 
So the error here is coming from uh, this line. So we need to uh, read this image inside the while loop. Okay. So this is why our error is coming. And at the last, we want to load this image after this if condition. Okay. So now let's run this code once again. And you can see this value is printed on our image, which is 10, which is the value of CP. And if we change this value, it is changing on our image also, right? And once we change this uh, 0 to 1, then our image is converted from colored image to the grayscale image. You can uh, also change the font size here, for example. Let's say it's 6 here. And the thickness also, if you want to change, you can change it using this parameter. Let's say it's uh, 10. And let's run this code once again. You can see the thickness and the size of the font is changed. And you can see this uh, value in a better way. Okay. So this is how you can use track bars in OpenCV. In this video, we will see how we can perform object detection using HSV color space. Now we have already seen how to work with BGR or colored images or grayscale images. And we have already seen how we can convert from uh, colored images to grayscale images. So there are more than 150 color space conversion methods in OpenCV. And one of them is colored image to HSV image. Now, what is HSV color space? So HSV stands for hue saturation value. So H stands for hue, S for saturation, and V for the value. Now, generally, RGB in RGB color space are all correlated to the color luminance. That is what we loosely call intensity. In other words, we cannot separate color information from luminance. So HSV or hue saturation value is used to separate image luminance from color information. So this makes it easier when we are working on or we need luminance in our images. That is why generally we use HSV in the situation where color description plays a very important role. Now, as I said, HSV stands for hue, saturation and value. But what is the meaning of each and every single word in HSV? Now, HSV is also known as the hexcon color model. So this color space can be described in this kind of cylindrical cone model where hue is this circular angle which varies from 0 to 360 and hence just by selecting the range of hue you can select any color so you can see different colors are available at different angles so these colors are basically red yellow green cyan blue and magenta so hue is this angle in this cylindrical cone. Now we have saturation. So the saturation is amount of color, that is the depth of pigment or the dominance of hue. And this value is described from the center towards the outer layer of this cylindrical cone. So you, here you can see at the center, this saturation start at 0 and it can go up to 1 at the end of this cylindrical cone. And this saturation can be increased from 0 to 100 percent. Similarly, the value is basically the brightness of the color. So this brightness can be increased from 0 to 1 from the bottom of the cone to the top of the cone. So all these three value hue, saturation and value can be used to pick any color as we can do with the BGR color space. So this is the brief introduction about HSV color space. 
and now let's see how we can use this HSV color space to detect an object in an image. So here I have this simple code to load an image using I am read method and show it inside a window. So by now you might already know how this code works. So let's run this uh, code and let's see what does this code do. So I have this uh, image which is called smarties.png and here are some circles in different colors. So we have blue circles or green or red, orange and brown circles here inside this image. So let's say we somehow want to detect only the blue circles or balls or green circles or balls. How can we uh, just detect only uh, these balls? Let's say we just want to detect the green balls. How can we achieve this using OpenCV? We are going to see this using this HSV object detection. And here we have one more window which is the tracking window which is coming from this code which is cv2 dot named window and the name of the window is tracking so this tracking window we are going to use little bit later when we will uh, add the track bars to our image but let's say we want to uh, use this image and detect these colored balls so first of all, uh, after this image is read, what we want to do is we want to convert our colored image into our HSV image. And by now, you might already guess how to convert an image. You can just write HSV is equal to CV2 dot CVT color and then your uh, frame name, which is frame in this case, and then CV2 dot whatever color space uh, you want to convert from and whatever color space you want to convert to. So you can just write color underscore BGR to HSV. So this is the property we are going to use. Now in the next step, we will threshold the HSV image for a range of blue color. So we are going to just define L underscore B for lower blue color. And then we are going to use uh, the NumPy array so np dot array and inside this array we are going to define the lower range of blue color now by experience i know that these hsv value for lower blue color will be 110 comma 50 comma 50 right but you might not have uh, every time the idea what is the lower color range or the upper color range of uh, some color so that is why later in this video, we will use the track bar in order to perfectly uh, define the lower and upper values for uh, this HSV color space, right? So right now I'm just uh, going with my experience. So for the upper value, I'm going to define the next variable, which is UB is equal to NP dot array. And then once again, I'm going to define uh, these uh, three uh, color channels which is 130 comma 255 comma 255 so, so this will be the upper limit for the blue color for our hsv image now in the next step what we are going to do is we are going to threshold the hsv image to get only the blue color let's say so i'm going to just define a variable called uh, mask here and then i'm going to use cv2 dot in range method where i will provide first of all my hsv uh, variable or image and then i will provide the upper and lower range for uh, this function so uh, my lower range is uh, this numpy array for uh, the blue color so i'm going to just say l underscore b is my lower range and u underscore b is my upper range now we have already seen how we can use bitwise and or bitwise operations on images. So what we are going to do next is we are going to define a variable called res and then we will just call cv2 dot bitwise and to mask the original image. So here the first value will be our frame which which is the colored frame right. So this is the uh, frame which we have read 
from this image which is the smarties image so this is the source one source two will be the same uh, so the frame itself will be the source two and what we want to do is we want to uh, provide the mask of the lower blue color and the upper blue color values right so here we can uh, just say mask is equal to whatever mask variable we have uh, created so this is the attribute we can set in order to apply the mask for the lower blue value and the upper blue values so once we have uh, this uh, result uh, frame what we can do is we can uh, use this uh, cv2 dot im show method in order to show the mask let's say so we are going to show the mask and we are going to show the result using res variable so this is going to open three windows and let's see what happens when we run this code so we are going to run this code and this opens three windows here and now you can see the mask first of all so we are just detecting the blue colored uh, balls using this mask that's why we have defined the lower boundation of the blue color and the upper boundation of the blue color right so that's why it's only detecting you can see the blue uh, ball is here here and here and uh, here also you can see the mask also detects only the blue values here right and then in the result you can see when we have applied this mask and we have masked all the other things other than the blue colored ball you can see only the blue balls here so the same method you can apply to detect any other colored ball from this image now as i said it's not easy to detect uh, these uh, lower and upper boundation for uh, the colors so that's why you can use the track bar for uh, adjusting these lower and upper boundation of any color so for that what we are going to do is first of all we will create a named window and then we are going to create a new window which we will use to adjust the lower and upper boundation of hsv values so now i'm going to just use uh, cv2 dot we have already seen how to uh, create a track bar so i'm not going to explain in detail how this works but let's say uh, this uh, track bar name is lower hue for lh okay so this is the lower hue value and then the name of the window which is uh, tracking which is this one so we are going to provide the name of the window and the next argument will be the starting and the ending value so we are going to define the start value 0 and the end value let's say we are going to define the 255 here okay and the last thing we want to give here is the callback function which i have already created which is this uh, function which is uh, just no doing nothing we are going to just uh, provide this callback function as a dummy function so it's not going to uh, do anything so this is the track bar for the lower hue value similarly we are going to define the track bar for lower saturation and lower uh, value and upper saturation upper value and upper hue okay so this will be lower saturation this will be lower value and then this will be u h which is upper hue and then this will be u s for upper saturation value and this will be upper value right so hsv uh, lower values and hsv upper values so here we are going to set the initial value for the upper value so let's say everything is set to the maximum so 255 255 and 255 here okay so the lower values are set to zeros and upper values will be set to uh, 255 now you already know how to get the values from a tag track bar so you can use for example l underscore h for the lower q values is equal to cv2 dot get track bar position so just use 
get trackbar position method and then first of all uh, give the name of the trackbar from which you want to get the position so let's say we want to get the position from uh, the lh trackbar and then the name of the window which is tracking in our case so here is the second argument and similarly what we are going to do is we are going to define the other uh, uh, lower values and upper values so and also the name of uh, your track bars So once you have the values of lower HSV and upper HSV, you can provide these values here in place of uh, these uh, static values. So first uh, element of this array will be LH and then the LS variable and then the LV variable. Similarly, for the upper boundation, we will uh, provide these three upper boundation variables. And now when we will run our code, let's see what happens. So we are running our code and you can see these uh, windows, these three windows. One is the mask, other is the result and the third one is the frame. And we also have these track bars in order to change the value of lower and upper HSV values. So first of all, let's set this mask for uh, the blue color. So I'm going to just move it to 110 as we have done in the last uh, step. And then this will be around 50. And this also will be around 50. Okay, so let's move it to 50. And upper value here will be around 130, right? So you can see once again, Using this track bar, it's easier to adjust these lower and upper boundation. And now you can see all the three uh, blue colored balls. So you can refine uh, this object detection by moving uh, these track bars little bit uh, left or little bit right. You can see here. Now let's uh, adjust this value to detect some other uh, balls. So let's say we want to detect the green balls. So let's see what happens when we just uh, change the saturation values here and you can see now you almost see the green values and uh, the blue color is almost uh, disappearing so you can see now there are only green uh, uh, balls which are detected and all the other uh, balls are masked so you just need to play with this track bar for the lower uh, HSV values and the upper HSV values and you will be able to detect the object whatever colored object you want to detect from the image. Now this is the object detection from the image. Similarly we can use the same method in order to track an object from a live video. So I'm going to just uh, escape to just close all the windows. And in order to change this code for uh, the video input, what we can do here is we can just add uh, this code. So, so we are going to just uh, add the cap variable, which is the capture variable is equal to cv2 dot video capture. So we are going to use this one and we are going to uh, capture the video from our default camera, which is at uh, the index zero. And then you already know how we can read the values from the camera input. So I'm going to just uh, comment this code. And instead of reading the image, what we are going to do is we are going to write underscore comma frame is equal to cap dot read, which is going to read the frames from your default camera and at the end when you are done playing with your images you can just destroy this uh, cap using the release method so you can just write cap dot release which is going to release all the cameras you are uh, just capturing right so now this is the three line code you need to, to use in order to capture the camera input and then uh, track any uh, uh, object 
of any color. So I'm going to run this uh, code now and you can see I'm just uh, holding a blue colored uh, object here and I'm moving this object on the left and right and you can see only blue colored object is detected and every other uh, frame value is masked. So this is how you can do the object tracking of any color using the HSV color space. So you can see the uh, real image which is captured from the camera and then the mask and then the result of the mask and the real image in this blue colored object tracking. So this is how you can do object detection and object tracking using HSV color space. In this video, we will see how we can perform simple thresholding on images using OpenCV. So first of all, what is thresholding? So thresholding is a very popular segmentation technique used for separating an object from its background. The process of thresholding involves comparing each pixel of an image with a predefined threshold value. And this type of comparison of each pixel of an image to a threshold value divides all the pixels of the input image into two groups. So the first group involves pixels having intensity value lower than the threshold value and the second group involves the pixels having intensity value greater than the threshold value and using the different thresholding techniques which are available in OpenCV we can uh, give different values to these pixels which are higher than the threshold value and which have the intensity lower than the threshold value. So let's see how we can use simple thresholding techniques on an image. So to start with, I have the simple code which loads an image on a window and this image is called gradient.png. So let me show you how this image looks like. So this image looks like this. So as you can see in this image, we have on the left hand side the black values and when we gradually move from left to right, we move towards the white value. So on the left hand side, the pixel value are closer to zero and on the right hand side, the pixel values are closer to 255. So now we are going to uh, just involve some thresholding techniques and we will see how these, uh, this image is affected by the thresholding techniques. So first of all, what we are going to do is we are going to uh, define two variables. One is underscore because uh, the result of the thresholding gives two result. One is RET value and the second is the thresholded value of an image. So I'm going to just say the second value which is given by the thresholding technique is th1 is equal to cv dot threshold and this threshold method takes several values the first is the source so our source is image the second is the threshold value so as we have seen that our image have on the left hand side zero pixel value and when we uh, move towards the right its uh, pixel value uh, increases to 255 right so let's say our threshold here is 127 and the maximum value of the threshold is 255 which is the white color on the right hand side and then the fourth value here will be the threshold type so there are several threshold type in simple thresholding. We are going to see them one by one. So the first thresholding type is CV2 dot thrash binary. So first of all, let me show you how the result looks like. And then I will explain what does this thrash binary type does. 
So what we are going to do is we are going to use one more cv2.im show method to show this thresholded value into a new window. So we are going to just show this uh, value into a new window and we already have uh, the original image in the image window. So let's run this code and let's see what happens. So you can see in this binary thresholding, we are comparing each and every pixel of this original image to 127. And if the value of the pixel is less than 127, the value is assigned to zero. And if the value of the pixel is greater than 127, the pixel value is assigned to 55, that means white. So if the value of the pixel is zero, it will look black. And if the value of the pixel is 255, it will look white. So this is how binary thresholding works. And by the name itself, uh, you can uh, understand that this is just a binary uh, thresholding. So it's either zero or one. Now let's see the other type of thresholding technique. So now I will uh, just change the name of this variable as th2. And the next type of uh, thresholding is called thresholding binary inverse. And as the name suggests, the thresholding binary inverse is going to give the inverse result of what you get from the trash binary. So I'm going to once again use the I am show method to show the result of this thresholding binary inverse value. And let's run the code and let's see what happens. So this is the original image. And then we have the thresholding one image and the thresholding uh, inverse image. So this image you got from the first thresholding, which is by using trash binary. And the second image you got from uh, this method, which is trash binary inverse. And this trash binary inverse image is just the inverse of what you get using the trash binary. So if the pixel value is lower than 127, which is our threshold, the pixel is assigned 255. Otherwise, if the value is greater than 127, then the pixel value is assigned zero, which is the inverse of what we got in the previous step. Now let's change this threshold to let's say 50. And here also, let's say we change this threshold to 200 and let's see how this result changes when we change the threshold value. So I'm going to run this code once again and you can see this is the result of thresh binary and now because our threshold is up to 50 that's why our result is like this. So until the pixel value is 50 it's black Otherwise, if the pixel value is greater than 50, it's going to give you the white uh, pixel value. And the trash binary inverse is going to give you the inverse value of what you get in the trash binary uh, step. So I'm going to once again uh, just close these windows and let's see the next uh, thresholding type. So I'm going to name my variable as uh, th3. So the next thresholding type is called trash trunk. So this is this type. And let's first of all uh, see what is the result of uh, this thresholding uh, technique. And then I'm going to explain what it does. So we are going to just show this uh, thresholded image into a new window and run the code and now we have the result so let's move it like this and we have here the original image and the result of the thresh trunk is this th3 so here what happens is up to the threshold the value of the pixels will not be changed so up to 200 because our threshold is up to 200 so 
when the pixel value is up to 200 the pixel value will not change and after the threshold which is 200 the pixel value will remain the same which is 200 so from uh, here to here the pixel value will remain 200 let's change this threshold to some other value let's say 127 and then let's uh, run this code and you will see that now from black to 127 pixel value the value of this image will not change so original image up to half is the same and after the pixel value 127 the value remains 127 okay so the pixel intensity value will remain 127 until the end so if the value is uh, greater than 127 the value will remain 127 and if the pixel value is lesser than 127 then the pixel value will remain unchanged so this is how the trash trunk works and let's see the other method which is let's say th4 and this is the method which is called trash20 so we are going to just use trash20 and then we are going to open this th4 into a new window and let's run this code and let's see what happens so now we have uh, this result let's move this to the left and the result of the thresh to zero is this one so in thresh to zero thresholding whenever your pixel value is lesser than threshold the value assigned to pixel will be zero okay so when the pixel value is lesser than the threshold the pixel value is assigned to zero that's why you can see half of the image is black and when the pixel value is greater than 127 which is our threshold value the image or pixel value will remain the same so after 127 all the pixels will remain the same let's see the other technique which is called trash to zero inverse which you uh, already understood i think what it does so this is trash to zero inverse and uh, we can just change this variable name to th5 and here we can just open it into a new window and i'm going to run this uh, code once again let me move this here and the result here so you can see this thresh to zero inverse is just the opposite of the thresh to zero so if the value of the pixel is greater than the threshold value which is 127 the value will be assigned to zero otherwise if the value of the pixel is lesser than threshold the value of the pixel will remain the same so this is how some of the simple thresholding techniques works in OpenCV. In the last video, we have seen how we can perform simple thresholding in OpenCV using Python using various thresholding techniques. So we have used thresh binary, thresh binary inverse, thresh trunk, thresh to zero, thresh to zero inverse. So these were all the simple thresholding techniques. Now in these thresholding techniques, we were setting a global value of our threshold. So in this example, for example, here the global value of threshold is 50, here 200, here 127. So we were setting in simple thresholding the global value and this means that it is same for all the pixels in the image. Now, in this video, we are going to learn how to use adoptive thresholding. So, adoptive thresholding is the method where the threshold value is calculated for the smaller region. So, the threshold is not global for every pixel, but it's calculated for a smaller region and therefore, there will be different threshold value for different regions. 
Now, why do we need this type of adoptive thresholding? So using simple thresholding might not be a good idea in all the conditions. So there might be conditions where the image has different lighting conditions in different regions and in those cases where the lighting conditions in the images varies from point to point in those cases we might want to use adoptive thresholding so as i said adoptive thresholding calculates the threshold for a smaller region of images so we get different thresholding values for different regions of the same image and as a result adoptive thresholding gives us better results for images with varying illumination so let me show you the problem with simple thresholding for the image which have different illumination at different regions so i have this image called sudoku.png which i'm loading using i'm read method and then i'm just showing uh, this image using i'm show method and then let's use the simple thresholding technique which is trash binary for this and we have set the global threshold value of 127 here and then we will see the result after this threshold is applied to the image so i'm going to run this program and let's see what happens so this is our original image and then this is the result which we got so on in the result you can see when we apply a same global threshold value some of the region of this image is black and other region of this image is visible right so because the image have different illumination value at different regions that's why we see half of the image which have the good illumination and we don't see half of the image which doesn't have the better illumination so in that case, it's a better idea to use adoptive thresholding. So let's see how we can use adoptive thresholding. So here what I'm going to do is I'm going to declare a variable called th2 and then we use cv.adoptive threshold. So this is the method which we are going to use for performing adoptive thresholding and this takes few arguments. So first is the source. So our source is the image variable now the second parameter here is the max value so the max value is the non zero value assigned to the pixels for which the condition is satisfied so in our case the maximum value which we can provide to a pixel is 255 and we cannot go more than that right now the third parameter here is the adoptive method so this adoptive method is going to decide how the thresholding value is calculated and there are two types of adoptive methods which we can use so the first method is called cv2 dot adoptive thresh mean c so what is the meaning of this adoptive thresh mean underscore c so using this method the threshold value is the mean of the neighborhood area and here is the documentation of uh, these two methods so adoptive thresh mean c gives us the threshold value using this function and this is going to give us the mean of the block size multiplied by block size neighborhood of x comma y minus c which is the constant and the second adoptive threshold type is this one which is adoptive trash gaussian underscore uh, c and in this adoptive thresholding the threshold value is the weighted sum of neighborhood values where weights are the gaussian window so let's use the first adoptive method which is the adoptive thresh mean underscore c now the next parameter here is the threshold type so the threshold type which we are going to use is the trash binary which we have also seen in the last uh, video also and then the next value is the block size so block size decides the size of the neighborhood area 
So here we are going to give the block size 11 and the next parameter here is the value of C. So we have seen that we need to uh, give the value of uh, C also when we use the adoptive thresh mean C and adoptive thresh Gaussian C. So this is the value of C which we are going to give and C is just a constant which is subtracted from the mean in the case of uh, this adoptive thresh mean method or the weighted mean in the case of Gaussian adoptive threshold. Okay, So constant we are going to give here is 2 and now what we are going to do is we are going to just uh, load this image which we got after applying this adoptive thresholding. And let us uh, just comment the other window. So we will just see the original image and the adoptive thresholding result. So I am going to run this code and you can see the original image here and the result of adoptive thresholding which looks much better than the simple thresholding technique. So let us uncomment uh, this also. So I am going to uncomment uh, this. So we will see all the three results at the same time. So this is the original image and you can see the simple thresholding gives us this uh, value using the global threshold of 127 and adoptive thresholding gives us this value or this image which is much more readable than the simple thresholding technique image. So this is how you can use adoptive thresh mean C method. In the same way we are going to use the other adoptive thresholding technique which is called adoptive thresh Gaussian C. So instead of uh, this we are going to use adoptive thresh Gaussian C and then all the parameters we are going to leave as same and let us load the result of uh, this type of thresholding which is stored in th3. So let us run this code and let us see what happens. So we have already seen uh, this image which is uh, the simple thresholding. This is the result of the adoptive thresholding mean c and this is the result of adoptive thresholding Gaussian underscore C. So both of the result looks good because the adoptive thresholding algorithm calculates the thresholding value for different regions. So the thresholding value is not global for each and every pixel of the image. And we have seen uh, the two adoptive methods which are available in adoptive thresholding. So in this way you can use adoptive thresholding in OpenCV. In this video we will talk about a library called matplotlib which you can use with OpenCV images. So first of all what is matplotlib? So matplotlib is a plotting library for python which gives you a wide variety of plotting methods. And on the official website which is matplotlib.org you can see matplotlib is a python 2d plotting library which produces publication quality figures. So it's primarily a 2d plotting library but it's widely used with OpenCV to display graphs and images and histograms. So we will see how we can use matplotlib with OpenCV. It's also written here that for simple plotting the PyPlot module provides a MATLAB-like interface. So first of all, let's see how we can install matplotlib and then we are going to see how to use matplotlib with OpenCV. So to install matplotlib using pip, you just need to open your terminal and then just give this command which is pip install matplotlib and then press enter and in some seconds this matplotlib library will be installed using pip. So now you can see matplotlib is installed on my windows operating system and to check it I am going to just give the python command and here I am going to import matplotlib. So I am going to just write from 
mat plot lib import pi plot as plt okay and then press enter and if this import doesn't give you any error that means it's imported successfully and you can start using matplotlib now as we are using pycharm ide let me show you how you can install matplotlib on pycharm so just open your pycharm ide and then here just click on file and then settings and then go to project colon your project name my project name is opencv examples and then click on interpreter and you can see other uh, packages are already there and we just need to install the matplotlib package so just type here in the search matplotlib and you will be able to find matplotlib here in the results so just uh, click on matplotlib and then just click on the install package so i'm going to just click on the install package and in some seconds matplotlib library will be installed in your pycharm ide so you can see this message which says package matplotlib installed successfully that means we can close uh, this uh, window and then you will be able to see matplotlib is available in your project interpreter so everything is fine and i'm going to just close this and now i will be able to import matplotlib so i'm going to just write from mat plot lib import pi plot as plt now in order to show the image which you read using the opencv i'm read method you can use uh, this uh, code so just write plt dot i am show so there is also a method inside your pyplot uh, library which is available inside matplotlib and this method you can use to uh, show the image which you have read from the opencv i am read method so for now just write this kind of code and to show the matplotlib window you just need to write plt dot show so this is going to show this image using the matplotlib library so we are opening this image using the opencv i'm show window as well as matplotlib window also so let's run this code and let's see what's the result which we are getting so you can see this is the image which is loaded using the matplotlib and this was our original image which is loaded using the opencv library and straight away you can see some difference so this is the original image which is the colored image and in the matplotlib uh, window we also want the same result but it's giving us the different result and the reason behind this is opencv reads the image in the bgr format and the matplotlib reads the image in the rbg format so in order to show this kind of colored window using matplotlib you need to convert your image from bgr to rbg and then only you will be able to see this kind of colored image using matplotlib so i'm going to just uh, close these windows and now after i'm showing this image using the cv2 i'm show method i'm going to convert this image so i'm going to just write img is equal to cv2 dot cvt color and then i'm going to convert this image from bgr image so i'm going to just write cv2 dot color underscore bgr to rgb okay so our matplotlib library shows the image in the rgb format and uh, the opencv reads the image in bgr format so now we have converted our image from bgr to rgb image and now we are showing this image using the matplotlib and let's run this code and let's see what happens now so now when we run this code you see both the image looks the same right 
Now let's see the advantages of using matplotlib. So you can see this is a quite static uh, window, but when you see in matplotlib, when you hover over this image, you can see X and Y coordinates of uh, the mouse point and this is helpful. You can also save this image in the form of a PNG file. So you can just press this and save this image wherever you want. You can also zoom this image if uh, this feature is available. There is also configuration subplots options. So you can, uh, you can just increase uh, these values left, bottom, wherever you want to uh, place your uh, image, you can uh, do that. These are some options which are available here. You can also reset these options and you can see uh, the coordinates here. So because matplotlib is primarily a 2D plotting library, so you can see the X coordinates and Y coordinates. And because this image is about 512 by 512 uh, pixels, that's why here it's showing 0 to 512 and here also on the Y axis, 0 to 512. So this is how you can load your uh, image using matplotlib. And now I'm going to show you one more thing. And this is when you write plt.x ticks here. And then when you pass empty array here, which is empty square bracket, comma plt.y ticks. And also here you pass uh, empty array. This is going to hide the tick value on X and Y axis. So now when I run this uh, code and you can see now that these X ticks and Y ticks on X and Y axis are gone. So let me just uh, comment this out once again and you will be able to see this X and Y coordinates here on the image. And when you use this uh, code, which is to hide the ticks on the X and Y axis, then you will see the image without these uh, X and Y axis ticks. So if you remember in the last video, we have seen how to uh, use simple thresholding in OpenCV. And we were using six windows to show these six different images using OpenCV. Now let's say you want to show all these six uh, windows in one matplotlib window, how you can do it with the use of uh, matplotlib, I'm going to show you. So first of all, we are going to import matplotlib, uh, import pyplot as plt. And then what we are going to do is we are going to define the titles and then we are going to define these six different uh, titles for six different images. So first one is our original image, second was uh, the trash binary, third was trash binary inverse, fourth was trunk, fifth was 20 and sixth was 20 inverse. In the same way we are going to define a variable called images and inside this square bracket we are going to pass first of all our original image and then uh, th1 comma th2 comma th3 comma th4 comma th5 okay so these are the six value we want to show and these are the six titles of these uh, uh, images and now we are going to use the for loop so for i in x range so using the python x range we are going to just iterate over these six values so i'm going to just write x range and then the range we are going to provide here is six and then inside this for loop we are going to just call plt and we are going to call a method called subplot okay and this subplot method takes few arguments so first argument is the number of rows which we want to show in our matplotlib plot. So because we have six images, so we are going to divide these images into two rows and three columns. So the first argument here is the number of rows and the second argument here is the number of 
uh, columns and the third argument here will be the index of the image so the index of the image will be i plus uh, 1 and then we are going to write comma plt dot i am show so this is going to show this image and the index of the image so we are going to just write uh, images and then square bracket i so this is going to give you a particular image at index i and then we want to show this image as a grayscale image so anyway when you use thresholding you use the grayscale image so you just need to write uh, gray here then we are going to show the titles of these images so we are going to just write plt dot uh, title and then this title method takes uh, the title name which we are getting using this titles array and then at the index i this is going to give you uh, the title name which we have declared in this title array and at last if you don't want to show the ticks on the images you can give uh, these two method which is plt dot x ticks uh, and the argument here is the empty list and also plt dot y ticks and the argument is the empty list and at the end what we want to do is instead of uh, using this kind of code we just want to show our uh, window so we can just say plt dot show and this is showing us uh, this error unresolved uh, reference yes so this is when you are using uh, python 2 but in python 3 this x range is changed to a method called range and that's why it was giving us the error so let's run this uh, script once again and you can see six different results and six different titles so these are all the titles which are shown here and then the result are shown under these titles so using matplotlib you can include multiple images into one window and this is very useful when you want to show multiple image at the same time in the same window so this is how you can use matplotlib library with OpenCV images and there is a lot of things which you can do with matplotlib so if you want to learn more you can just go to the official website which is matplotlib.org and then uh, you will be able to see more uh, documentation here in this video we are going to discuss about morphological transformations in OpenCV so we will discuss different morphological operations like erosion, dilation, opening and closing methods etc. But first of all what are morphological transformations? So morphological transformations are some simple operations based on the image shape. Now morphological transformation is normally performed on a binary image and when we perform morphological transformation there are two things which are required first is the original image and second is called a structuring element or a kernel which decides the nature of the operation now there are different type of morphological transformations and we are going to see them one by one now to start with I have this simple code which reads the image using OpenCV IM read method and we are just loading or showing this image using matplotlib. Now if you are unfamiliar with matplotlib and how to use matplotlib to show images in the last video I have explained this topic in details so if you uh, want to see that video about matplotlib you can see it and this is the code I have used in the last video also and, and I have explained this code in details in the last video so if you are confused what this code is doing just see the last video now there is one important thing to notice here is I am reading this image in a grayscale mode okay so either you can uh, provide here as the second argument of i am read cv2 dot i am read underscore 
grayscale or you can provide simply zero here in order to read this image in grayscale. So let's run this code and let's see what it does. So as expected, it's just opening the image in the grayscale mode using matplotlib. Now, as I said, normally we perform the morphological transformations on the binary images. So that's why we need to provide a mask to our image using the simple thresholding. So let's just do that. So I'm going to uh, just write underscore comma the mask. So I'm going to name my uh, variable as mask here. And then I'm going to just write cv2 dot threshold. And this threshold take few argument as you might already guess. First is the image itself. Second argument is the value of the threshold. So for uh, now, I'm going to just provide the threshold of uh, 220 here. The maximum value of threshold will be 255. Then uh, the next argument here is the type of the threshold. So we are going to provide CV2 dot thrash binary inverse. So this is our mask. So let's load the mask in the matplotlib uh, uh, window. So I'm going to just provide in this titles array one more uh, title, which is mask. And then we are going to see how this image looks like after the mask, okay? And here the range, I'm going to increase it to two because now the array is of two elements. And the subplot is also, let's say one by two. So we want to show two images and I'm going to just run this code and you can see this was uh, the image which was the grayscale image and the second image is the masked image. Now if you see this image carefully let me just uh, just increase the size of this image and if you see this image carefully after masking there are some black dots here on the balls. And let's say we want to remove these dots which are there in between this uh, white area, this black dot or this black dot, or you can see some black dots are there inside your uh, ball in the white area. And we want to remove uh, these dots from uh, the balls. For this, we are going to use the dilation transformation. So first of all, what we are going to do is we are going to just write uh, dilation, which will be our variable name. And then we are going to use this method called cv2.dilate, okay? So this method uses the source, which is mask in our case. And then the second thing is the kernel. Okay, so let me uh, explain what the kernel is. So a kernel is normally a square or uh, some shape which we want to apply on the image. So we are going to define a kernel of numpy once, which means we want to apply white uh, square on our balls. So you can see when we run our code once again, it shows us error because this kernel uh, is undefined. So let me define this uh, kernel first of all. So I'm going to just say kernel is equal to np dot once, and then we are going to define the shape of uh, this kernel. Let's say this is of two comma two size, and then we will just say np dot u int 8. So this is our kernel and kernel in this case is nothing but a 2 by 2 square shape. And this square shape kernel is going to be applied on our image wherever these black dots are there. So now we have defined this kernel. So let's see after this kernel is applied on our masked image how it looks like. So I'm going to just add one more title here, which is dilation. 
and then uh, I'm going to add uh, the image after the dilation is applied on our image and then we are uh, just going to increase the range to 3 because now we have 3 images and let's say this plot contains images 1 by 3 so 1 row and 3 columns right so I'm going to just uh, run this code once again and now you can see all these 3 images first was the original image second is the masked image and the third one is the image which we got after we applied the dilation. Let me just in increase the size of uh, this image somehow. So now you can see that for example here there was a black dot and now it's reduced right the size of this black dot is reduced. Here also there was a black dot but its size also is reduced but still we can see these black dots here, right? So how we can uh, remove these black dots completely? So there is a third parameter which we can provide to this dilate method and it's called iterations. So number of iterations. So we can uh, just provide iterations is equal to whatever uh, the number of times we want to perform dilation on our image. By default it's 1 and you can provide let's say 2 here and let's see what is the result now. So I'm going to just run this uh, code again and now you can see those black dots which we can see here on the masked image are now gradually gone but still I can see some little dots on the images. The small dots are already gone, right? So now what we, have, we can do here is we can increase the size of the rectangle. So this rectangle is applied to our uh, area which have these spots. So we can increase the uh, size of the rectangle and the bigger the rectangle is, the better the result will be but there will be a problem which I'm going to show you. So let's run this code and you can see now all the black dots from our image is gone. So there was a black dot here which you don't see anymore and there was a black dot here, here, here and here and we don't see these black dots here. But you might also observe that the size of this white area is also increased after we applied the dilation on this masked image. So now this ball and this ball in the result after the dilation is merging here, right? So you can see it's merging because the size of our kernel is uh, big and when we apply dilation, the pixel element is one if at least one pixel under the kernel is one. That's why the shape of uh, these balls are increasing. So let's see how our next morphological transformation works which is called erosion and after that I'm going to explain you how uh, this erosion works and what is erosion. So I'm going to just declare a variable called erosion and then I'm going to just uh, call a method called cv2 dot erode so the method name is erode and the first argument here is the source the second argument here is the kernel as we have seen in uh, dilate method and the third argument is the optional argument which is uh, the iterations so for now we just apply one iteration which is by default uh, also one and now we are going to just add this uh, image to our matplotlib uh, window. So I'm going to add the title and the image and now I will increase the range of the array to 4 and let's say now we want 2 by 2 uh, metrics of uh, these images, right? So let's uh, run this code and let's see what happens. So now you can see four uh, results here and first was the original image, second was the masked image, 
third was the dilation so all the spots in the balls which are black are gone using the dilation but the size was increased and using the erosion you can see the sides of the ball eroded so the basic idea of erosion is just like soil erosion it erodes away the boundary of the foreground object so when this erosion is applied the kernel which we have defined slides through all the image and a pixel in the original image either 1 or 0 will be considered as 1 only if all the pixels under the kernel is 1 otherwise it is eroded and this means this value will be set to 0 which means this will be a black area so let's increase the number of iterations here so let's say we want to apply the erosion two times on the same image and i'm going to just uh, run this code once again and you can see now these balls are eroded more let's say we want to increase this to five times and then run the code and you can see now these balls are really small because we have applied this erosion multiple number of times so let's uh, say this is uh, one once again and let's uh, make this size of our kernel small two by two uh, rectangle size right so you can see now our result is better because all the spots from these balls are gone and uh, these balls are not so much eroded now there are two more morphological transformation methods which are called opening and closing so we are going to first of all uh, see how opening works so i'm going to uh, define a variable called uh, opening and then i will call cv2 dot morphology x okay and then we will provide the source which is mask the second method is the type of morphological operation which we want to perform so in this we are going to just call cv2 dot and then we can specify which type of uh, morphological operation we want to perform on the image so just write morph and then the type of operation so we want to perform the morph open for the opening right and then the third argument here is the kernel which we have defined and now we are going to just add this uh, opening to our matplotlib uh, window let's add this and then let's do five here and then let's say our uh, matplotlib is going to show these images in a two by three format okay so let's run this code and let's see what happens and let me increase the size of this uh, image now and this is the result of the opening so what is opening in morphological transformations so opening is just another name of erosion followed by dilation so when you perform this opening morphological operation first of all erosion is performed on the image and then the dilation will be performed on the image so you can see the effect of uh, the erosion followed by the dilation still you see some spots here which can uh, go if you can just increase the size of uh, this block so let's rerun the code let's see what happens so now this image somehow looks better than the older image so opening is the erosion followed by dilation now there is a closing method also which is just the opposite of opening in the closing morphological transformation dilation is performed first on the image and then it is followed by the erosion so let's see if uh, we get the better result when we perform the closing morphological operations and the morphological operation here will be 
close. And run this code. And now you can see the result here. So in closing, as I said, first of all, the dilation is applied and then the erosion is applied. In the opening, first of all, erosion is applied and then the dilation will be applied. Now there are different type of morphological operations you can apply using this morphology X. So for example, I'm going to just use uh, some of them. So the main um, morphological operations other than opening and closing is let's say morphological gradient. So I'm going to just uh, say MG for morphological gradient. And you just need to change the second argument here. So CV2 morph underscore morphological gradient. So we are going to just uh, call this morph gradient and it's going to apply the morphological gradient. And then the next is the top hat and the black hat. So there are different uh, uh, morphological techniques you can apply. So I'm going to show you one more and then I will leave you uh, with the other techniques. So TH for top hat and here also the second argument you just need to uh, change it to top hat, right? Otherwise you can see there are so many number of techniques you can uh, apply on your image. So there is gradient, close open we have already seen, black hat, cross, dilate, uh, ellipse, erode, hit miss, rect and then top hat which is uh, we are going to use right now, right? And then we can uh, just add these two things to our list of titles and list of images. So MG and then we have TH for top hat. And now we have eight images. So range is increased to eight. And let's say we just want to show them in two by four uh, matrix here in the um, matplotlib window. So you can see this is the result of morphological gradient. So morphological gradient is the difference between the dilation and erosion of an image. And this is the result of top hat. That means it is the difference between the image and the opening of an image. So this is how you can perform some of the morphological operations on the images. Now I will show you one more example. I have a image called j.png. So I'm going to just uh, load this image also. And because this j.png is already a binary image, I don't need to apply this mask here. So instead of uh, this mask, I can just directly use our image variable. So I'm going to just uh, write this. And let's load this image two times because uh, we already have defined this mask variable inside our uh, title list and image list. And now I'm going to just run this code. So the original image of this j.png looks like this. And after we applied the dilation, you can see the dilation increases the area of uh, this j. The erosion just erodes away the corners of uh, this uh, J, right? Opening is going to apply the erosion first, followed by the dilation. And closing is going to first of all perform the dilation, followed by the erosion. This uh, morphological gradient is going to give you the difference between the dilation and erosion of the image. So it's going to give you this kind of a result. And you can see the top hat uh, result here, which is the difference between the input image and the opening of the image. So this is how you can use different type of morphological transformations on your images. In this video, we will discuss about smoothing or blurring images in OpenCV.
So smoothing, which is also known as blurring, is one of the most commonly used operation in image processing. The most common use of smoothing operation is to remove noise in the images. Now when smoothing or blurring images, we can use diverse linear filters because linear filters are easy to achieve and are also relatively fast. Now there are various kinds of filters available in OpenCV, for example, homogeneous, Gaussian, median or bilateral filters, which we will see one by one. So first of all, we will see the homogeneous filter. So homogeneous filter is the most simple filter and in homogeneous filter, each output pixel is the mean of its kernel neighbors. Now in homogeneous filter, all pixels contribute with the equal weight and that's why they are called homogeneous filters. Now, those of you who don't know what the kernel is, I have explained about kernel in the last video. So you can see the last video. And in simple word, a kernel is a shape which we can apply or convolve over an image. And you can use, for example, NumPy to create this kind of uh, squared kernel. So in homogeneous filter, the kernel looks like this image which you see on your screen. So in homogeneous filter, kernel k is equal to 1 by the width of the kernel multiplied by the height of the kernel. So let's say we want to use a kernel of 5 by 5, then using this formula, we will have k is equal to 1 by 25 and then we will have our kernel matrix of 5 by 5 ones. So let's create this kernel first of all and then we will see how to use this kernel for the image filtering using 2D convolution or homogeneous filter. So what I have right now here is the simple code which loads this image using matplotlib and this code you might already know because I have explained in detail how matplotlib works and how to read the images using OpenCV. One thing to note here is I'm just converting the image from BGR to RGB because matplotlib reads the images in the RGB format and OpenCV reads the images in the BGR format. So this conversion is necessary. So let's define our kernel. So I'm going to just say kernel is equal to NP dot once and then we are going to take the kernel of 5 by 5. So we are going to define this kernel 5 comma 5 of once. So I'm going to just say NP dot float 32 here. And then we are going to divide uh, this kernel by 25 because our kernel is of 5 by 5 because the formula which we have seen in that formula we have uh, the kernel which was a matrix of uh, ones and then we have the multiplication of one divided by the width and height of the kernel. So that's why the multiplication of the width and height is 25. That's why I have taken 25 here. So now we have our kernel. So we can define our uh, destination image using this kernel and we are going to use CV2 dot. There is a method called filter 2D, which we are going to use, which is used for this homogeneous filter. So here the first argument is the image. The second argument is the desired depth of the destination image. So for now we are going to uh, take it as a minus one. The third argument is the kernel. So now when we have applied this uh, kernel on our image using 2D filter, Let's see what the output will look like. So I will name this uh, image as uh, 2D convolution and the destination is the final image which we got using filter 2D. And let's increase this range by two. And let's say we want to show this image on matplotlib in one by two uh, format. 
okay so i'm going to just run this image so this is the result on the left hand side is the original image and on the right hand side is the 2d filter applied image so this is the image which we got by applying the homogeneous filter using filter 2d function so you can see on the corners here there is a little bit noise and after applying this uh, 2d convolution over this image you can see all the corners are now smoothened and overall this image is now smoothened or blurred a little bit so these uh, noises are removed or suppressed by this blurring so this is one way of blurring an image using filter 2d right filter 2d function now as in one dimensional signals images also can be filtered with various low pass filters or high pass filters etc so low pass filter helps in removing the noise or blurring the image etc and high pass filters helps in finding edges in the images now when you want to achieve image blurring we need to convolve over the image with the low pass filter kernel now there are some algorithm as i said there are various kind of algorithm available in opencv so we will also see them one by one so first algorithm is the blur method or it's also called the averaging so what i'm going to do is i'm going to define a variable called blur and then i'm going to call a method called cv2 dot blur okay so this is the method which we will use to apply averaging algorithm for blurring the image and this takes two argument one is the image and second is the kernel so the kernel we are going to apply is once again 5 by 5 and now we are going to just see the result of this uh, blurring method so we are going to just uh, load it using the matplotlib so range i'm going to increase it by 1 once again and let's see this uh, these three images in 1 by 3 format on the matplotlib a uh, window so this is the result and you can see the original image the result which we got using the filter to the method and the result we got using the blur method which is also called averaging so the result is more or less uh, looks the same to me because we have applied the same kind of kernel to uh, both the functions so this is the result of filter 2d function and this is the result of uh, the blur function now there are more uh, functions which are available in opencv so let's see uh, them so the next algorithm which we are going to see is the gaussian filter algorithm so the gaussian filter is nothing but using different weight kernel in both x and y direction so in the result pixels located in the middle of the kernel have the higher weight or bigger weight and the weights decreases with distance from the neighborhood center so pixels located on the side have smaller weight and the pixels located on the center have the higher weight so when we take a 5 by 5 kernel its result is going to look like this which is shown in the image and now let's see how we can use uh, this uh, gaussian blur in our open cv code so i'm going to remove this semicolon which i somehow added here and let's uh, declare a variable called g blur for gaussian blur and then we are going to use cv2 dot gaussian blur so the method name is gaussian blur and the argument here are same as the blur method so first argument is the image itself second argument is our kernel we are going to take the same kernel of 5 by 5 and the third argument here is the sigma x value which we are going to take 0 for now let's see the result of the gaussian blur method when it's applied 
to an image. So I'm going to just define one more title which is G blur or Gaussian blur or let's take this uh, name which will be more clear and then our result image is G blur and let's increase the range to uh, 4 and let's say we want to show this image in 2 by 2 format so 2 rows and 2 columns. So I'm going to run this code and for OpenCV uh, logo the results looks the same you can see uh, for uh, the 2D convolution or filter 2D method or blur method using the Gaussian blur you can see there is a little bit different between uh, the blur method and Gaussian blur method uh, uh, results. The Gaussian blur result is more better in my eyes than the blur method. Let's try this Gaussian blur method with another image. So I have this image called half tone underscore Gaussian underscore uh, blur and I'm going to run this uh, code now with the new image and you can see the result now. So this was the original image which have uh, too much noise here. So you can see uh, the pixels here which have too much noise and after applying the Gaussian blur you can see this eye image in a much better way and all the noise is removed. So the Gaussian blur method is designed specifically for removing the high frequency noise from the image like uh, this one. Now let's see the next method which is called the median filter. So median filter is something that replaces each pixel value with the median of its neighboring pixel. So this method is great when dealing with something which is called salt and pepper noise. Now if you don't know what the salt and pepper noise is, you can open the Wikipedia and uh, under this URL or just search for salt and pepper noise uh, Wikipedia page and you can see uh, more details about salt and pepper noise. So you can see this is an image and there are uh, some pixels which are distorted here. So there are uh, some pixels where uh, the white uh, dots are there or white noise is there and there are some places where the black noise is there. So that's why it's called uh, salt and pepper because we have uh, white pixels which are distorted like salt and we have the black pixels which are uh, which looks like pepper so that's why it's called salt and pepper uh, noise so i have this uh, same image which i'm going to use as a source now so it's called uh, water.png in my case and now let's see how we can use the median blur method so i'm going to just define a new variable called uh, median and then I'm going to use uh, cv2 dot median blur method. So this method is called median blur where the first argument is the image and the second argument here is the kernel size. Now one thing to note here is that the kernel size must be odd here. So uh, this must be a 3 or 5 or 7 or, and so on except 1. Okay. So when you uh, just give one, it's going to show you the original image. And let's say we uh, just give three here as the kernel size or uh, in our case, we have the kernel size of five. So let's take the five kernel size here. So let's just show this result of the median filter in the matplotlib window. So I'm going to just increase the range five. And let's say this is two by three matrix now. And I'm going to run this code and now you can see the results of all the filtering method and you can see the best result you get using the median filter method. So when you have this kind of salt and pepper dots on your images then you can use the median filter. Now let's see the last filter which is called the bilateral filter. So by using all uh, these filters for example homogeneous filter or averaging or the Gaussian or the median filter we not only dissolve the noise but we also smooth the edges. 
and sometimes we need to preserve the ages that means we need that all the ages must uh, remain sharper even if uh, the image is blurred so let me uh, show you one example so i have this uh, lena dot uh, png image so i'm going to define a variable called bilateral filter and then uh, there is a method called cv2 dot bilateral filter and this bilateral filter takes the first argument which is uh, the image the second argument is the diameter of each pixel neighborhood that is used during the filter so let's take it as a 9 the third argument is the sigma color and the fourth argument is the sigma space so the sigma color is the filter sigma in the color space and sigma space is the filter sigma in the coordinate space so for uh, this we are going to take this filter sigma color and sigma space as 75 and 75 here and uh, let's see it in the result window so bilateral filter and then uh, the result bilateral filter and this gives me error because this image is called lena.jpg not png so jpg and then uh, we need to increase this range by one to see all the six images and let's run this code and let's see what happens so you can see the result now so let me make it a little bit bigger so you can see them and from here also so now you can see by applying the bilateral filter the edges are preserved in a much better way so here you can see the hat border is blurred but here you can see in the result the border of the hat are pres preserved so the images in which you need to uh, preserve the borders then you can use the bilateral filter so bilateral filter is highly effective in noise removal while keeping the edge sharp so these are some of the methods and algorithms you can use to smoothen or blur your images using OpenCV in this video we will talk about image gradients in OpenCV so first of all what is an image gradient so an image gradient is a directional change in the intensity or the color inside the image now the image gradient of an image is one of the fundamental building blocks in image processing for example we use image gradients inside the image to find the edges inside an image now there are several image gradient methods available in OpenCV and we are going to see three of them first is the Laplacian derivatives second is the Sobel X method and third one will be the Sobel Y methods and all these methods which I mentioned are different gradient functions which uses different mathematical operations to produce the required image so the laplacian calculates the laplacian derivatives whereas sobel method is joint gaussian and differentiation operations but don't be overwhelmed with the details you just need to keep in mind that these are just the functions which we use for finding out the gradients of an image to analyze the image so let's use the first method which is called the Laplacian gradient now to start with I have this initial code and you might already know what this code is doing so first of all I'm just reading this image messy 5 dot jpg in the grayscale mode using the I am read method and then I'm just uh, loading this image using the matplotlib window. So let's first see how the result looks like. So this is going to look like this. This is just a normal image of Messi. And let's see how we can apply the Laplacian method to find out the Laplacian gradient of an image so for that we are going to declare a variable called uh, lap 
and then there is a function available inside your CV2 uh, library which is called Laplacian and this Laplacian method takes few argument first argument is the image the second argument here will be the data type which uh, we are going to uh, use which is called CV2 dot CV underscore 64 F so CV2 dot CV underscore 64 F is just a data type and we are using a 64 bit float due to the negative slope induced by transforming the image from white to black. So you just need to keep in mind that this is just a data type which is 64 bit float and it supports the negative numbers which we will be dealing with when the Laplacian method is run on our image. Now in the next line what we are going to do is we are going to take the absolute value of our Laplacian image transformation and we are going to convert this value back to the unsigned 8-bit integer which is suitable for our output. So I'm going to just write lap and then using the numpy uint method so np dot uint 8 and as an argument we are going to pass np dot absolute and then inside the absolute method we are going to just pass our image which is going to give us the absolute value of our Laplacian image transformation which is going to convert uh, this into the unsigned 8-bit integer. Now let's see the result of uh, this Laplacian gradient. So I'm going to just add a new title to my title array which is called uh, Laplacian and also inside the images uh, list I'm going to add uh, this lap uh, variable which contains uh, this image right after the Laplacian gradient is applied here and here the range will be 2 and uh, we are going to see it in 1 by 2 format on the matplotlib window. So here you can see the original image which is this one and after the Laplacian gradient uh, method is applied on this image you can see all the edges which are detected by this uh, method when we applied this method on this messy 5.jpg image and an image gradient as I said is the directional change in the intensity or the color in an image. So let's close uh, this window and there is one more uh, argument you can provide here which is the kernel size. So you can uh, just say k size is equal to 5. This is the kernel size and I'm going to just run this uh, program once again and you can see uh, the kernel size is increased but our uh, result is deteriorated right so let's uh, reduce it to 3 and then once again run this program and the result looks uh, fine and if you uh, apply k size is equal to 1 let's see the result and you can see you get the better result I think. So for now I'm going to just use k size is equal to uh, 3 and now let's use the other two uh, image gradient methods which are Sobel X and Sobel Y. So these methods which uh, are called Sobel X and Sobel Y are also called Sobel gradient representation. So let's just use them and then we will discuss uh, how they are uh, useful. So first of all, I'm going to declare a variable called uh, Sobel X and then I'm going to use uh, the method inside this uh, CV2 library, which is co called Sobel. So this is the method which takes again few arguments. First is the image. Second is uh, again this data type which is cv2 dot cv underscore 64 and the third argument here will be the dx. 
so when you write 1 here this value can be 1 or 0 so when you write 1 here that means we want to uh, use the Sobel X method okay and then the fourth argument here is the dy value okay so this is dx which is for the x direction and this is for the dy which is for the y direction and dx stands for the order of derivative x and the dy stands for order of derivative y now once again we are going to declare the sobel y variable so let's declare uh, the sobel y and then uh, cv2 dot sobel and this also takes a uh, few arguments here the difference will be only the third and fourth argument so i'm going to just use uh, the second argument same the third argument will be zero for sobel y and the fourth argument will be one right so this is the order of derivative x if it's uh, one this is called the order of derivative which is uh, in the x direction and in the second case it is in the y direction and the fifth argument here can be the k size as we have seen in the laplacian method so if you want you can provide the kernel size also here as the fifth argument but we are going to uh, skip it for now now again we are going to convert these values into the unsigned int as we have uh, done in the case of uh, laplacian so what we are going to do is we are going to once again overwrite this uh, variable sobel x and then we are going to use np dot u int 8 and in the parenthesis we are going to just write np dot absolute and then we are going to just pass uh, the value inside the sobel x variable same we, we are going to do with the sobel y variable and now let's see the result how the result looks like so i'm going to just uh, add these elements inside the title and the image list so let's add sobel x and sobel y here and here also so sobel y and now let's increase the range to four and let's see it in the form of two by two uh, matrix on the matplotlib window so i'm going to just run this code and you can see the result here so original image laplacian uh, gradient and then sobel x and sobel y so you can see uh, when you apply the sobel x uh, gradient method the direction or the change in direction in the intensity is in the x direction and when you apply the sobel y method the change in direction in the intensity is in the y direction so this is like horizontal and this is in the vertical direction i have uh, one more image which uh, will illustrate this uh, sobel x and sobel y gradient method in a better way i think and this is called uh, sudoku so i'm going to just write sudoku.png file and hopefully i didn't do any mistake in the naming yes it works so you can see uh, the laplacian result here and then sobel x and sobel y uh, result here so in the sobel x you can see more vertical lines so because sobel y is good for uh, the directional change in the vertical direction so you can see more uh, change in intensity in the vertical direction and uh, using the sobel y you can see the directional change in the intensity in the horizontal direction or the y axis you can also combine the result of sobel x and sobel y images and how we can do this let's see so to combine these two uh, result i'm going to just create one more uh, method which is called sobel combined is equal to cv2 dot 
we are going to uh, use the bitwise or operator in order to uh, merge these two images so we are going to just write bitwise or and then we are going to provide the two sources one is sobel x and the other is the sobel y image so this is going to give us the bitwise or uh, result of these two images and then we are going to just add this into the title list so let's uh, say sobel combined and also in the image list so like this and let's just increase the range to five and let's see it in the form of uh, two by three on matplotlib so i'm going to just uh, run this uh, once again and you can see the result now so this here is the combination of sobel x and sobel y method and you can see now you can see the directional change in the vertical as well as in the horizontal direction because this is the combination of sobel y and sobel x images so this is how you can use the image gradients inside OpenCV. In this video, we will talk about Kenny Edge Detector in OpenCV. So first of all, what is Kenny Edge Detector? So the Kenny Edge Detector is an edge detection operator that uses multi-stage algorithm to detect a wide range of edges in images. Now this Kenny Edge Detector was written and developed by John F. Kenny in 1986. That's why it's named after his name, which is Kenny Edge Detector. Now the process of Kenny Edge Detection algorithm can be broken down in five different steps. The first step is to apply Gaussian filter to smooth the image in order to remove the noise. The second step is to find the intensity gradients of the image. The third step is to apply the non-maximum suppression to get rid of spurious response to edge detection. The fourth step is to apply double threshold to determine the potential edges and the fifth step is to track edges by hysteresis that is to finalize the detection of the edges by suppressing all the other edges that are weak or not connected to strong edges so this seems little bit complicated but in OpenCV it's really simple to use so there is a built-in function in OpenCV which is called Kenny and we are going to use uh, this function. So to start with I have this uh, sample code which loads this image which is called messy.jpg using the matplotlib library. I'm going to just run this to show you the result. So this is the image and we want to uh, detect the edges of this image so what we are going to do is we are going to first of all declare a variable called uh, Kenny and then there is a method as I already said inside your CV2 library which is called Kenny method which takes few arguments so the first argument here is the image source itself the second argument and the third argument as you can see is the first threshold value and the second threshold value so this first threshold value and the second threshold value you need to provide for the hysteresis procedure so there is the last step as i mentioned and in that step hysteresis take place and for that procedure we need to provide the values of the threshold one and the threshold two so for now i'm going to uh, provide 100 as the threshold one and 200 as the threshold two but later you might want to add a track bar in order to see the changes in the edges when you just move the track bar from left to right for the threshold one and the threshold two so this might be a small assignment for you 
you can just add the track bar and see how the edge detection changes when you change the value of threshold 1 and threshold 2. And I have already explained how you can use track bars with OpenCV. So just watch that video and you will be good to go. So now we have the result of Kenny edge detection function. So we are going to just add it to our list, first to the list of titles and then second to the list of images and the range we are going to increase it to uh, 2 and this we are going to just uh, see the images in 1 by 2 format. So I'm going to just run this uh, Python script and see the result. So you can see we have uh, the uh, original image here which we have loaded in the grayscale and on the right hand side you can see the result of the Kenny edge detection methods. So you can see uh, all the edges which are available here on this messy5.jpg image. You can use uh, this on the other images also. So for example, I have the lena.jpg image. Let's see the result of that. And this is the result of uh, the Kenny edge detection method on this lena.jpg method. So this Kenny edge detection is really useful because in the last video we have seen how to find out the image gradients and let's see in comparison to those image gradient methods how Kenny edge detection method performs. So these are all the methods I have explained in the last video Laplacian, Sobel, X and Sobel Y and I have shown you how to combine the result of Sobel X and Sobel Y and additionally I have added this uh, line to the previous code which I have shown you in the last video which is edges is equal to cv2.kenny which gives us the result on the same image uh, using the Kenny edge detection method and I have added it to the title and the image right. So let's run this uh, script once again and let's see the differences in the result using all these uh, methods. So you can see all the six results. This is the original image. This is the result of the Laplacian method. This is the result of uh, Sobel X and this is the result of Sobel Y and this is the combination of Sobel X and Y. And you can see Kenny edge detection gives us the result which contains lesser noises. So you can see there is a lot of noise present in the other methods. You can see here all the noise is present which is uh, removed using Kenny edge detection or in the Laplacian method also you can see uh, some noises around but in the Kenny edge uh, detection method you can see you get the proper edges and more precise edges without any noise. So this is the benefit of using Kenny edge detection. So this is how you can use Kenny edge detection. In this video we will discuss about image pyramids in OpenCV. So till now normally when we have used images we have used the images of constant size but sometimes we need to work with the images of different resolution. So for example, if uh, I have an image and I want to search the face inside an image, this face can be of different sizes. So using image pyramids, we uh, just create the images of different resolutions and then we search for the object for example face in all of uh, these images. So pyramid or pyramid representation is a type of multi-scale signal representation in which a signal or an image is subject to repeated smoothing and subsampling. So a normal pyramid when you create a pyramid of images it will look like this. So let's say this is the original image at the bottom. Then when you uh, downscale an image using a pyramid function, 
it's going to give you uh, this image which have the half resolution than the original image and then when you further go up it's going to give you the one fourth of the original image and then so on so one eighth or one sixteenth of an image now there are two types of uh, image pyramids which are available in OpenCV first is called Gaussian pyramid and second is called Laplacian pyramid so first we will discuss about the Gaussian pyramid so Gaussian pyramid is nothing but repeat filtering and subsampling of an image now there are two functions available for the Gaussian uh, pyramid which is called pair down and pair up so let's uh, see them one by one so I have this uh, sample code which is just reading an image and then showing it using the I am show method now in order to uh, use this uh, pair down function you can uh, just define a variable let's say LR for lower resolution and then you can use CV2 dot pair down so there are two functions you can see pair down and pair up so first of all we will see pair down and then we are going to pass our image as an argument here so I'm going to just pass our image as an argument and we are already showing the original image and let's show the image after we have reduced the resolution of this image using the pair down method so pair down is going to reduce the resolution of an image so I'm going to just uh, use LR here and let's say this is the pair down one image okay so let's run this code and let's see what happens so you can see this is the original image and this is about you can see one-fourth of this uh, original image right so this pair down method is going to reduce the resolution of an image when you apply the same uh, method on the second image so let's say this is LR1 and then we create a second variable LR2 and when we pass LR1 as an argument for this method to create the LR2 to image then let's see what happens so this will be LR1 and let's uh, just say this is going to give us LR2 the resolution of image will reduce further so let's see what happens so this was the original image this was uh, the image which we got from the first pair down method and then we get this image which we which is further reduced in resolution so this is the image after applying the pair down method second time on the LR1 image okay so you can see the resolution of image is reducing and it's creating a kind of pyramid and that's why it's called the image pyramid now there is a method called pair up also available in OpenCV so let's see what this uh, pair up method do so as you can expect it's going to increase the resolution of the image so here I'm going to just say HR for higher resolution and then I'm going to just say CV2 dot pair up okay and it's going to increase the resolution of an image now let's say we want to increase the resolution of an of this image which is the smallest image which we got using the pair down method right so we are going to apply the uh, pair up on the last image which we got using the pair down method and let's see what happens so when I'm going to use this HR2 here and this we got from uh, pair up method and let's say this is the pair up one and I'm going to just uh, run this code and you, you are going to see that we have 
converted this image which was the smallest image to a higher resolution which resulted in this image but when you see this image carefully so let me just move this uh, to this side and this was the original image so let me just uh, minimize this so this image we have converted to this image using the pair up method so ideally this image should look like this but you have to remember that this pair up image is not going to be equal to this image because once you decrease the resolution using the pair down method you lose the information about that image so when you uh, use pair up to just increase the resolution of this image then you can see the result looks little bit blurred because some of the information is loosed using the pair down method so you have to keep this in mind that when you want to increase the resolution after you have reduced the resolution you are not going to get the same result as you might expect that this image should look like this but they are not equal images so this image is just a higher resolution of this image and it has nothing to do with this image so these are the two methods which are available in gaussian pyramid now if you want to uh, create a pyramid of uh, multiple resolution instead of uh, just using this pair up or pair down method repeatedly what you can do here is i'm going to just uh, remove uh, this and remove uh, this code also so what i'm going to do is i'm going to copy uh, the image into a new variable so i'm going to just say uh, layer is equal to img dot uh, copy there is a method available for copying uh, the image which is uh, copy and then i'm going to create the gaussian pyramid array okay so i'm going to just create a variable called gp for a gaussian pyramid is equal to then in square bracket i'm going to just pass this uh, image here as the first element of uh, this list then what i can do is i can use a for loop instead of just rewriting this pair down method again and again and you might already know how to use for loop in python so for i in range and here we can provide any uh, range so let's say we want to create five uh, image pyramid okay so five time we want to reduce the uh, resolution so we are going to give uh, six here because range goes uh, the number minus one so whatever you give here minus one right so now what we are going to do is we are going to just uh, use our layer uh, uh, parameter once again and then we are going to just call cv2 dot pair down method so pair down and then we want to just uh, say layer okay and then we want to append to the gaussian pyramid list okay so we are going to just say gp dot append and we are going to append the result of uh, this pair down to our list which we have created here okay so this is going to uh, just append this image to our list of images and then let's uh, just uh, show this image using cv2 dot i am show method so cv2 dot i am show and here we can just say str for converting the integer to the string because uh, the first parameter you give to i am show is a string parameter that's why i'm converting the integer to the string and the second parameter is the image so let's uh, pass this layer here okay so you have the original image which will be uh, shown using this line of code and then you will see multiple number of images of different resolution using this code 
So let's run this code and let's see what happens. So I'm going to run this code and you can see there are uh, different images uh, resulted using uh, that code which we have uh, written. So this was uh, the first image which is a zero and then this is the second image and then uh, this is the third, fourth, fifth and sixth. So sixth you can see have a very small resolution. So this is how you can uh, use uh, pair down method multiple times using a for loop. Now what are Laplacian pyramids? So Laplacian pyramids are formed from the Gaussian pyramids. There is no exclusive function for uh, creating the Laplacian pyramid. So as you have seen that uh, in Gaussian pyramids, there are two methods available, pair up and pair down, but there is no exclusive function for creating the Laplacian pyramid. So how we can create a Laplacian pyramid if there is no function available for creating them? So you can create a Laplacian pyramid or a level of Laplacian pyramid is formed by the difference between that level in the Gaussian pyramid and the extended version of its upper level in the Gaussian pyramid. So this definition might be confusing to you guys. So let me explain you with the code what I mean by this definition. So what I'm going to do is, first of all, I'm going to take the top level layer of the Gaussian pyramid. So top level layer of the Gaussian pyramid is the last image which is generated using this uh, for loop. So let's say we have uh, six images or five images using uh, this for loop. So what we are going to do is because we have appended each and every image to this list, right? So we have all the images inside this list. So we can uh, just get the last image using the indexing. So again, I'm going to use uh, the layer variable and then I'm going to uh, just say GP for Gaussian pyramid list. And then there is the index five because last image will be available at the index five of uh, this uh, list. So we get the last image of uh, that Gaussian pyramid and then let's show this image. So I'm going to just say CV2 dot uh, I am uh, show and this is the upper level or the last image. So I'm going to say upper level Gaussian pyramid and then we are going to pass uh, this layer variable here. So this is going to show just the last image of uh, this list and let's uh, just comment this code out because we don't want to see all the images. And then I'm going to create a new list for Laplacian pyramid. So I'm going to just say LP for Laplacian pyramid and then I'm going to create a list uh, using the layer uh, variable itself as we have done for the Gaussian pyramid list also. So the first element here is uh, the layer variable itself and now we are going to use the for loop and then i in range and this time what we are going to do is you might already know how to use uh, the range function and if you don't know you can see uh, you can give the stop integer here or you can give a uh, multiple uh, uh, parameters here so you can see there is one more implementation of this range function. So you can give the start parameter and the stop range. So start is the starting point, stop is the stopping point, and also you can give the steps. So this step means uh, in what number you want to reduce, okay? So let's say we want to start from five, and then we want to go until zero and we want to reduce in the step of minus one okay so five four three 
two, one. So let's uh, print the value of i first of all, if you uh, might be interested in the result of this range function, then uh, let's uh, just uh, run this uh, code and let's see what happens. So this is uh, the images which we get, but we are not interested in these images, we are interested in the print function output. So you can see the output of uh, this uh, print function code is 54321. As I said, uh, the lower limit is not reached. So if you give zero here, then it's going to go until one and not zero. If you give six here, then it's going to go until five not 6. So let me repeat the definition of Laplacian pyramid once again. So Laplacian pyramid is formed by the difference between that level in the Gaussian pyramid and the extended version of its upper level in the Gaussian pyramid. So let's first create the extended version of that level. So we are going to just create a variable called uh, Gaussian extend or extended and then we are going to extend the level of uh, that image which are there in the Gaussian uh, pyramid list by using cv2 dot dot pair up method and here what you need to give is the Gaussian pyramid list and then we just need to get the index i from this. So this line gives us the extended version of the upper level in Gaussian pyramid. Now let's create the Laplacian pyramid. So Laplacian is equal to CV2 dot subtract because we want to find out the difference between uh, that level in the Gaussian pyramid and the extended version of its upper level. So I'm going to just say GP for Gaussian uh, pyramid and then we are going to just say i minus 1 as the first parameter and the second parameter is the extended version of uh, the Gaussian upper limit. And now we can use the I am uh, show method to show all these Laplacian images. So I'm going to just say cv2 dot I am uh, show and once again I'm going to use str function to convert uh, from a number to string and then in the next parameter I'm going to just pass the Laplacian uh, parameter here as an image source. So what do you think? Will this code work? So let's see what happens when we are going to run this code. So you can see the Laplacian pyramid looks just like the edge detection. So all the edges are shown here on every uh, image. This is the first level, this is the second level, third level, fourth, fifth level. So these images are called the Laplacian pyramid. Now what is the use of uh, creating those Laplacian pyramids or the Gaussian pyramids? So the Laplacian and Gaussian pyramid helps us to blend the images and the reconstruction of the images. So these are the two uh, benefits of creating those Laplacian and the Gaussian pyramids. So in the next video, we are going to see how we can blend the images or how can we reconstruct the images using the OpenCV and the image pyramids. In the last video, we have seen what are image pyramids and I have told you there are two kinds of image pyramids in OpenCV. One is called the Gaussian pyramid and the other is called the Laplacian pyramid. And we have seen in the last video how we can create the Gaussian pyramid and the Laplacian pyramid. Now in the last video I have also told you some applications of image pyramids. And one of the application of image pyramids is the image blending. So let me show you one example. So here in this code, I have two images. One is of apple and other is of orange. And I want to blend or merge these two images. So let me just run this code first of all. So you can see there are two images. First is 
of apple and other is of orange and I have also printed the shape of uh, these two images. So you can see the shape is similar 512 by 512 and orange image shape is also 512 by 512. So here what I want to do is I want to blend half of the orange to half of the apple. So let's say I want to just blend right hand side of this orange to the left hand half of this apple. So how can I achieve this? Now you might say that I can uh, just uh, cut these two images into half and then I can stack these two images side by side and I will get the half and half of uh, the two images and that's how I can uh, just get the result. So let's first of all try this uh, technique. First of all we are going to just uh, create the half and half of the apple and orange images and we are going to just uh, stack these images side by side. So let's say I'm going to create uh, the variable called apple underscore uh, orange and then here there is a method in numpy so I'm going to just say numpy dot h stack so there is this method called h stack and here what I can do is in the form of tuple I can uh, provide the half of my apple image so apple is the image variable name and then what I'm going to do is the half of uh, this image because this image is 512 by 512 so I'm going to just give this kind of expression colon comma and then colon 256 which is the half of the apple image on the left hand side right and then I'm going to just do the same with the orange image so I'm going to just take orange and then colon comma 256 colon so one thing to observe here is I have taken colon before 256 in the apple image and I have taken colon after 256 in the orange image and then I'm going to just uh, show this apple orange image and let's see what result we get when we run our code so these two are the apple and orange image and this is the result of adding the two halves of the orange and the apple image but still you can see this line which is clearly visible and from this line you can say half of this is orange and half of this is an apple so in image blending what we need to do is we need to blend this line also so the orange and the apple image should be merged or blended in a perfect way so for blending this half apple and half orange image what we can do is we can use the image pyramid techniques to blend these two images now in order to blend two images using image pyramids technique we need to follow five steps the first step is to load two images in our case these images are of apple and orange which we are already doing so first step is to load these two images the second step is to find out the gaussian pyramid of our apple and orange image the third step will be from these gaussian pyramids find out the laplacian pyramids okay so we will find out the gaussian pyramid in the second step and then in the third step we are going to find out the laplacian pyramids now in the fourth step we are going to join the left half of the apple and the right half of the orange in each levels of laplacian pyramid and finally in the fifth step what we are going to do is we are going to just join these image pyramids and reconstruct the original image so let's follow these steps one by one and let's see what result we get
So as I said, first step is already done, which is just loading these two images. And the second step would be to find out the Gaussian pyramid. So let me just, uh, just write this step, generate Gaussian pyramid for uh, Apple first of all, and then we are going to find out the Gaussian pyramid of the orange. So first of all, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just copy the Apple image. So I'm going to just say Apple underscore copy is equal to Apple dot copy. So there is a method called copy, which you can use to copy the this image. So from this copy, what we are going to do is we are going to generate the Gaussian pyramid. So I'm going to once again, name my variable as GP uh, let's say underscore Apple and then we are going to just pass our image which we have copied in the form of list so I'm going to just say Apple copy here so these steps we have already seen in the last video how to create the Gaussian pyramid and the Laplacian pyramid of an image so I'm not going to explain this in detail if you want uh, the detailed explanation you can see the last video next what i'm going to do is i'm going to create a for loop and i'm going to just say for i in our range so i'm going to use the range function and we are going to uh, use the six levels uh, in this example so i'm going to provide the range up to six and then what we are going to uh, do is we are going to just say apple copy or you might have uh, named this variable as apple layer also because we are uh, just creating multiple layer of the apple image for the gaussian pyramid right and then we are going to use the cv2.pair down method to create the gaussian pyramid okay this we have already seen in the last video. And now as an argument, we are going to pass our apple copy uh, variable here. And in the next step, what we are going to do is we are going to just uh, append to our GP underscore apple variable, which is our Gaussian pyramid for the apple image. And then we are going to just append this apple copy after we have applied pair down method on the same image. So this is, just giving us multiple layer of the apple image right the same method we are going to apply for the orange also so i'm going to just copy uh, this code and then we, i'm going to just paste this code once again and this time this will be for orange and i'm going to just say this is the orange copy and we are going to copy from the orange uh, image and then we are going to just generate the Gaussian pyramid for the orange image and this will be passed here and also here and also here and also here and this Gaussian pyramid orange will be passed here okay so we have generated the Gaussian pyramid for the apple and the orange. Now we are going to generate the Laplacian pyramid for apple and orange. So this also we have seen in the last video. So I'm going to just comment uh, generate Laplacian pyramid for uh, apple first of all. And to find out the Laplacian pyramid for uh, the apple, what we are going to do is we are going to once again uh, take our uh, apple copy and then using our uh, gaussian pyramid so let's uh, take gaussian pyramid for the apple and we are going to use the fifth element of uh, this list so what we have learned in the last video how we can find out the laplacian pyramid a level in the laplacian pyramid is formed by the difference between the level in the gaussian pyramid and extended version of its upper level in the Gaussian pyramid. So this difference we are going to find out in this step. So I'm going to just say this is LP for the apple, which stands for Laplacian pyramid for the apple is equal to in the list. We are going to just pass the apple copy 
and then uh, we are going to use the for loop so for i in uh, the range so we are going to take the range and in the last video I have shown you how to take the range for uh, the Laplace in pyramid so we want to go from uh, 5 until 0 in the steps of minus 1 and then in the next step we are going to create the Gaussian extended uh, variables Gaussian extended is equal to CV2 dot pair up this time we are going to use the pair up method and then we are going to pass our uh, GP apple which is Gaussian pyramid for apple and then the index here will be I in the next step we are going to create the Laplacian uh, variables is equal to CV2 dot subtract so there is a method in CV2 which is called subtract and then we are going to take our Gaussian pyramid for the apple so GP apple and the index here will be I minus 1 and the second argument for uh, this subtract uh, method will be our Gaussian extended variable so we are going to just pass this Gaussian extended variable and in the next step we are going to just append to our Laplacian pyramid for the apple so LP underscore apple dot append and we are going to just append this uh, Laplacian variable to the Laplacian pyramid for the apple same we will do for the orange image also so we are going to generate the Laplacian pyramid for the orange orange here and this will be the copy of uh, the orange copy here and here also and uh, then this will be the GP orange right this also will be GP orange this also will be GP orange and here instead of LP apple we are going to just say LP orange and then we are going to just pass this variable here also so now we have finished three steps one is to load both the images second is to find out or generate the Gaussian pyramid and the third step is to generate the Laplacian pyramid for uh, both the images now the fourth step is to just join the half of uh, these two images so what I'm going to do is now I'm going to just uh, create one more variable which will be apple underscore orange underscore let's say pyramid is equal to and also we are going to create a variable called n and we are going to see uh, later how to use uh, this uh, variable and then we are going to use the for loop and then we are going to create two uh, variables one for uh, the first image so I'm going to uh, just say apple and then uh, lap comma orange lap okay so these two uh, variables I'm creating just same as uh, this uh, I in this for loop in zip so there is a method zip which we can use to zip uh, the Laplacian pyramid uh, one which is for the apple and for uh, the orange also so I'm going to just say LP for apple comma LP for the orange and inside this for loop first of all we are going to just uh, increment the value of n by 1 each time so n plus equals uh, 1 and in this next step we are going to find out the shape of the apple image so the apple image shape gives us three values first is columns so I'm going to just say C O L S for columns then uh, rows and then the third value is the number of channels and then we are going to just say apple lap dot shape in the next step we are going to just create a variable called Laplacian and we are going to just uh, join the two halves of uh, these two images which we are getting inside the variable apple lap and orange lap so we are basically doing this step after applying the Gaussian uh, pyramid and 
the Laplace in M, uh, pyramid on both the images. So np dot h take uh, method we are going to apply in this step. So I'm going to just write np dot h stack and then as an argument what we are going to do is we in the form of tuple first of all we are going to take our apple lamp variable which is uh, this one and in the square bracket we are going to just write colon comma zero comma int so we are going to just typecast the number of columns in the apple shape so this we got from the shape of the apple uh, index and then divided by 2 so we are going to just uh, uh, dividing the columns into half and same we will do for the orange lap so we are going to just say orange lap in the square bracket colon comma int and then once again uh, in the uh, parenthesis we are going to just say calls for the number of columns divided by 2 and then colon as we have done in this step also and at last we are going to just append this Laplace in variable to this uh, list which we have created so apple underscore orange underscore pyramid dot append and then we are going to pass the Laplacian variable here. Now the last and the final step is to reconstruct our image. So let's reconstruct our image. So now what we are going to do is we are going to once again create a variable called apple orange underscore reconstruct is equal to this will be uh, the first index of our apple orange pyramid. So I'm going to just say apple orange underscore pyramid and this will be the zeroth index and once again we are going to use the for loop so for uh, i in the range so we are going to go from 1 until 6 and the default step is of uh, 1 so we don't need to give the third argument and inside the for loop we are going to just take this variable once again and then we are going to apply the pair up method on this so cv2 dot pair up and as an argument we are going to pass the same variable so we are going to just uh, apply the pair up on uh, this uh, apple orange reconstruct from the zeroth index of the pyramid up to the sixth level and the last step will be to add all the layers so uh, apple orange uh, reconstructed once again or reconstruct uh, is equal to cv2 dot add so this is also one method which is called add and here we are adding apple orange pyramid and the reconstructed apple orange uh, image okay so this is uh, this variable which we got by uh, just adding the left and right halves of each level and then we are uh, just reconstructing uh, this image using the pair up method and thus just adding the pyramid level so this should be i think the index i right we cannot uh, just add the list to the image directly okay so this will be uh, at each layer we are just reconstructing and adding it to the image which we got by just uh, add addition of this half of the images now in the end let's try to just uh, load this uh, reconstructed apple orange image in the I am show window and let's hope it works I haven't checked it yet so I'm not sure it will work or not and you can see it's working in the first go so that's a good thing so you can see the difference so this result we got by just stacking this apple and orange image side by side but this uh, line is clearly visible but when we applied the Gaussian pyramid and the Laplacian pyramid technique for blending the images then you can see this line is perfectly blended and this line is not uh, any more visible so this is the perfect blending of the orange and the apple image 
So this is how you can use the Laplacian and Gaussian pyramids to reconstruct and blend two images together and the result is in front of you so you can see how it can blend two images so perfectly. So this is how you can blend images using image pyramid technique. In this video we are going to understand what contours are and we are going to see how to find contours and how to draw contours. So first of all what are contours? So contours can be explained as the curve joining all the continuous points along the boundary which are having the same color or intensity. Now contours can be a useful tool for shape analysis or object detection or object recognition. Now for better accuracy we generally use binary image for finding the contours. So first of all we are going to uh, generate the binary image and then before finding out the contours we are going to apply the threshold or Kenny edge detection to find the contours on the image. So let's start with an example. So here I have a simple code which reads an image and then converts this image into a gray scale image. And then I'm just showing both the images using I'm show method. So let's run this code and let's see what result we get. So this is the original image with uh, these colors and after the conversion of uh, this image to the grayscale image this is the result which we are getting and then we are going to find out the threshold or the Kenny edge so in this example we are going to just uh, apply the threshold so for applying the threshold on this image we are going to define first of all two variable ret comma thresh is equal to cv2 dot threshold so there is a method called threshold which we have already seen how threshold work in detail in the previous videos so the first argument which this threshold method takes is the image so we are going to pass our grayscale image as the source the second argument is the threshold value so because it's a binary image let's set the threshold to 127 which is around half of uh, the 255 right the third argument is the maximum value so in the maximum value here will be 255 the next argument will be the type and type here will be zero so this is going to give us the threshold value for this grayscale image and after finding out the threshold of this image we are going to find out the contours so for this we are going to define two variables one is contours and the second is the hierarchy because uh, the method which we are going to use which is cv2 dot find contours this is the method it's going to give us these two values contours and the hierarchy and we are going to see what are contours and hierarchy in details after applying this method on this image so the first argument will be the thresh which we got using this threshold method the second argument will be the contour mode so this is called the contour retrieval mode also and there can be several uh, possibilities here which we can apply but for simplicity and in the most common case we use retr underscore tree here okay as the mode the third argument here will be the method which we want to apply and this is also called the contour approximation method and here also several uh, possibilities are possible but for now what we are going to use here is this will be cv2 dot approx none so now as you are seeing here this uh, find contour method gives us contours and the hierarchy so the contour is a python list of all contours in the image and each individual contour is a numpy array of uh, x comma y coordinates of boundary points of the object and the hierarchy is the optional output vector which is containing the information about image topology and this we are going to see in the later videos 
So for now, we are only concerned about uh, finding out the contours. So for this, as I said, this contains the number of contours, right? So we can uh, print out these number of contours is equal to and then we are going to just uh, convert this number into the string and there is a method called length and then inside this length method we are going to pass our contour variable so this line is going to print out the number of contours which are found inside the image which we are providing so let's run this code and let's see what result we get so we already know that this gives us a grayscale image and the original image but we are interested in this uh, print message and the number of uh, contours which are found is 9 inside the source image which we are providing here. Now we already found out the number of contours. Now we need to draw these contours on the image itself. So how can we achieve this? But before this let's see the individual contour also. So I'm going to just print out the value of the first contour which will be at index 0. So let's run it once again and let's see what happens. So we are running uh, this uh, code once again and you can see after printing out the number of contours it's going to give us the numpy array of the x and y coordinates. So if we plot or join all these x and y coordinates we are going to get the boundary of the contour. So now we are going to just take these contours and pass it to a method called draw contours which is going to draw or join all these coordinates of those contours. So to get this we are going to just say cv2 dot draw contours and then the first argument here will be our original image because we want to draw the contours on our original image. So this will be the IMG uh, and it's the original image and the second argument will be the contours. So we are going to just uh, pass the contours which we found inside the image. The third argument will be the contours indexes. So if we uh, just give here minus one then it's going to draw all the nine contours which were found inside the image these all contours so first of all we will give a minus one here as an argument and then we will see uh, how to give other arguments uh, as the numbers here also the fourth argument here will be i think the color so we are going to just uh, give the color uh, 0 comma 255 comma 0 let's say and uh, the next argument will be the thickness so we are going to take the thickness 3 here so using this method what we have achieved is we have drawn the contours on the original image so let's run this code once again and let's see what result we get so you can see this was the grayscale image and this we have used for finding out the contours but the interesting image here is this one and here you can see all the contours are drawn on this image. So all the green lines or green uh, uh, boundaries are all contours. So because we have given minus one, it has drawn all the contours on this image and we can also give the contour index. So let's say we just want to uh, find out the contour 0 which will be the first contour which is found inside the image. We are going to just uh, run this uh, uh, code once again and the first contour which was find out found out is this contour, this uh, p contour, right? In a similar way we can go up to uh, 8, so 0, 1 and let's uh, rerun this code again you will see that the second contour is this contour. So this whole contour from uh, the boundary of this image is the second contour and in a similar way you can go uh, let's say 2 I'm going to run this uh, code once again you will see the next contour here and similarly you can go up to the index 8 because the total number of contours are 9 and we are starting 
from the index 0 that's why we can go up to 8 so this value depends on the number of contours okay so because we found out the number of contours are 9 so that's why we can go up to 8 and let's run this code and the last contour which was find out and we have drawn this contour here on this uh, blue circle right now if we go beyond this index let's say we give 9 here we are going to get the error right so you can go up to 8 here and if you want to just draw all the contours then you can just give minus 1 here and it's going to draw all the contour on the image which you are providing so this is how you can find out the contours and draw contours on the images using find contour and draw contour methods in OpenCV. In this video, I'm going to show you how you can create a very basic and simple motion detection and tracking system using Python and OpenCV. So let me show you what we are going to achieve at the end of this video. So I have this uh, video, which is a sample video, and you can see some people are walking around inside this video now what I want to do here is I want to show these rectangles around uh, these moving people or persons so this is tracking and when some movement occurs I also want to show this kind of status that status is movement because somebody is moving inside the video so if nobody is moving the status will be blank and if somebody is moving then the status uh, will be movement so this is what we are going to achieve at the end of uh, this video so we are going to try to track each and every person and also we are going to uh, track this person with this rectangle and also we will show the status uh, as movement when somebody moves inside the video so let's get started so to start with i have this uh, basic code which just reads a video using video capture class and then if uh, this video is valid then i'm going to just show this uh, frame by frame inside i'm show window and i'm sure you might be knowing all this code because i've shown you step by step how to capture the video or how you can read the video frames using video capture method okay so this is just to uh, load this video and show it frame by frame using i am show method so, so let me run uh, this code first of all to start with so our original video looks like this so some people are moving but we want to track the movement of each and every person and also we want to show a rectangle around them whoever is moving so let's get started so under this uh, video capture code line what I'm going to do is first of all I want to read two frames from the cap uh, instance so I'm going to just copy uh, this code and paste it here so this will be or frame one let's say and similarly I'm going to just read the second frame so uh, simply we are just uh, declaring two frame uh, one after another okay and we don't need uh, this uh, code anymore so first of all I'm going to declare a variable uh, diff and using uh, cv2 dot abs diff method so absolute difference we are going to find out the difference between the first frame and the second frame so this method abs diff is for finding out the absolute difference between the first frame and the second frame now once we have the difference then we are going to convert this difference into a grayscale uh, mode so we are going to just say gray is equal to cv2 dot uh, convert color so cvt uh, color and the first parameter here will be our 
difference which we uh, have found between the two frames. So I'm going to just pass diff as the first argument and the second argument will be CV2 dot we are going to convert this BGR color to the grayscale uh, mode. And why we are finding out the grayscale uh, mode of uh, this uh, diff because we are going to find out the contour in the later stages and in the last video we have learned that it's easier to find out the contours in the grayscale mode uh, as compared to the colored mode or the BGR mode. So once we have uh, this grayscale mode we are going to just blur our grayscale uh, uh, frame so we are going to uh, just declare a variable called blur and then we are going to apply the Gaussian blur on our gray uh, variable. So cv2 dot uh, Gaussian blur the first parameter here will be gray so let's uh, give this uh, gray parameter which we have de defined here. The second parameter here is the k size or the kernel size. So let's say we want to provide the kernel size 5 comma 5 and the third parameter here will be the sigma x value. So we are going to just pass uh, 0 here as the sigma uh, x value. Now we are going to find out the threshold. So we are going to just say underscore because we don't need this uh, first uh, variable and then the second variable will be thresh is equal to cv2 dot uh, threshold and the first parameter which it takes is the source. So we are going to pass our blurred image as the source and then the second parameter here will be the threshold value. So we are going to just provide 20 here. Then the maximum threshold value will be uh, 255. Then the type will be uh, cv2 dot thresh binary. So in the next step what we are going to do is we are going to dilate the thresholded image to fill in all the holes. This will help us to find out the better contours. So there is a method called cv2.dilate. So we are going to just declare a variable called uh, dilated and then we are going to apply this uh, method. So cv2.dilate which takes few arguments. The first argument will be our thresholded uh, version of uh, the image. The second argument here will be the kernel. So kernel let's say for now we are going to provide none here okay so the kernel size will be uh, none and then uh, third parameter will be the number of iterations so let's provide the number of iterations and the number of iterations we are going to provide here will be three so if it doesn't work we can increase or decrease the number of iterations now in the next step what we are going to do is we are going to find out the contour so as you all know that contour or find contour method is going to give you two results. One is the contours and other is the hierarchy. So we are going to just say contour and the second uh, result we are going to just say underscore because we are not going to use this uh, second result. And then we are going to uh, just say cv2 dot find contours and we are going to find the contours on this dilated image. So we are going to say dilated. Now the next argument here will be the mode. So the mode which we are going to use here will be retter underscore uh, tree. So I'm going to just write retr underscore tree which is uh, most commonly used. And then uh, the next argument here will be the method. So the method here will be cv2 dot uh, chain approx simple. And once we have our contours, we are going to just draw the contours because we already uh, found out the contours. So we are going to just say uh, draw contours. And the first argument here will be uh, frame one because we want to apply all the contours on the original frame, right? So we are going to apply all the contours which we have found using all these methods on the frame one. And then the second argument here 
will be the contour so you can uh, just give the contours here and the third argument here will be uh, the contour id i can uh, just say minus one which is uh, going to apply all the contours and the third and the next argument will be the color so let's say we want to provide the green color so i'm going to just uh, say zero comma 255 uh, comma zero and the next will be the thickness so let's say we want to provide the thickness of two here so now it's going to draw all the contours which we have found with the difference of frame one and frame two right and then we are going to just uh, display this frame one so we can just say this is our uh, feed and the result after applying the contour will be saved in the frame one which we will display now in the next step what we are going to do is we are going to assign the value inside frame two into frame one so we are going to just say frame one is equal to frame two and then inside our frame two we are going to read a new value so we are going to just say r e t comma frame two is equal to cap dot read okay so we are reading the new frame in the variable frame two and the, before reading the new frame we are assigning the value inside the frame two to the frame one in this way we are reading the two frames and finding out the difference between uh, the two frames so let's run this code and let's see if it works or not uh, let's test this so you can see now there are these contours which are drawn around all the moving uh, persons also there are some contours uh, which are drawn around this rope which is also moving right so we have successfully determined the contours and we have already drawn these contours on the frame one but this was not the result we are looking for we want to draw the rectangle around these moving uh, persons and also we want uh, some noises to be removed so we don't want to uh, draw the contour on the moving uh, rope let's say okay so how to remove these uh, noises and how to draw these rectangles let's see so now in the next step what we are going to do is under or before we are drawing these contours we don't want to uh, draw the contours now we want to draw the rectangles right so what we are going to do is we are going to iterate over all the contours so we are going to just say uh, for contour so from contours we are going to find out contour in contours right so this is the list and we are iterating over this list so inside this for loop the first step will be to save all the coordinates of the found contours okay so we are going to define the x coordinate then the y coordinate and then uh, we are going to uh, just say width comma height and there is a method called bounding rect which we are going to apply on the contour so we are going to uh, just say is equal to cv2 dot bounding rect this is the method which we are going to apply which is going to give us uh, the x and y coordinate and the width and height right and we are going to apply this bounding rect method on the contour which we are getting using this uh, contours list now in the next step we are going to find out the area of the contour and we are going to just say if this area is less than certain value then we don't want to do anything we don't want to uh, draw a rectangle or anything we just want to continue otherwise if this uh, contour area is greater than uh, let's say uh, some kind of a person's area then we want to draw a rectangle on it so inside this for loop we are going to just uh, define a if condition so we can say if cv2 
dot contour area so there is a method called uh, contour area which is this one where we can pass our contour so we are going to pass our contour and if the area of this contour let's say is less than 700 then we are going to just say continue so this code essentially mean that if the area of the contour is less than 700 then we are going to do nothing we don't want to draw any rectangle otherwise if the area is greater than 700 then we want to draw the rectangle so we are going to just say cv2 dot rectangle we have already learned how to draw a rectangle on an image using the rectangle method the first argument here will be the source which will be frame one the second argument will be the point one so we are going to just say point one will be x comma y the third argument will be point two so we are going to just say x plus w comma y plus h the next argument will be the color so let's say the color will be the same zero comma 255 comma zero the next argument will be the thickness let's say we want to give the thickness uh, two as we have done uh, with the draw contour we have provided the thickness of two here right now in the next step we are going to just uh, uh, print some text on the image if some movement is observed so we can just say cv2 dot uh, put text this also we have seen in the previous videos how to put text on an image so this time the source will be our frame one the second will be the text so we will uh, just say uh, status let's say and if there is some movement we are going to just say uh, colon in the curly brackets we are going to just use the format method so this is just uh, formatting the result using the string and we are going to just say movement the next argument here will be the origin so where we want to put this text let's say we want to put this text on uh, 10 comma 20 coordinate and then the next uh, argument will be the font face so we are going to just say font face will be cv2 dot font font hershey simplex let's say so we are going to use uh, this font and uh, the next argument will be the font scale so let me just uh, uh, do this on the next line so font scale will be let's say one the next will be the color of the font so let's say the color will be 0 comma 0 comma 255 and then the last argument will be the thickness so let's say the thickness will be 3 and this code is going to put the rectangle around your moving uh, persons if the area of uh, that uh, contour is greater than 700 okay so let's run this code and let's see if it works or not so i'm going to just uh, run this code and you can see that status is movement because all the persons here are moving and you can see these rectangles which are drawn around the moving persons and this noise which we were uh, seeing in the previous result is also gone around the movement of uh, this rope okay so sometimes uh, this uh, uh, rectangle is drawn on the movement of the rope also so in this case you can also increase the expected area let's say we just want to find out the contours which are greater than 900 and we can uh, now you can see uh, these rectangles are drawn around uh, these moving persons with the area which have the uh, contour area more than 900 so you can remove these kind of uh, noises from uh, the frame uh, using this area so this was a very basic example how you can uh, detect the motion and track your uh, moving object inside your uh, video using python and opencv 
In this video, we are going to see how we can detect simple geometrical shapes using OpenCV. So to start with, I have this simple code which reads an image and then show it into a uh, I am show window. So let's uh, run this uh, simple code first of all and let's see what it does. So you can see I have this image which I'm loading into a uh, OpenCV window using I am show method and here we have uh, some shapes. So we have a pentagon, circle, rectangle, square, triangle and this uh, star shape, right? And let's say we want to detect using OpenCV which shape it is based upon uh, the geometrical shape and we want to write the name on top of this shape. So how we can achieve this, let's see using OpenCV. So as you can see, if the first step is to read an image and then in the second uh, line, I'm just converting this image into a grayscale mode image. So using this code, I'm just converting this uh, image into a grayscale mode. And in the next step, we are going to find out the threshold. So I'm going to just say underscore comma thresh is equal to cv2 dot threshold. So cv2 dot uh, threshold and we are going to pass our image which is a grayscale image which we have converted as a source and then the next two values are the threshold values and the maximum uh, value of uh, the threshold. So for now I am giving the threshold value to 40 because I know this will work but if you want to be more flexible, you can always use the track bar to find out uh, which threshold will work with your image. The second value is the maximum value of the threshold and the next value will be the type. So the type here will be CV2 dot thresh binary. So we are going to just say CV2 dot uh, thresh binary. Now in the next step, we are going to find out the contours. So contours we have already uh, seen in the last uh, videos how to find out the contours and what are contours. So for that I'm going to define two variables. One is contours variable, other is uh, the underscore variable because we don't need the second uh, uh, result. And then I'm going to just say cv2 dot find contours. The first argument here will be the thresholded image and then the second argument here will be the mode and third will be the method. So let's give these two values. So cv2 dot retr tree and the method will be cv2 dot uh, chain approx none. Okay. So let's uh, give uh, this method. So this is the simple procedure to find out the contours inside an image. Now in the next step, I'm going to iterate over all the contours. So I'm going to just say for uh, contour in contours. So we are going to iterate over all the contours. And then we are going to first of all use a method called cv2.approx polydp. So I'm going to just uh, declare a variable first of all. I'm going to just say approx is equal to cv2 dot this method which I have mentioned which is called approx poly dp. So this method approximates a polygonal curves with a specific precision. And the first argument which it takes is the curve. So our curve here will be the contour which we have found on the shape. The second argument here will be epsilon. So epsilon is the parameter specifying the approximation accuracy. So here what we are going to do is we are going to define epsilon is equal to 0 0.01 and then we are going to multiply this number by CV dot arc length so there is uh, this method called 
arc length and what does this arc length method do it calculates a contours parameter or a curve length so here in this arc length uh, parameter we are going to pass once again our uh, contour variable and the second argument here will be if it's closed or uh, the open contour so in our case we know that all the shapes which we want to detect are closed so we are going to just pass true here and the next argument in the approx poly dp uh, method will be uh, once again if it's a closed shape or the open shape so once again we are going to pass true here because all the shapes which we have are closed shapes now once we have this approximation we are just going to draw all the contours first of all so we are going to just say cv2 dot draw contours on which image on our original image so we are going to draw these contours on the original image and then we are going to pass the second argument and this will be our approximation so we can uh, in the square bracket this is uh, one other notation of uh, just uh, giving the number of contours as an argument to the draw contours uh, method so in the square brackets you can just pass uh, the approx the next parameter here will be the contour index so because we are iterating over all the contours that's why the index will always be zero because there will be only one contour which we are working at a time so this index will be zero the next argument here will be uh, the color so you can give any color here i am going to give uh, 0 comma 0 comma 0 let's say and then uh, the next will be the thickness so thickness i'm going to give here is 5 now the next step is to print out the shape so which shape it is we want to print on the shape which shape it is in uh, simple english let's say so for that we need to find out the coordinates on which we want to uh, print this text on the shape so we need to find out the x and y coordinates so we can find this x and y coordinates using uh, this approx uh, variable and we uh, can uh, just say approx dot revel so this is a, a method called ravel and then the first index here will be the x coordinate and in a same way we are going to just say approx dot ravel and on this method the second argument or the second index at index 1 will be the y coordinate so on these x and y coordinates we are going to print our uh, text now in the next step what we are going to do is so because this approx poly dp is going to approximate the number of polygonal curves so based upon the number of polygonal curves we can uh, just uh, approximate which shape it can be so if this approx length so let's uh, just find out the length of uh, this approx and if the length of this approx uh, variable is equal to 3 then we are going to say that it's a triangle because triangle can be made with three points so this length of approx variable if it's equal to 3 then we are going to say that it's a triangle because if the number of curves here are 3 then most probably it's going to be a triangle so if we know that this is a triangle then we can uh, easily uh, just uh, print or put text on uh, that image so we are going to just say put text and uh, the first variable here will be the image so we are going to put text on the image the second variable will be the text and we know that this will be a triangle so we are going to just say triangle here 
and then the next argument here will be the uh, coordinates on which you want to print this text. So we already found out the, the coordinates at which we want to put this text. The next argument here will be the font. So we are going to just say cv2 dot font Hershey complex and the next argument here will be the font scale. So let's say font scale will be 0 0.5 and the next argument here will be the color so you can give any color let's uh, say we just want to print this text in the black color itself so we are going to just say 0 comma 0 comma 0 then using this logic we can also say that if the length of this approx is equal to 4 then it can either be a square or a rectangle so here if the approx length is 4 then it can be a square or a rectangle but we don't know if it's a square or a rectangle so for now we can uh, just write that it's a rectangle and we are going to decide if it's a rectangle or a square in the next step but uh, let's define the other uh, if else conditions also so this was uh, l if similarly if number of approx points are 5 then we are going to say that it's a pentagon so we are going to print out uh, the pentagon text on the x and y coordinates and if the number of uh, points are 10 then we are going to just say that it's a star shape so we are going to just say star because in the star the number of points are 10 and then we are going to say that in any other condition so we are going to just say else and we are going to just remove this condition from here else in any other condition it's going to be a circle okay so if uh, approx length is 3 it's a triangle if approx length is 4 it's a rectangle or a square if 5 pentagon if it's 10 it's a star if it's uh, nothing out of all these options then it's a circle you can also find out uh, for example octagon or hexagon here if it's uh, 6 it's a hexagon if it's 8 it's a um, uh, octagon and so on right now let's uh, once again come to this step and in this step we uh, just know that if the number of points are 4 then it's a rectangle or a square but how can we find if it's a rectangle or a square so let's decide that now so what we are going to do for that is we are going to just say x comma y and then we are going to just say uh, w comma h for width and height and there is a method called cv2 dot bounding uh, rect which is going to uh, give us the x and y coordinates and the width and height of the rectangle right so we are going to apply that method so cv2 dot bounding rect on our approximate variable or approx variable which is going to give us the x and y uh, coordinate and uh, width and height now based upon the width and height we can find out the aspect ratio so we are going to just say aspect uh, ratio is equal to float first of all we need to typecast uh, the width into a float so we are going to just say a float w divided by height and this will be the aspect ratio of the rectangle now if this aspect ratio let's print out the aspect ratio also so we know what aspect ratio uh, we are getting using uh, the rectangle or the square and we are going to just say if this aspect ratio is between uh, 0.95 and 1.05 then it's going to be a square right because 
the width and height are almost same ok. So, we just give uh, some room for uh, some noises that is why we are providing here ideally it should be a 1 aspect ratio should be 1 uh, in order to have a square. But let us say uh, we are uh, just uh, approximating. So, we can just say if it is 0 0.95 if it is greater than 0 0.95 and if it is uh, less than. So, aspect ratio is less than or equal to 1.05 then it is a square ok. In ideal situation you might want to give here 1, but uh, in images uh, it can be a uh, little bit different. So, we are just giving this limit. So, if uh, the aspect ratio falls in this limit then it is going to be a uh, uh, square otherwise it is going to be a rectangle right and I am going to just say that if uh, this is the case then it is going to be a square otherwise so in the else condition so let us uh, give uh, this else condition here else it is going to be a rectangle so let us uh, print rectangle uh, in the put text ok. So, this is the code which we have uh, written and now finally what we are going to do we are going to just uh, show the shapes image including all the contours and the text which we have put on these shapes. So, let us run this code and let us see if it works or not. So, you can see now it is going to uh, work like this. So, all the contours are drawn across these shapes and you can see uh, the text on top of uh, these shapes. So, circle, rectangle, pentagon, star, triangle and squares. What you can also do here is you can uh, just change uh, this uh, text position using the x and y coordinates. So, uh, let us say I just want to change this y position to just little bit uh, top of the shape. So, I just added minus 5 offset here in the y axis and now you can see it goes little bit up this text right. So, now it is uh, much visible uh, this uh, text and you can see rectangle and square text is not going up because we have declared the local x and y here also. So, we can uh, just say x1 and y1 here and then run uh, this code once again and you can see this uh, rectangle and square text is also moved little bit up. So, I think the offset of 5 is ok to show these uh, text on top of uh, these shapes. So, this is how you can uh, detect simple geometric shapes using OpenCV. In this video, we will discuss about histograms in OpenCV. So, what is a histogram? So, you can consider histogram as a graph or a plot which gives you an overall idea about the intensity distribution of an image. So, let me give you uh, some examples and then I will be able to explain you better how histogram works and why uh, they are useful. So, to start with I have this example which uh, is a very normal example. Here I am creating 200 by 200 uh, pixel image using uh, numpy zeros which essentially mean that uh, we are going to get a 200 by 200 pixel image of uh, black uh, pixels. So, let me uh, just uh, just start this uh, example and you can see uh, this is the final result. So, all the pixels here in this image are black and the size is 200 by 200. Now, let us say we want to calculate or find out the histogram of this image. So, there are several ways of finding out histogram of an image. So, let us see uh, them one by one. 
So first of all, we are going to find out the histogram using the matplotlib uh, because uh, the plot using matplotlib you can draw easily. So let's uh, use that first of all. So for that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use plt because I have already imported uh, this matplotlib library as plt. So plt uh, dot hist, there is a function called plt dot hist, which calculates the histogram of an image. And because it's uh, just a grayscale image or it's just a black image, so it's easier to find out uh, the histogram. So you, what you uh, can do here is the first argument here will be uh, your image or your uh, source. So I'm going to just say image dot ravel. Okay, so there is a method called uh, ravel. The second argument here will be a maximum number of uh, pixel values. So I'm going to just say 256. The third argument here will be uh, the range. So the range will vary from uh, 0 to 256. Okay, so this is all you need to find out the histogram using the matplotlib and uh, you just need to show this plot in a matplotlib window. So you can just say uh, plt.show. So that's it. So let's uh, run this code and let's see what happens. So you see uh, this plot using matplotlib and also our original uh, image. So as uh, we have created the image of 200 by 200 uh, pixel of black pixels. So all the intensity of uh, this graph you can see is uh, zero. So you can see here 200 multiplied by 200 is equal to uh, 40,000. So these are the number of pixels. So on the y axis you will see total number of pixels and here the intensity. So intensity starts from uh, 0 to 256. So this graph is showing how many number of pixels inside an image which have this uh, pixel values. So in our example all the pixels inside this image have the pixel value 0. That's why this graph is like this. So all the 40,000 pixels inside the image have the pixel value 0. So you will get this type of uh, histograms. So once again, the histogram is a graph or a plot which gives you the overall idea about the intensity distribution of an image. Now histogram is just another way of understanding the image. By uh, looking at the histogram of an image, you can get the intuition about the contrast, brightness, intensity, distribution, etc. Now let's uh, improve this example which we have. So I'm going to just close uh, this uh, window and let's say I want to add some uh, white pixel also inside this image. So what I'm going to say is I'm going to just cv2 dot uh, rectangle. So I'm going to just add the rectangle inside uh, this image and the source here will be uh, the img variable then uh, where I want to introduce this rectangle. So I want to introduce this rectangle at uh, this point which will be let's say which starts from uh, 0, 100 and the second point here will be let's say 200, 200 okay. So this will be uh, 200. And the next value here will be uh, the color. So let's say we want to add the white pixels. So this will be 255, which will be the maximum value. And then the next argument will be the thickness. So I'm going to just say minus one, which will fill this rectangle inside this uh, image. So when I run uh, now this uh, code, you will see uh, this graph and this image. So you can see half of this image contains black pixels and half of this image contains the white pixels. And we already know that the size of this image is 200 by 200. That's why uh, here in the graph you will see 
20,000 pixels are uh, black, which means that uh, 20,000 pixels have the pixel value 0 and 20,000 pixels have the pixel value 255. That's why you see uh, this here. So you can see, you can easily find out the pixel intensity of an image easily using histograms. Now, next we are going to add some more pixels into this image. And this time what we are going to do is we are going to add the rectangle inside the same image. So let's say it goes from uh, 0, 0,50 to 100, 100. And the color here, we are going to uh, provide the pixel value of 127, let's say. Okay, so which is the half of uh, 0 and uh, 255 uh, approximately. So I'm going to run this uh, uh, example once again. And now you will see uh, this kind of image. So you can see half of the pixels here are white. That means 20,000 pixels have the pixel value of 255. So you can see here. Now around 15,000 pixels here in the half of this image have the pixel value of zero. That's why you can see uh, this line here. And we have added uh, the rectangle of uh, pixel value 127 also. So around, you can see around 5000 uh, pixels here have the pixel value of 127. So this is how uh, the histogram is going to uh, work. So let's use now the original image. So some kind of uh, image instead of uh, this black or white image. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, just once again uh, declare a variable and then I'm going to just say cv2 dot uh, I am read and uh, we are going to read some files. So let's say I have this lena dot jpg image. So I'm going to just uh, uh, read that. I hope the extension is uh, correct jpg. Uh, and we are going to read this image in the grayscale mode. So I'm going to just say zero here. And now I'm going to run uh, this uh, example once again. And you can see this Lena image is uh, loaded in the grayscale mode. And here is the histogram of this image. So these are all the pixel intensities inside uh, this image. So you can see from uh, this uh, graph that most number of uh, pixels contained inside this image have the pixel value around uh, 150. Now you can also find out the pixel intensity of uh, different colors. So till now we have been uh, just using uh, the grayscale mode or black or white uh, pixels but you can also uh, use the same histogram for the BGR values also. So let's see how we can do that. So what we are going to do is, let me uh, just remove uh, this code or I'm going to just leave it commented. And here I'm going to just say B comma G comma R. And there is a method we have already seen, which is called CV dot split, which is going to split your uh, image into BGR values. So we are going to just uh, give the source, which is our image. And then if you want to uh, show these BGR uh, values, you can uh, just show in uh, the I'm show window. So BGR and here also B G and R. And when you want to uh, show the histogram of uh, BGR values, then also you can use uh, matplotlib.hist uh, method. You just need to change this uh, source from image to uh, BGR. So B, uh, G, and R. Okay. So now what we are going to do is we are going to run our code and let's see what happens. So it's giving me uh, this error because 
I'm reading this image in the grayscale mode. So I'm going to uh, remove this extra parameter from I am read because we want to read uh, this uh, image in the color form and then only we will be able to get the BGR uh, channels, right? In the grayscale mode, there are no BGR channels. So I'm going to run this uh, script once again and let's see what happens. So you can uh, see uh, this histogram of blue channels and green channels and the red channels. And these are the images which are loaded in these different uh, channels. So this is the Im image which is loaded in the, in the blue channel and this is the green and this is the red channel. And you can see uh, the histogram of each channel differently using uh, matplotlib. So let me uh, just uh, close all these windows. Now there is a method in CV2 also, which is called calc hist, which is going to give you the histogram of an image. So for uh, that, what you can do is, I'm going to uh, just just uh, comment all uh, the this code because I just want to show how you can use the CV2 uh, calc hist. Uh, method okay so what you can do is you can use a method so let's say hist and then cv dot calc hist and this method takes few arguments so the first argument here will be the image so it's the source which you give but the only special thing is you just give uh, this image in the square brackets, okay? The second argument here is the channels. So it is the index of channels for which we calculate the histogram. So here, in our case, because we are going to uh, read the image in grayscale mode, we can uh, just uh, give the channel zero here. So for one channel, you can give a zero here. For different channel, you can give a zero, one, two uh, value. The next argument here is the image mask. So to uh, find histogram of full image, it is given as a none because our uh, because our image is loaded in the grayscale mode. So we can give here none. The next value is the hist size. So this hist size is the representation of bin counts and this is also given in the square bracket. So we are going to just say 256 here. The next argument is the range. So range will vary from zero to 256. So minimum and the maximum range of the X axis you can say so 256. And then we can just show this uh, hist or histogram inside the plt so plt dot plot method so dot plot and then we can just uh, give this uh, histogram value here okay so let's run this code and let's see what happens so you can see you get the histogram of uh, this image using the opencv calc hist method and what are the uses of uh, the histogram? So a histogram can tell you whether or not your image has been properly exposed. So when you take a digital image, uh, it's very useful. It, it can also tell you whether the lighting conditions were flat or harsh when you took that image. And using the histogram, you can also make the adjustments uh, which will work best for your uh, digital images. So this, uh, the usefulness of the histograms, we will see in the later videos. This was just the basics about the histograms uh, in OpenCV. In this video, we will discuss about template matching in OpenCV. So first of all, what is template matching? So template matching is a method of searching and finding the location of a template image inside a larger image. In OpenCV, uh, there is a method called match template for achieving this purpose. So let's get started and let's see an example about it.
So I have uh, this simple code which just loads this image and let's see uh, what this image looks like. So this is uh, the image and this is the messy image and what I want to do is I want to uh, match the face template which I have which uh, looks like this which is the smaller template which is also available inside this image. So this will act like a template for us and we will try to find this template inside this larger image. So let's get started and let's see how we can uh, search this template inside this larger image. So first of all what we need to do is obviously we need to uh, load this image and also load our template. So before uh, loading our template image I'm going to just convert my original image which is the larger image into the grayscale image. So I have declared uh, this variable gray underscore image and then I'm going to just say cv2 dot cvt color which is going to convert my image img and let's convert this image into cv2 dot color underscore bgr to gray. Now let's load our uh, face image which is called messy underscore face uh, dot jpg. So I'm going to just change this name messy underscore uh, face dot jpg and this will be our face image or you can also say this is our template and I'm going to also load this image as a grayscale image. So I'm going to just pass the second argument in the read method as zero which is going to load this messy image as a grayscale image. Now in the next line we will uh, simply uh, use this method which is called match template and we are going to uh, save it into some variables. So we can just say res is equal to cv2 dot match template which is this method which takes few argument first is our uh, image so I'm going to pass our grayscale image here the second argument here will be the template which we are trying to search inside uh, this uh, image so this will be our template the third is the method so the method can be uh, a several method there are several methods available for the template matching. So I want to show you these method for the template matching. So you can see a uh, type of template matching operations. And uh, there is separate formula involved in order to match that template inside that image. So, so for now we are going to use this method which is uh, tm underscore c cof underscore normed dot tm underscore c cof uh, normed which is this method now let's try to print this uh, result and let's see what uh, is the content inside uh, this result so i'm going to just print the content inside uh, this uh, result which we got so i'm going to run this code and this image is loaded but for now we are interested in uh, this uh, array matrix which you are seeing here so you can see when you observe these values carefully, you will see uh, all are relatively uh, smaller values. So uh, you can see uh, 0 0.2, 0 0.2 almost uh, every value is around uh, until 0 0.3. So the maximum value I can see here is 0 0.3. So let me just show this image once again and the, the template also. So what this result contains is uh, these all values and there will be one value which contains uh, the number for example 0.8 or uh, uh, the brightest point. Okay. So if here this uh, uh, matrix contains a value which have the value 1 
it is the bright test point and it will be there inside this image after applying this match template method which will be around this point at this point at which uh, this template matches so top left corner of this template so at the point at which this left top corner of this image will match inside this large image there will be a brightest point there and that brightest point will be reflected inside this uh, image in the form of uh, this uh, decimal number and all the other values will be slightly uh, darker darker values okay so that's how uh, this matrix from this matrix we will come to know the, the top left corner of uh, the template inside this larger image. So now how can we uh, filter out that value which is the brightest point inside this matrix. So all the points uh, you can see looks like uh, under 0 0.3 but there are some points here you can see three dots and there are thousands and thousands of uh, values uh, will be available here all the values are not printed okay so what we are going to do is we are going to try to find out the brightest point so this we can uh, find out with the numpy method uh, there is a method called where uh, using which we can find out uh, or filter out those values which are greater than certain number so I'm going to uh, first of all uh, declare a variable called uh, threshold is equal to I'm going to declare the value of threshold initially as 0 0.8 which will be a relatively brighter point uh, inside the matrix which we are getting uh, using this result uh, uh, variable right and then there is a method called uh, where numpy where so i'm going to declare once again loc variable and then np dot uh, where method and here we are going to pass our uh, result which we got and we are going to filter out using uh, this expression so this will be a boolean expression so i'm going to just say give me all those values which are greater than or equal to the threshold inside this result matrix okay so this where method is going to uh, just evaluate this expression each and every value will be evaluated and if this value inside the matrix is greater than 0 0.8 which is our threshold then it's going to uh, give those values to us. So let's print out those values after the filtering out of uh, most of the values. And let's uh, just print this LOC variable also. So I'm going to run this uh, code once again. And uh, you can see here, this is the matrix which we uh, got. So you can see this is the array which we got. So still, we can increase this threshold in order to find out only one point. So there are several points available here. So let's say I'm going to increase uh, this uh, value to 0 0.9 and let's run this code again. And you will see only two points, 85 and 220. So this is what we were expecting. So we wanted to find out uh, this point, which will be the brightest point uh, inside this uh, result matrix. So once we got the brightest point, uh, which will be around uh, here, which will be the top left corner, as I said, of this template, and it will be located somewhere here in the original image, then we can draw the rectangle uh, around this original image uh, same as the size of this template. So this will be uh, the easier task because we already know the width and height of uh, uh, this template. We already know how to get the width and height of uh, this template. And same size uh, rectangle, we just want to uh, draw on this original image. So let's see uh, how we can do this. So 
there is already uh, a method so I'm going to just declare two variables width and height and uh, you already know uh, the method so template dot shape is going to give you the shape of uh, your uh, image right so I'm going to just say template dot shape and then inside the square brackets we are going to just give uh, two colons and uh, minus one this means that we uh, want to get the column and the rows value in the reverse order so width and height that's why uh, I have given this minus uh, one index here now in the next step what we are going to do is uh, we are going to uh, just draw all the rectangles uh, where the template is is matched so uh, by seeing this uh, template image and the original image we know that there is only one messy face inside this image but let's say there are several number of uh, uh, matched templates inside our original image uh, for that we need to iterate over uh, the result which we got after applying the filter on the result so for that we are going to uh, just iterate over that result in our case as we know that there is only one point uh, so uh, we don't even uh, need to iterate over it but if there are multiple number of uh, matched templates then this uh, for loop will be uh, handy so for uh, pt in your uh, uh, loc variable so we are going to just say the zip which is going to iterate over this loc variable so asterisk loc and then we are going to find out the width and height here also so uh, we are just reversing the x-axis and y-axis right so we are going to just uh, say colon colon minus one here and then uh, once again inside this for loop so cv2 dot uh, rectangle method and the first argument here will be our original image because we want to draw the rectangle on the original image the second uh, argument will be the first point of the rectangle so the first point will be uh, this one pt which we are getting using the loc uh, uh, variable so as you all know that the first point here will be the top left corner of the rectangle and the second point here will be the bottom right corner so how can we get the bottom right corner we will get the bottom right corner using this pt uh, variable and then on the zeroth index we are going to just add the width comma on the first index so pt uh, square bracket first uh, we are going to add the height okay so essentially we uh, have just found out the width and height of our template and we are getting the second point using this addition on the first point width and height so it's going to give us this uh, bottom right uh, corner of uh, this template or this point so this is how we are getting uh, our two points to draw the rectangle now the third and fourth variable will be uh, simple which uh, are the color so you can just say 0 comma 0 comma 255 which will be the green color and the width let's say 2 here so we want to give the width 2 here so let's run this code and let's see what happens so I'm going to run this code and you can see uh, this red uh, rectangle is drawn on the face of the messy and you can uh, here also see this rectangle will match our template image so whatever uh, image is inside this rectangle will be uh, exactly same as our template and once again you can see the result uh, let me explain uh, this code once again so if this point this threshold will be uh, uh, point zero eight let's say 
in the case of 0 0.09 threshold we are only getting two values uh, this 85 and 220 right that's why we are seeing the clear rectangle here when we uh, are uh, giving the th threshold 0 0.8 here let's see what happens so i'm going to run this code once again you can see there will be uh, this rectangle but it will be much thicker why it's uh, much thicker because we are getting several number of values 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 so we are getting the nine points on the x-axis and the y-axis so this for loop will iterate nine times and this rectangle will be drawn nine times on the image and that's why this uh, rectangle is much thicker let's uh, uh, just change this value to 0.9 once again and you will see this rectangle is uh, you know the single rectangle that's why it's uh, much thinner right now uh, when you give this value let's say we give the value 0 0.3 so most of the point as you can see here have the value 0 0.3 and when we run this code you will see so many rectangles here so that's why this thresholding is essential for us to find out the brightest point or the value which have the maximum uh, value right so that's why we were filtering out uh, this these points and finding out uh, the values more than uh, 0 0.9 threshold and uh, about the methods so let's uh, try different methods so let's try to uh, give different uh, methods here these two methods uh, behave a little bit differently so uh, we can uh, start with uh, this uh, tmcorr normed and uh, we can apply it here and it's going to give us uh, this kind of uh, result you can see we are getting uh, several uh, points here after filtering so uh, let's try to uh, increase this value to 0 0.95 and let's uh, rerun this code and let's see what happens so now you are getting uh, four values uh, you can uh, also filter that out let's say 0 0.99 now let's see what happens so now you are getting only two values okay so you need to uh, try to change this value to the maximum point so try to change this value and you will uh, get uh, this kind of uh, rectangle only one rectangle so every method is going to give you different uh, uh, result and that's why you need to uh, try all the result not all the result will give you the perfect uh, rectangle or template matching so you need to try different methods uh, on your uh, images so this is how you can uh, do template matching in OpenCV in this video we will understand the concept behind half transform so first of all what is half transform so half transform is a popular technique to detect any shape if you can represent that shape in a mathematical form half transform can detect the shape even if it is broken or distorted a little bit now this explanation might seem a little bit confusing so let me explain it by an example so let's say you have an image of this road and you want to detect these lane lines in uh, this road image so the first step in order to detect these lane lines in this road is to find the edge pixels using Kenny edge detection or any other edge detection method now after you found out the edges using any edge detection method you want a geometrical uh, representation of that edge and in order to find out the geometrical representation for example you want to find out the slope of uh, this edge or its uh, intercept you can use half transform to uh, represent these uh, pixels or edges uh, in the mathematical or geometrical uh, form so after you find out the edges uh, using any edge detector 
you just have the sequence of uh, pixels so you can uh, loop through all the pixels and somehow figure out the slope and intercepts but it's a very difficult task so we want some mechanism that gives more weightage to pixels that are already in line and this is what we can achieve using half transform so let's begin and let's start with the lines so a line in the image can be represented by two coordinate systems first is using the cartesian coordinate system uh, and using this equation you can represent a line which is y is equal to mx plus c and you can also represent this uh, line using polar coordinate system using this equation which is x cos theta plus y sin theta is equal to r or rho sometimes so let's start with uh, this equation first which is a cartesian coordinate system equation which is y is equal to m x plus c so uh, when you represent a line in x and y coordinates which is also called the x y space uh, this equation looks like this so y is equal to m x plus c where m is the slope of the line and c is the intercept of this line so if you know the values of m and c you can uh, represent this line in the x and y coordinates now in half transform you can represent this line in other form also and this is called the mc space or the half space so using this equation when you take m on this axis and c on this vertical axis then this is called the mc space so earlier we have represented this line in the xy space and now we are saying that we want to represent this using the mc coordinate where m is on the horizontal line and c is on the vertical line so when you represent this simple line in the mc space or the half space it can be represented as a point so this line can be represented as a point so we all know that a line is a collection of points and managing the collection of points is tougher than managing a single point so if you want to uh, manage a collection of point and if you were to manage a single point which will you prefer and an obvious answer will be to manage the single point and this is what this mc space is doing it's representing a line in the form of a point in mc space or the half space and the opposite of this concept is also possible so if you can represent a point using uh, these coordinate in the x y space then it can be represented as a line in the mc space okay and the formula now will turn into uh, this equation which is c is equal to minus x a m plus y a right so you can represent a point and if you have the x and y coordinate in the mc space you can represent this as a line and this will be the equation where x will be the slope now and y will be the intercept earlier m was the slope and c was the intercept but when you uh, just transform or uh, just represent this point into mc space then your x becomes or minus x becomes the slope and y becomes the intercept so how does these concepts are going to help us so the half transform is all about doing what we have learned converting points in the x y space to the lines in the mc space or the half space so for example you can see four points 1 2 3 4 which are joined by a line right so you can represent these four points and you can join all these four points and it's a representation of a line and here slope is equal to m and intercept is equal to c in the xy space 
the same line you can represent in the MC space uh, using these four lines. Okay, so every point is a line in the MC space and you see the intersection point here which is on the MC coordinate. So you have taken an edge detected image and for every point that is a non-black point you draw lines in the MC space and obviously when you draw these lines these lines will intersect with uh, each other and these intersections mark are the parameter of a line okay so in the MC space you can represent each and every point as a line and they will intersect on a single point and now this intersection point can be used to uh, draw a line. So this was the representation of uh, points in a line using MC space using a Cartesian coordinate system. Now let's apply the same concepts which we have learned using the Cartesian coordinate system uh, into a polar coordinate system. So as we all know that in the polar coordinate system, we can uh, represent a line using this equation also, which is r is equal to x multiplied by cos theta plus y multiplied by sine theta. Or in other form, you can also represent this uh, equation like this, where y is equal to minus cos theta by sine theta multiplied by x plus r divided by sine theta. So this is your xy space where line can be represented like this and we are going to transform or represent this line using this equation into the r theta space or the half space. Okay, so this line using this equation can also be represented as a point in r theta or the half space like this. So let's take an example about this. So as I said, the equation was r is equal to x multiplied by cos theta plus y multiplied by sine theta, where this theta is the angle of the line and r is the distance from the origin to the line. So let's say we uh, want to represent a point which is from xy space into a half space into r theta space. So we give the values of uh, x0 and y0 which will be uh, the first point. We can represent this uh, point in the form of line in the half space or the r theta space uh, in this formation which looks like a sine curve using this equation. So this is for the one point representation in xy space to a line representation in the half space. So let's say you have uh, multiple points. So we take three points, then uh, it's going to look like this. So let's say x0 is equal to 8 and y0 is equal to 6, x1 is equal to 4, y1 is equal to 9, and x2 is equal to 12, and y2 is equal to uh, 3. So we have three points in the xy uh, space they can be represented in the half space using three lines. And as we have seen in the Cartesian coordinate system, these points can be represented in uh, these lines in the half space in the polar coordinate system also using these uh, curved line. And this intersection is going to represent a line in the half space. So which representation we are going to use in order to use the half transform. So this equation is not able to represent the vertical lines. That's why uh, generally we use this equation or a polar coordinate system in order to use half transform. So the half transform algorithm involves these four important steps. In the first step, edge detection is done using Kenny edge detector or any edge detection method. In the second step, mapping of the edge points to the half space is done and uh, all these edge points are stored 
in an accumulator and the third step interpretation of accumulator to yield lines of infinite length is done and this interpretation can be done by thresholding or any other constraint the fourth step involves the conversion of infinite line to finite lines now opencv implements two kind of half line transforms the first is the standard half transform which is done using half lines method the second type is the probabilistic half line transform which is done by half lines p method so this is the half lines method and this is the half lines p method in the last video we have seen a brief theory introduction about half line transform so i have told you that opencv implements two kind of half line transforms one is a standard half line transform using half lines method and the second is the probabilistic half line transform using half lines capital p method so we are going to use the half line method in this video and see how we can use this half line method to detect the lines inside an image using half transform now i also told you that there are four steps associated with half transform so the first step was the edge detection step using any uh, edge detection method preferably kenny edge detection the second uh, step is the mapping of edge points to the half space and store these edge point to an accumulator the third step was the interpretation of accumulator to yield lines of infinite length and the fourth step was the conversion of these lines to the finite lines so let's say we have this image of uh, this sudoku.png and you can see all these lines here which we want to detect so this is the line and this is the line so all these lines we want to detect using the half line tra transform so i have already written this code so i'm going to go step by step uh, to explain how this code works so in the first step you just need to import the normal cv2 and the numpy as np then here i'm just reading this uh, image using i'm read method in the next step i'm uh, converting this image into a gray scale image and storing it into this variable which is gray because for kenny edge detection it's uh, preferred to have gray scale images rather than your normal colored images now in the next step we are applying the kenny edge detection method on this gray scale image so here this cv2.kenny method takes uh, these arguments first argument is the image second and third argument is the first threshold and the second threshold so i'm giving the first threshold as 50 and the second threshold here as uh, 150 and the fourth argument here i'm giving aperture size is equal to 3 now in the next step i'm using this half lines method this is the normal half transform method which is implemented in opencv now this half line method takes few argument the first argument is the image so we are just uh, just passing this edge detected image to the first argument of this half lines uh, method the second argument here is the row value this row value is the distance resolution of the accumulator in pixels normally it's taken as one the third value is the theta value which is the angle resolution of accumulator in radians so for that we are uh, just using numpy so np dot pi divided by 180 so this is also uh, typical in this method and the next argument here is the accumulator threshold parameter so what does this mean it's a threshold so only those lines are returned that get enough vote that means that those lines will be returned which have threshold greater than 
this value. So starting value I have taken here as 200 as threshold. So now this half lines method is going to return the output vector of lines. Now I have explained you how polar coordinate works for the half transform in the last video. So these uh, lines will be in the polar coordinate. So each line is represented by two or three element vectors, either rho and theta or rho, theta and votes. So as you can see, this is the output vector of lines. So I'm going to iterate over each and every uh, line vector. And what it gives is the first element of this uh, line is going to give you uh, these two values rho comma theta it's going to give you rho comma theta or rho comma theta comma vote right so right now i'm uh, using just two uh, parameters here rho comma theta so rho is the distance from the coordinate 0 comma 0 which is the top left corner of the image and the theta is the line rotation angle in radians. So all this uh, rho and theta I have explained you in the last video and we have seen how we can represent these uh, rho and theta values in the half space. So first of all what we are going to do is once we get the rho and theta value is we are going to uh, just get the cos theta value and the sine theta value because we want to convert these polar coordinates into the normal Cartesian coordinates for the line method. Because this line method, as you uh, can imagine, takes uh, these coordinates, right, which are the Cartesian coordinates. So this is the point one parameter and this is the point two parameter. So x1, y1 and x2, y2. So first of all, we are just getting the cos theta value and theta here is this theta. So cos theta we are just assigning to A and the sine theta value we are just assigning to B. And we are just uh, multiplying this A to the rho. So this will give us the x0 value and the y0 uh, value when you multiply B uh, by rho. So this rho is this rho value. So this x0 and y0 is going to give you the origin which is uh, 0 comma 0 or top left corner of the image. But we want the lines, not the top left corner of the image. So how we can get these x1 and y1 coordinate and x2 and y2 coordinate, uh, this is uh, given in this equation. Once you get your x0 and y0 value, you can get the value of uh, x1 and y1 coordinate using uh, this equation. So you just need to typecast uh, everything into uh, integer. So this equation x1 value stores the rounded off value of uh, rho as I have shown here. So this r represent rho. So rho multiplied by cos theta cos theta we have already uh, taken in the a variable. So we are essentially here multiplying the rho multiplied by cos theta minus 1000 multiplied by sine theta. Sine theta value is the value of the b, right? So x0 plus 1000 multiplied by minus b here, okay? Y1 we get using this equation. So y1 is equal to int uh, in the bracket uh, y0 plus 1000 multiplied by a, which is essentially this equation, which is rho multiplied by sine theta plus 1000 multiplied by cos theta. So these two values are going to give you the first coordinates. And similarly, we are going to get the x2 and y2 coordinate using these two equations. So here everything is same, just this minus is uh, new, right? So in this equation, you just need to replace a plus by minus and you get the x2 value. Same you have to do in the case of uh, y2. So in this equation, if you just replace this plus by minus, 
you will get the y2 value and we have already seen how to use the cv2.line method it takes a few argument as you uh, can see here first is the image so image is our original image second is the x1 and y1 coordinate which is the first point comma the second point so as you already know that a line is a collection of point so you need at least two point to create a line right so this is the coordinates of the first point and this is the coordinates of the second point the next argument here is the color so a color i have taken uh, simply 0 comma 0 comma 255 and the last parameter here is the thickness of the line which i have taken 2 here and the next line of code uh, you already uh, know i think so after this line we come out of the loop and we are just uh, plotting all the lines using this loop on the original image and once we uh, get all these lines on the original image we are just uh, showing it using i am show method and uh, at the last we are just destroying uh, our window once we are done with the image so let's uh, run this uh, code and let's see what happens so i'm going to run this code and you can see all these lines are plotted here let's see uh, the kenny edge detected uh, image also so i'm going to just uh, after the kenny edge detection i'm going to once again uh, add this uh, i'm show method to show the kenny edge detected uh, image also so you can see here this is the kenny edge detected image all the edges are detected and based upon uh, all these uh, lines which are detected here these lines are drawn but the problem here is these lines are of infinite length so there is no end to these lines these these lines just go from the start or the corner of the image to the other corner of the image so you can see they start from here and go uh, to the next corner they don't just uh, stop here so in this uh, half transform you uh, see that even for the line with two argument it takes a lot of computation and we don't even get the correct result so this problem can be uh, solved using the other method which is implemented using this half line p method which is the probabilistic half line transform which i'm going to show you in the next video so how we can get the better result using half line p method we are going to see in the next video in the last video we have seen how to use standard half transform using half lines method in opencv now in this video we are going to see how to use probabilistic half line transform using a method called half lines capital p method in opencv so let's go to our editor and this was the code we have written last time and we have used half lines method for detecting lines inside this image which was the sudoku image so let's run this uh, example really fast to see what was the result uh, which we got last time so this was the result which we got last time and uh, the problem with this result is you can see these lines just go from one end to the other end and in this kind of half transform uh, you will be able to see uh, that even for the lines which have uh, two argument it takes a lot of uh, computation so in opencv there is also a method called uh, half lines capital p which stands for probabilistic half lines transform and this probabilistic half line transform is an optimization of the normal half transform which we have uh, seen in the last video so let me close this uh, example and let's open the example which we are going to see in this video and you can see in this uh, example we have uh, used this half lines capital p method so when we use this half lines capital p method it doesn't take all the points into consideration 
instead it takes only the random subset of the points which is sufficient for the line detection so let's go through this code from the top uh, to the end so as you can see i have imported these two uh, packages cv2 and numpy as np and then i'm reading this uh, image so doku using i'm read method and then i'm converting this image to the grayscale image using cvt color method in cv2 now the next step is to find out the edges of uh, the images this we have also seen in the last video so until here everything is same so once we got the edge detected image using kenny edge detection instead of using the half lines method we are now using this half lines uh, capital p method and it takes few arguments the first argument is your edge detected image the second argument is the row which is the distance resolution of the accumulator in pixels the third argument is the theta value which we have taken np.pi divided by 180 which is the angle resolution of the accumulator in radians the next value is the threshold so right now we have taken this threshold as 100 and this threshold is the accumulator threshold parameter which means that only those lines are returned that get enough vote that means greater than the threshold value the extra two arg argument here are a little bit different from the half lines method so you can see all uh, these arguments are uh, almost same these four arguments but there are two extra uh, arguments here or parameter here which we need to provide so the first parameter here is the min line length and this we have taken 100 so this min line length is the minimum length of the line which means that line segments shorter than this length which is 100 in our case will be rejected the next argument is the maximum line gap and it is the maximum allowed gap between the line segments to treat them as a single line so these are the two extra argument we have taken and this half lines capital p method is going to return again the output vector of the lines but the difference between uh, this uh, return value from uh, half line p method and the half lines method is you can see here this line at index 0 is going to directly give you the values of x1 y1 and x2 y2 which are the two points which uh, we will be able to join and we will be able to draw the line using cv2.line method in the last video i have shown you that you have to do so much calculation in order to find this x1 y1 and x2 y2 and this probabilistic half line transform method is going to uh, do our job easy and it's going to directly give us these four values so you don't need to do anything you just need to pass these x1 y1 and x2 y2 value to the cv2.line method so cv2.line method is going to take uh, the first argument which is the image and then the second argument is the point one coordinate which is x1 and y1 which we got from the line uh, variable at index 0 and the third parameter here is the point 2 which are the coordinate of the point 2 which is here x2 and y2 the next argument here is the color which we have taken right now 0 comma 2 0 and the last parameter here is the thickness of the line so we have taken uh, two here and the next three line are going to just show this image first of all uh, all these lines uh, which we uh, found out are drawn on the image this image which is the original image and then we are just showing uh, this image after drawing all the lines which we got using half lines uh, p method on the original image and then we are uh, just loading this image using this uh, 
I'm show method and then after we are done we are just destroying all the windows so let's see what result we get after uh, this uh, script is run so I'm going to run this script and this is the canny edge detected image and this is the image you got uh, when you apply this half lines p uh, method on your canny edge detected image so you can see uh, these lines are no longer going to the end to end these are uh, more uh, you know accurately detecting all the lines which are there in this sudoku uh, image you can see some lines are broken here so that's why these lines are uh, not even uh, uh, you know drawn because they are not even detected by canny edge detection so this one or this one are not detected by canny edge detection so that's why these lines are not drawn so let me show you these results side by side so this was the result which we got after applying the half line uh, transform method which is half lines on our canny edge detected image and you can see all these lines here and uh, this is the result which we uh, got after applying half lines p method which is the probabilistic half uh, line transform so these two methods are available in OpenCV to detect these uh, lines in an image now let's go back to our uh, script and here instead of uh, this image which is the sudoku.png image i have one more image which is called uh, road.jpg and this is the image which uh, contains a road and inside this uh, road we have some lane lines so you can see uh, this result now here which is the road and these are the lane lines which are detected using this half lines p method so in case of uh, lane line detection you can use this half line p method but you need to decide your roi or region of interest uh, because you can see some lines are detected here 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 and here so you just need to uh, uh, you know define your line of uh, interest region and you will be able to detect all the lines or lane lines on the road so maybe in the next video we are going to uh, see how we can uh, detect these lane lines on the road accurately without these noises which we are seeing here uh, on the other uh, part of the image so we just need to uh, detect these lane lines and nothing more and we will uh, do the same on a video so on the video in which these lane lines are there and we just need to continuously detect these lane lines so in the case of let's say self-driving car you need to uh, detect these lane lines we are going to see how to detect these lane lines in the last videos we have learned some important concepts in OpenCV now in this video and the next few coming videos I'm going to create a simple project which uses most of these concepts which we have learned in the previous videos so what we are going to do is we are going to create a very simple lane detection system so first of all we will start with a still image you can see uh, there is an image which contains uh, this road and this road contains lanes so what we want to achieve is we want to detect these lanes on which our vehicle is traveling so first of all we will do this with this image and gradually we will move towards the video frames so first of all we will see how to detect these lanes in this image and then we will see how to detect these lanes in the moving video so let's get started so I have created this new project in my PyCharm IDE you can use any other editor of your choice and first of all obviously you just need to install OpenCV Python package and matplotlib package once you have done that I will create a new 
file here so I'm going to just right click here and create a new file and I'm going to name this file as detector.py file so here we are going to import a few uh, packages for example matplotlib so matplotlib.pyplot uh, as plt so let's say as plt also we are going to import the cv2 package and we are going to import numpy so import numpy as np in the next uh, section what we are going to do is we are going to simply uh, load an image so i'm going to create an image variable so image is equal to cv2 dot im read and we are going to uh, read our image which is the road image so road dot jpg now in the next line we are going to convert this image into the rgb format because we are going to load this image using matplotlib so i'm going to just write once again image so i'm going to overwrite this image variable with the converted image so cv2 dot cvt color and the source is our uh, image so this is the variable and then cv2 dot color from uh, bgr to rgb right so this is what we want to use now in the next line what we want to do is we want to load our image using uh, plt dot im show method and at last we are going to just say plt dot show so this is how we are going to just uh, load our image so i'm going to right click on uh, this file and then uh, run uh, this uh, script and you can see this road.jpg image is loaded now on this plot you also see uh, these values and one thing to observe here is horizontally these values goes from 0 to 1200 something and vertically normally in the graphs you will see that values increases from the bottom to top but in matplotlib this value goes from top to bottom right so zero is at the top and then the maximum value will be at uh, the bottom so this is uh, one thing to note because we are going to define our region of interest and that will be based upon uh, these values now in the next step we want to define our region of interest so once again uh, let me just run this uh, code once again and one thing to notice here is this lane in which our vehicle is traveling is parallel so there are two parallel lines and eventually they are going to merge here right so all the lanes on which the vehicle travels have the same pattern so this lane and this lane are parallel to each other and they are going to merge at some point so it's not merging but it seems to be merging at some point so we can define our region of interest from this point to this point and from this point to this point so this region of interest will be the triangle so this region of interest we are going to define for our vehicle will mask any other uh, uh, obstruction for example this is also one lane line for us it's not important because this is the other side of the lane so here uh, the vehicle will come in the opposite direction so this is our region of interest so it will mask out uh, this lane line or any other lines or uh, distortions which we have in this picture we are going to just mask them and we are going to just concentrate on this triangle so let's do this first so first of all we are going to find out the shape of the image so i'm going to just uh, print and then we are going to just say image dot shape and also we are going to uh, just define the height and width of the image so i'm going to uh, just say okay so let's print this value and let's see what happens 
so what's at 0 and what's at 1 so you can see it prints 704 as our uh, height and 1279 as the width so this is what I am uh, just uh, taking from this uh, image shape method so it's going to return this kind of tuple so at 0th index there will be height and at the first index there will be uh, the width and as I said it starts from 0 to uh, 704 from top to bottom and uh, horizontally it goes from 0 to uh, 1279 from the left hand side to the right hand side right so once we have the width and height we can uh, define our region of interest so we are going to uh, define a variable called uh, region of interest vertices and here we are going to provide some values so we are going to provide three points which will be the three points of our region of interest so as i said that our region of interest we want is this point which is the left bottom corner this point which is the right bottom corner and somewhere in the middle of this image so here so in the image because the vertical uh, height starts from zero so i'm going to just say zero comma height and the second point will be the half of the width and half of the height which will be the center of the image so i'm going to just say width divided by two comma height divided by uh, two and this will be inside these uh, parentheses and the third point will be the next corner so this will be width and then the height so let's try to see these points in our uh, matplotlib uh, window so the first point here is 0 comma uh, 704 which is this point the second point is somewhere here which is the half of the height and half of the width and the third point will be here which is width comma height which is 700 comma 1279 which is this one right so this will be our region of interest now we are going to define one function to mask every other thing other than our region of interest so i will just uh, define this function def region of interest and this is going to take two parameter first will be the image and second will be the vertices so vertices and inside this function let me just uh, minimize this terminal also so you can see the function so inside this function in the first step we are going to define a blank matrix that matches the image height and the width so this will be the easy step we are going to define a variable called uh, mask and we are going to use np dot uh, zeros like method which uh, is going to take uh, one parameter which will be our image matrix now in the next step we are going to just uh, retrieve the number of color channels from the image this will be uh, the easy step also so channel count and then we are going to just say image dot shape and at the second index we are going to find out the channel because we have seen that image dot shape is uh, going to give you uh, three values height width and the channel count so this channel count is coming from uh, this index now in the next step what we are going to do is we are going to create a match color with the same color channel counts so i'm going to just say match underscore mask underscore color this will be our variable name and then we are going to just take 255 comma and then multiply it by the uh, channel count so let's multiply it by the channel count so this is going to create a match color with the same color channel counts now in the next step we are going to fill inside the polygon using the fill poly method because we have our region of interest and we want to mask every other thing other than our region of interest so we are going to just say cv2 dot fill poly which is going to take few arguments first will be our mask 
Second will be the vertices which we are providing using uh, the second argument and the third argument will be our match mask color variable. So we are going to pass this variable as the third argument. And in the next step, we are going to just return the image only where the mask pixel matches. So I'm going to just say masked underscore image is equal to CV2 dot bitwise and. So we are going to just apply bitwise and using uh, this uh, bitwise and method. And the first uh, argument here will be the image and the second argument is the mask which we got using this uh, zeros like method right and in the last step we are going to just return this so i'm going to just write return this masked image and that's it so we are going to just uh, apply our region of interest on the image using this method and then we are going to just get our image which contains uh, region of interest and any other thing will be masked. So now it's time to use this method. So we are going to just use this method using uh, this uh, variable. I'm going to just define a variable called, uh, let's say, cropped image or masked image, whatever you want to write here. So let's say cropped uh, underscore image and then we are going to just use this function which is a region of interest function which takes this argument so because we have already uh, read our uh, image in the image variable we are going to pass uh, this as the first argument and the vertices is simply our region of interest variable so this region of interest uh, variable we are going to pass using numpy dot array method and let's uh, split this line so we will be able to see what I'm doing inside uh, this np.array method. So first of all, uh, the first argument will be our region of interest uh, variable, which is this one, region of interest vertices. So in the square bracket, we are going to just pass uh, region of interest vertices. And the second argument here will be np.int. 32 so np dot int 32 and now we are going to just uh, show this image using our matplotlib window so let's run this code and let's see what happens when it runs and there is a problem here so let's see what the problem is so you can see uh, this problem is coming from this line and most probably this region of interest uh, has some problem so you can see we have passed this first element as the tuple second element as the tuple and the third element also we need to pass as a tuple and that's why it's giving us uh, the problem so i have just fixed it and let's see what happens when we run this code again and you can see our uh, image is now masked with our region of interest so we have defined our region of interest uh, from this point to this point to this point. So now we have only this region of interest. So we will be able to easily find out this lane line and this lane line inside our region of interest and any other distraction will be masked now, right? So this is the first step which we have achieved, which is masking our image and just applying our region of interest on the image. In the next step, we are going to uh, see how we can uh, apply the edge detection and find out the lane lines on uh, the image. In the last video, we have started our simple project of detecting lane lines on the road using OpenCV. And we came to the point where we were able to define our region of interest and our result was looking like this. So let me run this uh, project. So we have defined this region of interest and now the only thing which remains here is to detect these lane lines. So we will uh, once again uh, go to the next step and the next step will be to find out the edges and then we are going to apply half line transform to draw the lines. 
So first thing first, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just move this uh, region of interest function, which we have created in the last video on the top of uh, this uh, script. So we can see uh, this other code clearly, this code which we have written. So we have uh, this region of interest uh, function which we have created. Then uh, we have uh, just created uh, this region of interest variable and then we just uh, used our region of interest function using this region of interest vertices variable. So the next step as I said is to find out the edges and for that we need to first convert our image into a grayscale image. So I'm going to just say a gray image and then we all know how to find out the gray uh, scale image out of uh, an image. So we just need to write CVT color and the source is our cropped image. So we are going to pass the, our cropped image and then we are going to just convert it into a grayscale image using cv2 dot color underscore rgb2 gray so let's do this so once we got our grayscale image we can apply canny edge detection on this image so i'm going to just uh, write canny image and then i'm going to just say cv2 dot uh, Kenny, which is uh, the function which we want to use, which takes few parameter. First parameter will be our uh, grayscale image. The second parameter will be the first threshold and the second threshold. So generally, uh, we are going to take here 100 as the first threshold and 200 as the second threshold. Now, in the next step, we are going to just uh, display this image on our matplotlib window and let's see what happens once uh, we apply this canny edge detection method on the image so now you can see this result which detects all the edges and here you can see the lane line edges are detected but there is one more thing here which is the edges of our region of interest are also detected so how to solve this how to remove these edges because these edges doesn't interest us the interesting uh, edges here in this image uh, for us are these edges which are of the lanes road lanes right so to solve this problem we can apply this canny edge detection before we uh, find out the region of interest. So I'm going to just copy uh, this code and paste it just before we uh, apply this region of interest method which we have created in the last video. So now in our Kenny edge detection, uh, we will pass the gray scale image, but here instead of uh, this uh, uh, cropped image, which we were getting in the last step from uh, this variable, we directly are going to pass our image, which we have read using the I am read method, right? So let me just uh, remove all these line breaks. So you will be able to see the code at once. So here you can see I have directly passed now uh, this uh, image variable to the CVT color method. So we get the grayscale image of the original image and then we apply the Kenny uh, edge detection on the original image and then we are applying the region of interest method which we have created in the last video. Now because uh, we are applying uh, this uh, uh, region of interest method on the grayscale image or the edge detected image therefore we don't uh, need this channel here. So we can comment out this code, which was kind of counting out uh, the number of channels. And for uh, the grayscale image and the Kenny uh, as detected the image, we just take this match mask color as 255 because it's only one color, right? We don't uh, need any uh, color channels here because we are just passing the grayscale image which has only one color. So that's why we don't need any uh, channel because there will be only one channel. And that's why I have commented this code and uh, the value of uh, the match mask color will be 255 now. 
Once you do that, let's try to run uh, this code and let's see what happens. Uh, once again, we need to load uh, the cropped image, not the Kenny image. So just uh, replace this uh, variable here in the I am show uh, method and let's run this code once again. So you can see now uh, there is some uh, mistake here because we were expecting the edge detected image and we are getting this image. So let's see what the problem is. So the problem I see here is because we have applied this region of interest on the original image, which we don't want now. We want to apply this uh, uh, region of interest on the Kenny edge detected image. So we have to pass as the first variable of the region of interest method, this Kenny uh, edge detected image, not the original image, right? So once again, uh, for you, you can see this code region of interest method and all this code at our one glance. Let's run the code and let's see what happens. So now we get the better result. So we uh, have these edges which are detected by the Kenny edge detection for only the lane lines inside our region of interest. And now it will be easier to draw the lines on these edges which we have detected. So the next step will be to draw the lines on these edges using the half line transform. So we have in the previous videos have already seen how to use the half line transform. So I'm not going to go into the details. So let's uh, just directly jump into uh, using that half line transform. So what we are going to do is in the next line, after we have uh, got our uh, cropped image, we are going to just uh, define a variable called uh, lines and we are going to use this half line transform, probabilistic half line tra transform method. So here cv2 dot uh, half line transform and this will be this method which takes few argument first argument will be the image so i'm going to pass this uh, cropped image here the second argument here will be the value of row so let's uh, provide uh, this uh, row value variable value which will be uh, six in our case then in the next parameter we have to pass the value of theta and theta will be uh, equal to np dot uh, pi which is the method inside the numpy library so np dot uh, pi divided by 60 so i'm going to pass here divided by 60 then the next parameter here will be the threshold so the threshold value we are going to provide here will be 160 the next parameter here will be uh, lines which is equal to none by default so i'm going to uh, provide this uh, variable lines is equal to and then uh, we are going to pass the empty uh, numpy array so i'm going to just say uh, numpy and p dot array and then we are going to just pass the blank uh, square bracket here the next two parameters will be the min line length so let's pro provide this uh, min line length and let's say we want uh, 40 as the minimum line length and the max line gap so let's provide that also max line gap and this will be uh, let's say initial value for that will be 25 so now after applying this half line transform you know that it's going to return the line vector of uh, all the lines which are detected inside our image which we have provided as the source here so if you don't know what are these parameters which I'm using here. You can see my uh, last videos about uh, probabilistic half line transform and you will be able to uh, know what they actually mean. Now, once we got our line uh, vectors, then we can draw uh, the lines easily. And for that, we are going to define our uh, next function, which is to draw the lines. So I'm going to just define this function. Uh, with the name uh, draw the lines for example and it's going to take few parameters so let's pass these parameters first parameter will be the image or uh, the original image 
the second parameter will be the line vectors which we have uh, fi found out and uh, that's it so there are these two uh, parameters we are going to pass here now uh, inside this uh, function what we are going to do is we are going to first of all uh, copy our image so i'm going to just say img is equal to np dot copy and uh, then we are going to just make a copy of uh, the image variable which we are providing and then or you can uh, write here copy image whatever i'm just uh, just uh, uh, reassigning this copied uh, image to the same variable but you can define a new uh, variable here for the copied image also now in the next line we are going to create a blank image that matches the original image size so the dimension should be uh, equal so for this we can uh, just say uh, line image and then we are going to just say np dot zeros inside these parentheses we are going to uh, provide the shape of our image right so you can uh, provide the shape of our image using the image variable so first of all it's going to take the uh, height and then the width and then the number of channels so because we know that this is a colored image which we are uh, working with so we are going to just say img dot uh, shape and we all know that the zeroth uh, index parameter here will be the height the second parameter img dot shape the value at the first index will be the width and the number of channel for the colored image are always three so we are going to provide the third parameter as three here so this is in the form of tuple i'm providing and the next parameter here will be the data type or d type so let's uh, provide that d type is equal to numpy dot u int 8 okay so u int 8 not un int 8 u int 8 so this will be uh, the second uh, parameter so once we have uh, this image which is exactly same as the size of our original image we are uh, going to loop around these line vectors and then we are going to draw the lines right so let's loop around these uh, line vectors and uh, draw all these lines which were found so for that we are going to use the for loop and then we are going to say line in lines and the, this lines variable is coming from uh, this lines variable so we are going to use this draw lines function and we are going to pass this lines vector as the second parameter here so this is how uh, th this line variable is coming here so now inside uh, this for loop we are going to uh, just define one more for loop because this line is going to give us uh, four parameters which is uh, the coordinates of the first point in the line and the coordinates of the second point in the line so we are going to just once again say for x1 which is the first coordinate of the first point and the y1 and then similarly x2 and the y2 so this will be uh, the line coordinate in the line uh, which we got from the line vector and then inside this uh, for loop we are going to draw a line and uh, drawing line is really easy by using cv2.line method which takes a few parameters as you already know the image and then the second parameter is the coordinate of the first point which we already have using uh, this iteration which is x1 comma y1 and third parameter here will be the coordinates of the second point x2 comma y2 and then you can uh, provide the color and thickness so let's uh, provide this color so the color here i'm going to take let's say 0 comma 255 comma 0 you can take any uh, color here and the thickness so the thickness here i'm going to take is uh, 
let's provide this parameter thickness is equal to 3 okay so this is the thickness of the line which we want to draw and here I think this blank image should uh, be uh, uh, given because we want to draw the line on the blank image and then merge it with the original image so here we have to provide this line image or you can say this is the blank image which is more appropriate in this uh, case so we want to draw the line on the blank image which is of the same size of the original image and now once we draw these lines on the blank image we can merge this blank image and the original image which will uh, give us the uh, line which are drawn on the original image so outside this for loop we are going to merge the image with the lines into the original image so our original image is the image uh, itself so image variable is the our original image and then we are going to just say cv2 dot add weighted this function also we have seen in the last videos and this is the function which we use to merge two images with some weights so the first parameter here will be image now the second parameter here will be uh, the value of alpha so which uh, we are going to give here 8 this is uh, like a weight to an image uh, which we want to provide and then the third parameter here will be the second image so we want to merge the blank image with the original image the fourth parameter is the value of uh, beta so uh, this value we are going to take as one and the last value will be of uh, gamma so gamma we are going to take as uh, 0.0 here okay so this add weighted also we have uh, seen uh, uh, in the last video how to use it so i'm not going into the details and at last once we have the uh, lines on the image then we are going to simply return it so let's uh, return this uh, image img so once we have this function we are going to call this function after applying the half line transform method which is the probabilistic half line transform so here in the next line we are going to just define a variable called image with uh, lines let's say is equal to our method which is draw the lines method the first argument is the original image so we are going to pass the original image the second argument is the line vector which we got from this method right so the original image and the line vector variable which we got here at last we are going to just uh, see what is the result which we got after applying this draw the lines method on the original image so let's run this uh, code and let's see what happens so now you can see let me just maximize it you can see this line is drawn on our image so this is the first line and this is the second line so we got the result which we wanted if you want to change the thickness or uh, the color of uh, this uh, line on the image you can uh, just change it using this draw lines uh, method so this is the line and thickness uh, parameter so for example i want to change this to uh, 255 here some different color and the thickness let's say 4 and i'm going to run this code and now you can see this yellow color here right so you can change the thickness and the color using uh, this method so let's say for now we want uh, the red color so we are going to go with this uh, red color on the lane lines so this is what we wanted to achieve we wanted to draw the lane lines on these lanes and we have achieved this in the next video we are going to see how we can apply the same concept on a live video or on a video of uh, this road for example so for example this car is running on the road and we want to continuously draw these lines on the lane lines how we can achieve this using OpenCV we are going to see in the next video in the last two videos we have seen how we can detect the lane lines on the road 
using OpenCV. Now, till now we have only worked with this image and in this video we are going to try to apply what we have written not on an image but with the video frames. But you have already learned in the previous videos that a video frame is like an image. So a video contains many number of frames. So if we apply the same technique on each frame, we will be able to detect these lane lines on the video frames also. So let's apply that concept on our script, what we have till now. So right now I have added this test.mp4 video inside my project. So let me show you how it looks like. So our video looks like this. So we are going to apply all these concepts which we have applied on an image on this video. So let's get started. So I hope you have uh, this code which we have written in the last two videos. The only thing we need to do here is we need to read the video instead of an image and then apply uh, those concepts on the frame instead of an image. So we uh, till now have two functions, region of interest, draw the line, and we have this code. So this all code we are going to uh, enclose inside the function so that it will be easier to apply all this code on the video frames. Now, as you already know that this will not be used because we are reading the videos so we don't need to read the image obviously so we are going to comment these two lines out so we don't need to convert uh, bgr to rgb because we are going to use this native cv2 library not the uh, matplotlib library for which we have converted this BGR to RGB uh, image. So now we are going to define a function. So let's define this function and I'm going to name this function as process and it's going to uh, take an argument which will be the image argument. And all this code which is under this, which we have written in the last video, we are going to enclose this code inside this uh, process function. We don't need these two lines because we are not going to use matplotlib for uh, processing this video. So I'm going to remove these two lines and I'm going to just give a space here for this code so it can be enclosed inside this function. Now at last or at the end of this function, we are going to just return this image with lines. So, so we are going to return this image with lines using this process function. That means on every frame we are going to draw the lines and return it using this process function. Next we are going to read the video using the video capture functions. So I'm going to declare a variable cap is equal to cv2 dot video capture and then we are going to just pass one argument which will be our video file which is test.mp4 in our case so test.mp4 and then once we have this video we are going to check if the video uh, frame is available using the while loop so let's use this while loop and we are going to check if cap dot is open is valid or not so is opened and this function is going to return the boolean value. So if this uh, video frame is still available, it's going to return true and whatever we write inside the while loop is going to be executed. Now in the next line, we are going to just read every frame. So we all know from our previous uh, videos that this cap.read uh, returns two uh, result or two variables one is ret and the other is the frame and we are going to just say cap dot read and then we are going to apply our process function on this frame so we are going to once again uh, uh, take this frame variable and we are going to overwrite this frame with the lines on the frames so this we are going to get from our process function. So let's call the process function and pass the frame variable uh, inside it. Okay, so this 
frame is going to go to the process function it's going to process everything and then the final result which we get is going to be saved once again into the frame variable with the actual uh, lines on the frame in the next line we are going to just show our result using cv2.imshow method and we are going to just pass the frame variable here in the next line we are going to just write the code for uh, the quitting from this loop so we are going to just say if cv2 dot wait key is going to be one and then we are going to apply the end operator and then write 0xff for uh, the cross platform functionality and then we are going to just say is equal to ORD so wh whenever somebody uh, presses the Q uh, key then we are going to exit from this loop and then in the next line we are going to just say break so break out of the loop the last two line in the last two line outside this loop we are going to just uh, call the release function on the cap variable and we are going to destroy all the windows in the cv2 so we are going to just say destroy all windows that's it hopefully this is going to work so let's uh, just run this uh, script once again and let's see what happens and here we got the error and it's coming from this line which is cv2 dot i am sure we forgot to give the first argument here which will be the name of this window we are going to just say frame here and let's run this uh, script once again and let's see what happens and you can see on this video on this uh, lane line our lines are drawn right so this is the result which we were expecting we can improve this result by adjusting few uh, variables so we are going to first of all uh, press q to quit and let's uh, change some of uh, these values here in the half line transform so we are going to just say that the max line gap is going to be 100 we are going to reduce the threshold value to 50 and row value to 2 okay inside uh, this uh, half lines p method and let's run this code so let's see what result we get this is also okay let's uh, improve it little bit more in the kenny edge detection we can uh, reduce uh, this threshold value here to 120 the second threshold value and let's run this code once again and now we get the better result so the problem might be the edge detection so we have reduced our uh, second threshold and now we get the better result you can see uh, on this middle lane the lines are drawn clearly so this is how you can write a simple script to detect lane lines on the road I hope you have enjoyed this video and I will see you in the next video. We have already seen how to use half line transform to detect lines in OpenCV. In this video, we are going to see how we can use half circle transform to detect circles in an image. Now, as you can see here, I have this uh, small example which loads an image and shows it into the I am show window. So let me run this code and let me show you uh, how this image looks like. So you can see there are so many smarties here inside this image and all the smarties are of circle form, right? They are not of the perfect circles but they are in the form of circles and we want to detect all these circles forms inside the image we can use half circle transform for that so let's see how we can use uh, this half circle transform to detect the circles in the image so a circle is represented mathematically by uh, this equation which you see on your screen so here x center and the y center are the coordinates of the center and r here is the radius of the circle so if you know these three
parameters then you can draw a circle so the coordinates of the circle and the radius of the circle we need to detect so now let's see how half circle method is applied using OpenCV. So you might observe here that I have uh, created a copy of this original image which I have read using this IM read method. In the next step, I'm going to uh, just convert this image into a grayscale image. So I'm going to just write uh, gray is equal to CV dot CVT color which is going to take two parameters first is the source and second is the method so we are going to convert the color bgr to gray now in the next step because uh, our half circle method works uh, better with the uh, blurred images so we are going to uh, create this blurred image using median blur so i'm going to uh, just say uh, gray so we are going to override this gray variable with cv2 dot median blur which is going to take a few arguments first is the image itself so we are going to pass gray here and the second is the k size or the kernel size so we are going to initially provide the kernel size of 5 here now we are going to apply our half circles uh, method so i'm going to declare this uh, circles variable and then i'm going to just call this method which is called cv dot half circles method so this is the method and you can see it takes few parameters so we are going to give uh, these parameters one by one first is the obvious one which is the image so we are going to provide the gray uh, scale image here which is already blurred so the second parameter here is the method which we want to use currently the only implemented method is half gradient method so the choice is very simple here we are going to just provide this uh, cv dot half gradient method the third parameter here will be a uh, dp dp is the inverse ratio of accumulator resolution to the image resolution so for example when dp is equal to 1 the accumulator has the same resolution as the input image and if the dp is equal to 2 then accumulator has the half as big as width and the height so we are going to take this dp value as 1 the next parameter here will be min dist it is the minimum distance between the center of the detected circles okay so here we are going to give initially the value of 20 and uh, later we will adjust this value if uh, the circles are very near to each other the next parameter which we are going to give here is the value of parameter 1 and parameter 2 or param 1 or param 2 the param 1 is the first method specific parameter in case of half gradient it is higher threshold of the two passed to the kenny edge detector param 2 is the second method specific to the method which we have provided here which is the half gradient method it is the accumulator threshold for the circle centers at the detection stage so we are going to provide the value of uh, the param 1 and param 2 here so let's start with the param 1 value and we are going to provide param 1 value is equal to 50 and param 2 value is equal to uh, let's say 30 so those param1 and param2 uh, parameters are specific to this method which we are using the next parameter which we are going to pass here is the min radius and the min radius is the minimum uh, circle radius and we are going to just start with the zero so we are going to say that anything which is greater than uh, zero we are going to just draw it and then we are going to provide the max 
uh, radius. If this max radius is greater than or equal to 0, it uses the maximum image dimension. If it is only greater than 0, it returns center without finding the radius. So, this also we are going to start with 0. Let me just break this uh, function so you can see all the parameters here. So, this half circle method is going to give us the circle vector which we can iterate upon. But first of all, we need to convert th those circle parameters which we got using this circles variable that is x and y coordinate and the radius into an integer. So, to do that, we are going to just declare a parameter called uh, detected circles and then we are going to use numpy to convert them into an integer. So, I am going to just say np dot u in 16 and then in the parenthesis, I am going to just use np dot around and we are going to pass our circles uh, parameter which we got using the half circles method. Now, in the next step, we are going to iterate over those detected circles. So, we are going to just say uh, for and because this uh, circle vector is going to give us x, y and the radius, we can directly uh, just extract those values. So, we are going to just say x comma y comma r and then in our detected circles and those circles will be at this index. So, 0 comma colon and then inside this for loop, we are going to first of all draw the circle and also we are going to draw the center. So, to draw the circle, we already know that we have this uh, circle method available which takes few parameter. First is the uh, image. So, we are going to pass the copy of this image here. So, let us pass this copy which is output. The second argument here will be the center which are the coordinate of the center which we already got in the form of x comma y. So, we will uh, give them uh, in the form of tuple. The third argument is the radius. So, radius is extracted in the r parameter here. So, we are going to pass the radius here and then the next parameter will be the color. So, let us start with uh, let us say green color and then the thickness. So, we are going to give the thickness of let us say 3 here. Similarly, when we use the same circle method and we want to draw the center, then we know that this is the center. So, these are the coordinates of the center and if the radius is very small, let us say 2, then it is going to just draw a small point, right. So, that is why I have given very uh, small value, for example, 2 here. So, it is going to just draw a very small circle which will look like a, a dot on the circle. That is why uh, this value is very small and we are going to just say that this will be also 3 and let us change the color of this dot. Let us say this will be this color. Okay? So, we are just drawing those circle on the copy of the image which is called the output. So, let us run this code and let us see what happens when we run this code and you can see this dot is uh, uh, first of all drawn on each circle which is detected which is in the form of yellow and also in the form of green all the circles are drawn. So, you can see this circle is drawn. So, every uh, circular shape is uh, uh, you know en enclosed by the detected circle. We also strangely uh, detected this circle uh, somehow because uh, OpenCV think that this is also a circle. I have one more image which is shapes.jpg. So, we are going to just uh, see that also. So, I am going to just say shapes.jpg. Let me show you this image first of all. So, it looks like this. So, it has only one circle and some other shapes, right? 
So we are going to just uh, run this code once again and you can see it just detect the circle and it just draws uh, a small dot on the center and all the other shapes are undetected. So this is how you can detect the circles inside an image using half circle transform. In this video, we are going to discuss about the basics of face detection using HAR feature based cascade classifiers. So object detection using HAR feature based cascade classifiers is an effective object detection method proposed by Paul Viola and Michael Jones in their paper. Now HAR feature based cascade classifier is a machine learning based approach where a cascade function is trained for a lot of positive and negative images. Now what are these positive and negative images? So first a classifier is trained with few hundred sample views of particular object that is a face or a car or any other object that is called a positive example. So whatever you want to detect if you train your classifier with those kind of values. So for example, if you want to detect face, then you need to train your classifier with the number of images which contain faces. So these are called the positive images which contains the object which you want to detect. Similarly, we want the classifier to train with the negative images. That means the images which doesn't contain the object which you want to detect. So in our case, for example, we want to detect the face, then the image which doesn't contain the face, then it is called the negative image. And if the image contains face or number of faces, then it's called the positive image. And after a classifier is trained, it can be applied to a region of interest in an input image. And the classifier outputs a one if the region is likely to show the object or zero otherwise. So let's see how we can use HAR cascade detection in OpenCV. So OpenCV comes with a trainer as well as a detector. So if you want to train your classifier for any object, for example, a watch or a car or a train or anything, then you can use this classifier. Also on OpenCV's GitHub page, you can find some trained classifier XML files. So let me show you these classifiers on the OpenCV's GitHub page. So here is the OpenCV uh, repository and inside this repository, you can see this data folder and then go to HAR cascades. I will uh, just share the link with you in the description so you can directly navigate to uh, this uh, website and this location and you can see uh, plenty of uh, trained classifiers are available inside this repository. So for our example, we want to detect the face. So we are going to uh, use this trained classifier which is called har cascade underscore frontal face underscore default dot XML file. So you just need to open this file and then download it. You can just uh, click on the raw uh, icon here, this button. And once this raw uh, file is open, you can just right click and uh, save it on your computer. So you can just uh, say save page as, and then you can just save this inside your OpenCV project. So I have already saved this file inside my OpenCV project. You can see uh, this file here, which is a XML file, which I have uh, downloaded using this repository. So as you can see here, I have this code, which is the minimal code to uh, load an image and show it using OpenCV window. Now in the next step, what I'm going to do is before uh, this uh, reading, we are going to uh, just define our classifiers. So because it's a face classifier, I'm going to name my variable as face cascade. And then in OpenCV, there is a method called, so I'm going to just call this method. 
and there is a method called cascade classifier so this is this method called cascade classifier where you can provide your classifier name which is the xml file so just provide your trained classifier file name in our case it's har cascade underscore frontal face underscore default dot xml so once we have our classifier we read the image and then because this classifier will work with the grayscale images we are going to convert our image into a grayscale image and it will be really easy to convert our image to a grayscale image now once we have our grayscale image the next step is to detect the faces inside this image so for that we are going to declare this variable let's say faces and then we are going to uh, use this result which we got using this uh, cascade classifier and then we can uh, call a method called detect multi scale so we are going to uh, just call this uh, method which takes few argument first is the image so we are going to provide our uh, grayscale uh, image here and the second argument we are going to use here will be the scale factor so the scale factor parameter specifies how much the image size is reduced at each image scale so to start with we are going to provide 1.1 1 .1, uh, value here and then the next parameter which we are going to provide here will be the min neighbors parameter so min neighbors parameter is going to specify how many neighbors each candidate rectangle should have to retain it so we are going to provide this value uh, 4 here to start with and if uh, it doesn't give us the proper result we are going to uh, change it and the last step here will be to iterate over all the faces which we have detected and then draw a rectangle on them so this face variable will be the vector of rectangle where each rectangle contains the detected object in our case this will be the detected face so the rectangle may be partially outside the original image if it's on the corner so the if uh, the object or the face is on the corner then this rectangle may be little bit outside the original image so we are going to iterate over this uh, faces uh, object and here we are going to get the parameter x comma y comma w comma h which means the values of x and y and the width and height of the rectangle of the object in our case this is the faces right so we got all the four parameters for drawing the rectangle and then we can uh, just call cv2 dot rectangle method to draw the rectangles the first parameter here will be the image the second parameter will be the point one which will be x comma y which we got using this uh, faces uh, vector and then we need to give the second point which will be x plus w comma y plus height okay and then the next two parameters are the color and the thickness so we are going to give the color 255 comma 0 comma 0 here and the thickness to start with we are going to give a 3 here that's it so it's this simple to detect faces inside the images using har cascade classifiers so now i'm going to run this code and let's see what happens so you can see this is the face so this is how you can detect the face or a multiple number of faces inside an image let's try to detect the face inside a video so i'm going to just close uh, this window and now we are going to try to detect the face inside a video so this will be uh, nothing different than uh, this approach we just need to apply this approach on each and every single frame so instead of uh, this uh, code we are going to use the video capture method to capture the video so you can see i have this test.mp4 video here 
So we are going to define a cap variable is equal to CV2 dot video capture. And then in the parenthesis, we are going to provide uh, the test dot MP4 file here. Or if you have the camera, you can provide a zero here as the parameter. And then all this code, we are going to just uh, enclose inside a while loop. So we are going to just say that while cap dot is opened. So if cap dot is opened is going to give us a true value, then we are going to read the frame. So uh, underscore, let's say uh, the parameter name will be IMG in this case also. Uh, normally we take the variable name frame here because we are reading each and every frame. And then I'm going to just say cap dot read. Okay, so cap dot read. This means we are reading every frame. And let's uh, enclose this code also inside this while loop. So I'm going to just provide a little space here. So basically we are getting every frame and then applying the same uh, procedure on each and every frame. And at last, outside our while loop, we are going to release our uh, Cap. So we are going to just say cap dot uh, release, and here instead of using uh, this cv2 dot wait key, we are going to provide a condition uh, if cv2 dot wait key, and in the parenthesis we, we are going to provide one and zero x ff is equal to ord, and we are going to listen for the key uh, q. So if somebody presses the key Q, then we are going to break out of uh, this while loop. So let's run this uh, script and let's see what happens when we run the same script on a video. So this is the video and this is uh, in this video. So you can see in this video, the face is detected in real time in the real live video. So this is how you can use HAR based cascade classifiers to detect faces or any other object inside an image. In the last video, we have seen the basics of face detection using HAR feature based cascade classifiers. In this video, we are going to extend our code to detect eyes using the same HAR cascade classifier. So for that, first of all, you need to download the pre-trained classifier for the eyes from the same source, which I have shown you last time also which is the GitHub repository of OpenCV. Again, I'm going to give you this link in the description so you can directly come to this page. And this time we are going to download this XML file with the name har cascade i underscore tree underscore eyeglass dot XML file. So this is the pre-trained classifier for detecting eyes. So you can uh, just click on draw and then save it as this same file name in your project. Okay, so I have uh, already downloaded this uh, XML file. You can see here har cascade i underscore tree underscore eyeglass dot XML file. And now we are ready to uh, write our code. So this is the code which we have written last time. So if you don't know how this code works, you can see the last video. I'm going to just extend this code to detect eyes. So first thing first, we need to create the cascade classifier for the eyes. So instead of uh, face cascade, we are going to name it as uh, I cascade. And this file name will be the file which we have downloaded, which is uh, I underscore tree underscore eyeglass dot XML file. So once we have our classifier, then in the last video, we have already seen how to detect faces. So our region of interest will be the face this time because the eyes will not be present outside the face, right? So eyes will always be present inside the face. So our region of interest will be the face and face we have already detected last time. So this face 
will be now our region of interest. So go inside this uh, for loop where we are iterating over this uh, face uh, variable and then we are going to create our uh, ROI. So I'm going to create this variable which is called ROI underscore uh, gray and this will be the original grayscale uh, image which we have created here but we just want the face out of this image so we can uh, just uh, index this face using y colon y plus uh, h comma x colon x plus w which is the width so this line is going to give us the grayscale region of interest but we also want the colored uh, image also so we are going to just say roi color which will be the colored roi and here instead of gray we are going to take the direct image which will be before uh, we have converted this bgr image to the grayscale image so we have the colored roi and the grayscale roi once we have this we will follow uh, the same uh, concept which we have applied for detecting the faces so so we are going to use this detect multi scale method so i'm going to just write eyes is equal to because we already have our eye cascade which is a classifier so we are going to use uh, this variable and then use this method called detect multi scale and then we are going to simply uh, pass our ROI gray which we got using the faces. Now we are going to iterate over those eyes. So inside this for loop we are going to create one more for loop to iterate over all the eyes which are found on the face. So for and then this will be EX comma EY comma EW comma EH for x y coordinate and the width and height now we will just say in eyes and then we are going to just draw this rectangle which is also very simple cv2 dot uh, rectangle and then we are going to pass our image first of all which will be our colored uh, roi image which is this one so here we will pass this roi color and then uh, the first point in the rectangle which will be uh, ex and ey so i'm going to just say ex comma ey and the second point will be ex plus ew which is x plus width so we are going to just write this ex plus ew comma ey plus eh which is the y coordinate and the height the next parameter will be the color so let's uh, provide the color let's say this will be 0 comma 255 comma 0 and then the next parameter will be the width so let's say the width we want here is 5 so that's it so hopefully this code is going to work out of the box we don't need to do anything else we just need to uh, define our uh, classifier and then we just need to uh, use this detect multi scale method to detect the eyes and then we just need to draw the rectangle on all the eyes which are detected so let's run this code and let's see what happens so we are going to see you can see eyes are detected but there is some problem because uh, something is wrong so i'm going to just quit this uh, script and see what's uh, going wrong here so you can see uh, this should be x e x comma e y and then uh, our problem will be solved hopefully so i'm going to run this code once again and you can see the eyes are properly detected so this is how you can detect eyes in the face using OpenCV and har cascade classifiers in this video we are going to try to understand how we can find out the corners inside an image using a method called Harris corner detection. Now, first of all, what are corners? So corners are the region in the image with large variation in intensity in all the direction. Now this Harris corner detector was first introduced by Chris Harris and Mike Stephens in their paper in 
1988. Now detecting corners using Harris corner detector contains three main steps. So the first step is to determine which windows produces very large variation in intensity when we move in the x direction and the y direction. Now what are windows here? So windows in this case means that let's say we want to just find out this corner here. So windows will be your small box here and then you check for the intensity when you move in the vertical direction and also in the horizontal direction. So you check for the change or large variation in the intensity when you move in the x direction and when you move in the y direction. In the second step, with each such window which we found, a score R is computed. So this R value which is computed is going to give us the estimate or give us an idea about where this corner is located depending upon the value of r and in the third step after applying a threshold to this score the important corners are selected and marked so let me explain you all these steps one by one what do i mean by detecting the windows and calculating the value of R's. Let's see step by step. So as I said in the first step we determine which windows produces very large variation in the intensity in the X direction and in the Y direction. So let's say a window or a center is located at the position X comma Y. And let's say the intensity of the pixel at this location is i x comma y. So if this window is slightly shifted to a new location and let's say this displacement is u comma v, then the intensity of the pixel at this location will be x plus u and y plus v because our displacement is u comma v so we are just adding it uh, to the x value and the y value and hence the difference between the shifted intensity and the original intensity will be the difference in the intensities of the windows shift so for a corner this difference will be very large and that's how we detect the corners using this Harris corner detection method. Now as you can see here this value will be given in the e u comma v format. So we have to maximize this function for the corner detection and this we can achieve by applying a Taylor expansion to this equation which is given here and by using some mathematical steps. So I'm not going to go deep into the mathematical steps but after applying the Taylor expansion you will get this kind of approximate value where m is equal to this value and here in this equation ix and iy are the image derivatives in the x and y direction respectively. So this can be easily found out using the cv.sobel method in OpenCV. Now comes the second step and in this step we find out or calculate the score for r. So this r is equal to this value and the m we have already uh, seen how we can get this m value in the first step right so in this equation det m is equal to lambda 1 multiplied by lambda 2 and trace m is equal to lambda 1 plus lambda 2 where lambda 1 and lambda 2 are the eigenvalues of m so again if you want to go into the details you can refer to some book 
or you can uh, go to the Wikipedia page to learn more about this equation. So once we got the value of R, then based upon the value of R, we can make some decision and this we can do in the third step. So if the value of R is very small, that means the value of lambda 1 and lambda 2 are also very small and we can conclude that the region is a flat region and not the corner. If the value of R is less than 0, that means lambda 1 is very large in comparison to lambda 2 or vice versa and that means it's an edge and not the corner. And if the value of R is large, which happens when lambda 1 and lambda 2 are large and this means that this region is a corner. So if the value of R is very large, that means the region is a corner and that's how Harris corner detector detects if it's a corner or a edge or a flat area. So this was the theory about Harris corner detector. Let's see how we can use this Harris corner detection concept inside OpenCV using our Python code. So I have this uh, uh, script already written here. So just import CV2 and NumPy. And then we are reading uh, this image called crossboard underscore image dot PNG using I'm read method. And after we read this image, I'm just showing the original image. So we have uh, the original image and the output at the end to compare. Now in the next step, I'm converting this image into a grayscale image to get the better results. And because this cv2.cornerHarris method takes the grayscale image in the float32 format, that's why we need to convert our image into float32 format. So that's why we are using numpy.float32 to convert this image into uh, floating point values because our corner Harris method which we are going to use in the next step is going to take this kind of value and not the value which comes directly from the conversion of this image to the grayscale image. So this step is necessary for the Harris corner method. And in the next uh, step, we are just applying the cv2.cornerHarris method, which takes few arguments. First is our image in the floating point. So this we have passed. And the second parameter here is called the block size. So here I have given the value two here. So block size means the window in the first step so we have seen we have to define the window right so for example we define this block size 2 that means neighborhood size is equal to 2 that means for each pixel value block size multiplied by block size that means 2 by 2 neighborhood is considered the next parameter here is called the k size and it's the aperture parameter for the Sobel operation and then we have the next parameter here and this next parameter is called the k which is the Harris detector free parameter in the equation. So after applying this Harris corner uh, method to our image we get this uh, destination image and to get the better result we need to dilate this uh, result. So we apply cv2.dilate method on our uh, uh, image which we get using the Harris corner. So this image are marked through the dilated corners. And then in the next step, we are reverting back to the original image with optimal threshold value. And we are just, uh, just marking all our corners with this color. So basically we want to mark all the corners with the red color here. And in the next step, we are just uh, 
showing our result in the I am show window and at last we are destroying all the windows. So let's run this code and let's see what happens when we run this uh, code and uh, we will see the results. So you can see this is the original image which have so many corners and all the corners are detected and it's uh, marked with this red color here. So this is how you can find out and mark all the corners using Harris Corner Detection in OpenCV. In the last video, we have seen how we can use Harris Corner Detector in order to find out the corners inside an image. In this video, I'm going to show you how you can use Sheetomasi Corner Detector method to detect the corners inside an image. So in late 1994, J. Shi and C. Tomasi made a small modification in the Harris Corner Detector method in their paper, which was called Good Features to Track. So this Shi Tomasi method is similar to Harris Corner Detector apart from the way the score of R is calculated, which we have seen in the last video. So this Shi Tomasi method gives us better result in comparison to Harris Corner Detector. And also when you use this Shi Tomasi method, we can find the top end corners, which means we can provide the number of corners we want. And this might be useful in cases where we don't want to detect all the corners inside an image. So let's see in the code how we can implement this Shi Tomasi corner detector in OpenCV. So here I have already written all the code. So let me explain you all the lines of the code one by one. So as you can see here, I'm just importing the libraries in the first two line. And in the next line, I'm just reading the image using I am read method and then I'm converting this image into a grayscale image using this CVT uh, color method. So I'm converting this image from BGR to grayscale image. Now, as I said, the paper which was published by Shi and Tomasi was named Good Features to Track. That's why in OpenCV, this method is also called good features to track. So here in this line, we are just using this method CV dot good features to track, which takes few arguments. So first argument here is our input image, which is a grayscale image, which we are providing as the first parameter. The second parameter is the maximum number of corners. So here we can limit the number of corners we want to detect. So for example, I have given 25 here. That means we just want to detect 25 corners. And if there are more than 25 corners which are present in the image, they will not be shown. So this value means maximum number of corners to return. And if there are more corners than the corners found, then the strongest corners will be returned, right? Now the third parameter here is called the quality level. So this is the parameter characterizing the minimal expected quality of the image corner. The next parameter here is the min distance, which is the minimum possible Euclidean distance between the returned corners. So I have taken uh, 10 here as the minimum distance and 0 0.01 as the quality level. Now, once all the corners are detected using this good features to track method, we convert those corners into the integer values. And here int zero is a mere alias for int 64 and once all the corners are detected we iterate over all the corners and then we find out the value of x and y using this i 
and then it's easier to just draw the circles over these uh, values using the cv dot circle method so this cv dot circle method takes few arguments first is the input image so the second parameter is the center the third parameter is the radius of the circle which we want to provide the fourth parameter is the color we want to provide and the fifth parameter is the thickness and if it's minus one that means we want to fill the color inside that circle and at last once all the circles are drawn on the corner which are detected then we are just showing this using i am show method so let's see how uh, this works in the case of shitomasi method on an image so i'm going to run this code so you can see uh, all the corners inside this image are detected and because we have just provided this number 25 here so maximum number of corners which will be detected here will be 25 and rest of them will not be shown so if we increase the value of the maximum number of corners let's increase it to 100 let's say so i'm going to just increase it to the value 100 you will see more number of circles are drawn on an image now let's compare the result of the harris corner detector and she tomasi corner detector so on the left hand side you can see the original image and this middle image shows the harris corner detector method and you can see all the corners are detected using harris corner detector and using the she tomasi corner detector it gives us better result and we can control the number of corners we want to detect and you can see all the important corners are detected using shi tomasi corner detector in a better way so that's how shi tomasi corner detector works in this video we are going to see how to use background subtraction method in opencv so first of all what is background subtraction so background subtraction is common and widely used technique for generating the foreground mask which is also known as the binary image containing the pixels belonging to the moving object of a scene when these images are captured using a static camera and as the name suggests background subtraction calculates the foreground mask performing the subtraction between the current frame and the background model containing the static part of the scene so for example the background subtraction method can be used in the case of visitor counter where you have a static camera capturing the number of visitors entering or leaving the room or you have a traffic camera which wants to count the various uh, telematic data from the moving car or moving car data which is captured by that traffic camera now there are several algorithms which were introduced for the purpose of this background subtraction and opencv has implemented few of them which we are going to see one by one so as you can see here i have this example which is a very simple example of just taking a video and then we are extracting each and every frame of that video and showing it into a window so using i am show method i'm just showing each and every frame of that video so this you already know from the previous uh, videos how to capture the video frames from a video file or the live camera so when i run this code you will see that there are few uh, persons which are moving here and we want to uh, detect all those moving uh, persons which are moving in the image so for that we are going to use a few uh, methods which are available in opencv so let's first 
write some code and I will explain you what this code is going to uh, do. So I'm going to define a variable after uh, this line of code and I'm going to define a variable name fgbg for foreground background and then I'm going to uh, just call cv.bgsegm so bgsegm and then I'm going to call a method called create background subtraction mog method so this create background subtraction mog method is a Gaussian mixture based background and foreground segmentation algorithm. So using this line what we are doing is we are just creating a background object of the function using uh, this method create background uh, subtraction mog. Now uh, this method has uh, some optional parameters like uh, history, number of Gaussian mixtures and uh, threshold but all of them are set by default so you don't need to set anything uh, specifically unless you want to change some of the optional parameters so I'm going to leave everything as default and I'm not going to give any uh, argument here for uh, this method and then after I captured each and every frame inside this while loop what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new variable called fg mask for foreground mask so I'm going to just write uh, fg mask is equal to and for getting the foreground mask we are going to just call a method called apply on this fgbg or the background subtractor image so we are going to just take uh, fgbg and then we are going to call a method called apply here and it takes one argument which is the frame which we are capturing okay so we have applied this method and then we are just uh, getting the foreground mask using the apply method on this background subtractor variable and that's it so this is your foreground mask so when I just use one more I'm show window and this is for the FG frame let's say so FG uh, mask frame let's say okay so FG mask frame and we are going to just uh, pass this argument here so let's see what result we get after we apply create uh, background subtractor MOG method so you can uh, see this uh, normal image here and also you will see uh, these uh, moving persons in the foreground mask right so you have subtracted the background for, from the foreground and you can easily detect the moving uh, persons here inside this image using this mask you will also observe that there is a very uh, little uh, noise not much uh, when you use this kind of uh, subtraction using create uh, background subtractor mog method there is one more method which is called background subtractor mog2 which is also gaussian mixture based background for and foreground segmentation algorithm so let's use that method also so this method is directly available under cv2 so you just need to write cv dot create background subtractor mog2 okay and everything will uh, remain the same so it's going to return you the background subtractor variable which you can use uh, with this apply method to get the foreground uh, mask okay so let's see how uh, this method performs so you can see the result which is quite different from the first method which we have used so in the previous case we have to create the background subtractor object and here in this method you have an option of detecting the shadows so there is an optional parameter which you can give uh, into this uh, method which is uh, this create background subtractor mog2 which is called detect shadows so by default this detect shadows is true that's why you see the shadows there if you just write detect shadows is equal to false 
then it's go not going to detect the shadows. So I'm going to just run the code once again and you can see now shadows are less visible, right? So let's uh, run the default case once again. So let's say we just write true here and you will see the shadows in the gray um, color, right? So these shadows in the gray color and when we just make it false, so detect shadows false, you will not see that gray color, okay? So shadows are uh, displayed in the gray color. So if you don't see any gray color, then shadows are not detected. This is a noise which uh, is detected, but not the shadow, okay? So this is uh, the difference between the first background subtractor method and the background subtractor MOG2 method. There is uh, one more method which is called the background subtractor GMG. So this algorithm which we are going to use, so let's uh, use uh, this uh, method first of all, which is called background subtractor GMG, which is available under cv.bg segment as the first method. So just write bgsegm dot create background subtractor gmg method so this create background subtractor gmg method algorithm combines statistical background image estimation and pre pixel bayesian segmentation let's see how this method performs when we uh, just use this gmg method and when you will see here there is nothing on uh, this uh, uh, foreground mask frame so to get the better result, you need to apply morphological opening to the result to remove the noises. So we are going to uh, do just that. So I'm going to just overwrite this uh, FG mask uh, frame using a method called cv.morphologyx. This also we have seen in the previous videos, right? So the first, uh, uh, parameter here will be FG mask parameter. The second parameter here will be uh, the op. So CV2 dot morph open. We are going to use the morph open uh, uh, method. And then the third parameter will be the kernel. So we need to define the kernel also. So for defining the kernel, let's define the kernel outside this while loop. So I'm going to just write uh, kernel which takes few argument first is the shape so we are going to say we want the morph eclipse shape so i'm going to just write uh, morph eclipse and then the kernel size will be let's say three comma three okay so we are going to apply this kernel using this morphology x uh, method and when we are going to run this code you can see uh, these kind of uh, results, which are not as good as uh, uh, you have seen in the first method. Now let me show you the last background subtraction method, which is called the background subtractor KNN method. So this method is available under CV2 directly. So we are going to just uh, comment this kernel uh, code because for this method we don't need to define any kernel so we can just write cv dot create background subtractor and then at last you just need to write k and n in capital okay uh, and it also takes few optional parameters like history and other parameters but these are optional parameters so for now we are not going to set any uh, parameter and let's see the result uh, which we get using this KNN method. So I'm going to run this code and you can see uh, uh, this KNN method result. It also shows the shadows in the form of gray pixels. So whatever uh, gray pixels you see here in this image are the shadows. In this method also there is an optional parameter which is called detect shadows which is set by default to true. So when you uh, make it false, the shadows will not be uh, detected. So you can see 
no gray pixels are visible now. When you make it true, then the gray pixels will be uh, visible and those gray pixels indicates the shadows, right? So these are the few methods which you can use for the background subtraction in OpenCV. In this video, we will talk about an object tracking method which is called mean shift. So first of all, what is object tracking? So in simple words, object tracking is the process of locating a moving object over time using a camera. And what is mean shift? The idea behind mean shift is really simple. Consider you have a set of points. It can be a pixel density like histogram uh, back projection and you are given a window which is a very small window which can be a circle or rectangle or a square and you have to move that window to a area of maximum pixel density or maximum number of points. So in the image you can see this illustration uh, very easily. So essentially the working of mean shift algorithm can be summarized in following points. So in the first step we pass the initial location of our target object and the histogram back projected image to a mean shift function and then in the second step as the object moves the histogram back projected image also changes and in the third step the mean shift function moves the window to the new location with the maximum probability density. So we will see all these steps with the help of an example. So here I have the simple code where I'm loading a video which is called slow traffic small dot mp4 and I'm just uh, iterating over each and every frame of that video. So this code uh, till now you already know how it works. So I'm going to just run this uh, code. And let's say I just want to uh, track this window of the white car, okay? So let me just uh, run this uh, uh, video once again. So I want to track this window of the white car or window in general of each and every car, let's say, okay? So how can I track this uh, window using mean shift algorithm? Let's see. So as I said, the first step is the passing of the initial location of our target. So this can be, you can say, a disadvantage of mean shift that you have to provide the initial location of your target. In our case, that target is the car window. So what I have done is I have uh, just calculated the initial position of the white car window and uh, that we are going to see in the next step. So first of all, we are going to take the first frame of our video. So the first frame of our video can be uh, retrieved by uh, this code. So ret comma frame is equal to cap. We have this uh, cap function and we will uh, read the first frame using the read method and this is going to give you the first frame of the video so this is our first frame now once we have our first frame we are going to define the initial location of the car window in our case we want to track first of all the white car window right so i'm going to define four variables First two are x comma y and the next two are width and height. So, and because I have already calculated the initial position of the window, I'm going to hard code this uh, position of the window. So 300, uh, 200, comma 100, comma 50. Okay, so this is the hard coded uh, value which uh, I have already calculated, which is the initial position of the car window. Now we can uh, say that this x, y and width and height is our track window. So we are going to define a variable called uh, track underscore window let's say and then we are going to just pass all these four variables x comma y comma width comma height. 
okay so let's pass all these four variables and in the next step we are going to uh, define our region of interest so let's define uh, this region of interest uh, with the variable called roi and we already have our first frame so we are going to take our first frame and then we are going to pass that window so uh, y colon y plus uh, height comma x colon x plus width so this is our window or the position of the window so as i said in the first step we will pass the initial location of our target object and the histogram back projected image of the mean shift function so histogram back projection in simple words creates an image of the same size but of a single channel as of our Im input image in our case this will be our frame where each pixel corresponds to the probability of that pixel belonging to our object that is the output image will have our object of interest or region of it in more white color compared to the remaining part of that image so this is a back projection so for calculating the histogram back projection there are some steps which are involved so we are going to uh, follow all these steps to calculate the histogram back projection but first of all let's uh, just uh, see the region of interest because we are already have uh, our region of interest so i'm going to just write cv dot i am show and uh, our region of interest so let's say how our region of interest looks like so i have uh, this video and this image which is our region of interest right so this is the initial position i'm going to pass to our mean shift function right so now in the next step what we are going to do is we are going to uh, define the histogram back projection so we already have our uh, roi so in the next step we are going to just convert this roi to the hsv uh, color space so i'm going to just write hsv underscore roi hsv we have already learned in the previous video so i'm going not going to go into the details of hsv color space i'm going to just write uh, cv dot cvt color which is going to convert this uh, uh, image into the hsv color space so our input image will be the roi and the next parameter will be cv dot color underscore bgr to hsv okay so we are converting this image to the hsv color space and then we are going to calculate the mask so let's uh, say we define a variable called mask and and for the mask we are going to just write uh, cv dot in range so this also we have uh, learned in the hsv uh, tutorial so if you want to learn more about all these functions you can just go to uh, that video so first uh, parameter we are going to pass is our hsv image and the second parameter and the third parameter will be the lower and the upper bound so the lower limit will be 0 dot comma 60 dot comma 32 dot okay so let's uh, pass this and uh, the upper limit so let's define the upper limit also so the third parameter will be the upper limit in the form of uh, the tuple but we need to use the numpy for that right so numpy dot uh, array and inside that we just pass this uh, tuple value which will be 180 dot uh, 255 dot 255 okay so 180 dot comma 255 dot comma 255 so why we use the in range function because for the histogram only hue is considered from hsv right so the first uh, uh, channel right 
and also to avoid the false value due to low light or uh, low light value we use the in range function okay so these low light values are discarded using the in range function and then in the next step we are going to calculate our histogram value so i'm going to define this variable called uh, roi hist this also we have uh, learned in the previous video so i'm not going to go into the details so i'm going to just use the function called calc hist which takes uh, the first parameter which will be the image so i'm going to just pass our uh, hsv roi so just pass hsv underscore roi the second value here will be the channels so we are just using only hue channel the first channel in the hsv space so we are going to just write zero here mask now the next parameter will be the mask so we have already calculated the mask so we are going to just pass this mask uh, parameter here the next parameter will be the hist size so as we have already learned in the previous videos that this hist size uh, starts from 0 to 179 so essentially 180 values and then we just need to pass the ranges so as i said it starts from 0 to 1 and now in the next step we are going to just normalize these uh, values using the normalize function so this normalize function takes few values first is the source so the source is our roi hist variable the next value is the destination so let's say we have the same destination we just want to override this roi hist value the next parameter here will be the value of alpha so alpha will start from uh, zero and the value of beta will be 255 so we want to normalize these values between 0 to 255 okay and then the next uh, value will be the norm type so the norm type we are going to take is cv dot norm min max okay so we are going to just take this one norm min max so all these steps which we have uh, written here is going to give us the histogram back projected image now once we have this histogram back projected image we are going to uh, use this histogram back projected image uh, which is also going to change with the moving object so now in the next step we are going to go inside our while loop and read each and every frame one by one and first of all what we are going to do is we are going to calculate the hsv value of the frame as we have done with the first frame also right so we are going to just uh, take the frame and then calculate the hsv roi value let's say this time we are going to name it as hsv and we are going to pass frame as the source instead of uh, this roi value now in the next step we are going to use a function called calculate uh, back project so let's define the variable called dest for destination and then cv dot calc back project which is the function for uh, calculating uh, the back projection and this function takes few arguments first is the number of images so we only have our hsv image so we are going to pass in the form of uh, the list the second argument will be the channels so as i said we just want to use the hue values here so only one channel so we are going to just write uh, zero so because channel starts from zero one two so that's why i have written zero here the third parameter is the hist value so in this case our hist value is the roi hist which we have calculated the next parameter is uh, the ranges so we will start from 0 to 180 as we are talking about the hsv color space and the next value will be the scale 
let's say scale for now we take one uh, as the scale so this is going to give you the back projected image and then in the next step we are going to apply the mean shift to get the new location so i'm going to just write ret comma track window so i'm going to just say track window which is this variable which we have already uh, defined and then we are going to just use cv dot mean shift which is going to take few arguments first is the image which is the destination image which we got from the back project function calc back project and next argument will be our uh, track image which is the track window so we have to define this uh, term criteria so i'm going to just write uh, term c r i t for criteria and then we have to define this outside this while loop so i'm going to go here and we are going to set up the termination criteria either 10 iterations or move by at least one point okay so we are going to define that criteria so here in the curly brackets we are going to just say cv dot term criteria esp or cv dot term criteria count so because we want to either provide the termination criteria for either 10 iterations so we just give 10 or we want to uh, terminate by moving at least one uh, point this is the criteria for the mean shift and we are providing these two track criteria so once we have our track window for uh, the car we can uh, draw a rectangle with the help of this track window and this will be visible on our uh, video so we are going to draw that uh, uh, window we are going to just say x comma y comma w comma h for uh, uh, x y width and height and this will be our uh, track window and then we are going to just uh, draw a rectangle so i'm going to just say we have the final image and then we are going to just write uh, cv dot uh, rectangle which is going to take the frame and then the point for the first point of the rectangle and the second point of the rectangle which are the coordinates of that point so the first uh, point coordinate will be x comma y and the second point coordinate will be x plus width comma y plus height okay and then uh, the next uh, value will be the color let's say we want to use uh, 255 here and the uh, thickness so thickness we want to take three here for example now we can uh, just uh, show this uh, final image using i am show method so till now we were just uh, showing our original frame so we can just say let's say we want to show the final uh, image here also if you want to see the back projected image you can uh, just uh, use uh, this destination so we can print this destination uh, image also and see how does this back projected image looks like so let's run this uh, code and you can see this car window is dragged right so as the car moves this window also moves once this car goes out of the scope it tracks the other window so this is how the mean shift algorithm works in open cv now as i said this mean shift has few disadvantages or limitations the first limitation is the size of the target window does not change so as we have seen once this car is coming near to us the size of this window is not changing it remains always same so this is one problem 
The second problem is we have to give the initial position of our region of interest. So for example, if initial position of the region of interest is not known, then it will be really hard to apply mean shift method. So there are these two main limitations of this uh, mean shift algorithm. And we are going to try to solve these uh, limitations in the next video when we learn CAM shift, which stands for continuously adoptive mean shift. In the last video, we have learned how to use mean shift algorithm to find and track objects in the video. In this video, we are going to learn CAM shift algorithm to track the object in the video. So if you have seen the last video, we have written this uh, code. So we are going to use all this code which we have written in the mean shift uh, video tutorial. And first of all, let me just run this mean shift code which we have written in the last video. And we have discussed about this problem of this rectangle which always remains the same even if the object is coming closer to the camera. So we need to adopt the window size with the size and rotation of the target. So once again, the solution came from OpenCV Labs and this time they introduced an algorithm which is called CAM shift, which stands for continuously adoptive mean shift. So this CAM shift algorithm applies mean shift per first and then once the mean shift converges, it updates the size of the window. In addition, it also calculates the orientation of the best fitting eclipse to it. Now let's talk about the implementation part of the CAM shift. So as I said, all the code which we have written in the last video will remain the same except one thing, which is we have used this mean shift algorithm in the last video. And in this video, we are going to use the CAM shift shift. So just write cv dot cam shift and all the parameters also will remain the same, which is destination, track window and the termination criteria. So let's uh, run this code once again and let's see what result came out of this algorithm. So you can see this rectangle is changing its size according to the target. Now this result which we have seen can be better because the cam shift function returns a rotated rectangle that is our result and also the box parameters which are used to be passed as the search window in the next iteration. So here when we see the result inside the ret variable, so let's print the result inside the ret variable. I'm going to just uh, print it using the print function. Now let's run this code and let's see what uh, this ret variable prints on the terminal. So let me just uh, press escape. So what is this result? So here you will see the value of x and y and also you will see these three values which are your width, height and the value of rotation. So in cam shift you can also rotate your rectangle according to your object size. So now we are going to use all these parameters which are there inside this ret variable and we are going to try to draw the rectangle which might be uh, rotating. So there will be a different approach other than uh, this uh, rectangle. We are going to use that approach to print those uh, points which we got using the ret variable. So let's draw that rectangle. So here we are going to define a variable called pts and there is a function called cv dot box points. So we are going to use the, that uh, function here which is box points and it takes a few arguments. We just need to uh, pass our ret variable here. So we are going to just pass our ret. So let's see what values this is going to give us. So I'm going to just print this uh, pts value. So I'm going to just print the value of pts uh, now. Let's run this uh, code once again. You won't see anything. And you will see these values, 
right? So it's going to uh, give these floating point values, which we need to convert it into the integers. And the error was due to this because this is no longer defined, right? So for that, we are going to just convert these points, PTS, into the integer values. So I'm going to overwrite this variable PTS. And then there is a function in NumPy which is called int 0. And here, when you pass this PTS uh, variable, it's going to convert those points into uh, the integers. And now we can uh, just draw our rectangle. But remember, this is a rotating rectangle. So we cannot use this normal rectangle uh, function. So we need to use the other function for uh, drawing those points. So I'm going to define this uh, final image uh, variable once again, and then I'm going to use cv.polylines. So there is this function called uh, polylines, which can, you can use to draw those uh, lines which you get using this points variable. So we are going to just uh, pass the frame first of all. So we need to pass the frame as a first parameter. The second parameter will be our uh, PTS value. And then the third parameter will be the closed or not closed. So when we pass uh, true here, then this rectangle will be closed, right? Then we need to pass the color. So you can pass any color here. Let's say 0, 255, 0. And then you can also pass the thickness. So let's say we just need to give the thickness of two here, okay? So this is our final image. And now we are going to run this uh, example once again, and let's see what happens. So you can see this rectangle is drawn and it can rotate also with the object. So this is how CamShift algorithm works with OpenCV. I hope you've enjoyed this video and I will see you in the next video.